Volume 1, Chapter 1 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 1, Chapter 1. Miriam, Hilda, Kenyon, Donatello. Four individuals, in whose fortunes we should be glad to interest the reader, happened to be standing in one of the saloons of the sculpture gallery in the capital at Rome. It was that room, the first after ascending the staircase, in the center of which reclines the noble and most pathetic figure of the dying gladiator, just sinking into his death swoon. Around the walls stand the Antinous, the Amazon, the Lycian Apollo, the Juno, all famous productions of antique sculpture, and still shining in the undiminished majesty and beauty of their ideal life, although the marble that embodies them is yellow with time, and perhaps corroded by the damp earth in which they lay buried for centuries. Here, likewise, is seen a symbol, as apt at this moment as it was two thousand years ago, of the human soul, with its choice of innocence or evil close at hand, and the pretty figure of a child, clasping a dove to her bosom, but assaulted by a snake. From one of the windows of this saloon we may see a flight of broad stone steps, descending alongside the antique and massive foundation of the capital, towards the battered triumphal arch of Septimus Severus, right below. Farther on, the eye skirts along the edge of the desolate forum, where Roman washerwomen hang out their linen to the sun, passing over a shapeless confusion of modern edifices, piled rudely up with ancient brick and stone, and over the domes of Christian churches, built on the old pavements of heathen temples, and supported by the very pillars that once upheld them. At a distance beyond, yet but a little way, considering how much history is heaped into the intervening space, rises the great sweep of the Colosseum, with the blue sky brightening through its upper tier of arches. Far off, the view is shut in by the Alban Mountains, looking just the same amid all this decay and change, as when Romulus gazed thitherward over his half-finished wall. We glance hastily at these things, at this bright sky and those blue distant mountains, and at the ruins, Etruscan, Roman, Christian, venerable with a threefold antiquity, and at the company of world-famous statues in the saloon, in the hope of putting the reader into that state of feeling which is experienced oftenest at Rome. It is a vague sense of ponderous remembrances, a perception of such weight and density in a bygone life of which this spot was the center, that the present moment is pressed down or crowded out, and our individual affairs and interests are but half as real here as elsewhere. Viewed through this medium, our narrative, into which are woven some airy and unsubstantial threads, intermixed with others, twisted out of the commonest stuff of human existence, may seem not widely different from the texture of all our lives. Side by side, with the massiveness of the Roman past, all matters that we handle or dream of nowadays look evanescent and visionary alike. It might be that the four persons whom we are seeking to introduce were conscious of this dreamy character of the present, as compared with the square blocks of granite wherewith the Romans built their lives. Perhaps it even contributed to the fanciful merriment which was just now their mood. When we find ourselves fading into shadows and unrealities, it seems hardly worth while to be sad, but rather to laugh as gaily as we may, and ask little reason wherefore. Of these four friends of ours, three were artists, or connected with art, and at this moment they had been simultaneously struck by a resemblance between one of the antique statues, a well-known masterpiece of Grecian sculpture, and a young Italian, the fourth member of their party. "'You must needs confess, Kenyon,' said a dark-eyed young woman, whom her friends called Miriam, "'that you never chiseled out of marble, nor wrought in clay, "'a more vivid likeness than this, "'cunning a bus-maker as you might think yourself. 
The portraiture is perfect in character, sentiment, and feature. If it were a picture, the resemblance might be half elusive and imaginary. But here, in this pentelic marble, it is a substantial fact, and may be tested by absolute touch and measurement. Our friend Donatello is the very fawn of Praxiteles. Is it not true, Hilda? Not quite. Almost, yes, I really think so, replied Hilda, a slender, brown-haired New England girl, whose perceptions of form and expression were wonderfully clear and delicate. If there is any difference between the two faces, the reason may be, I suppose, that the fawn dwelt in woods and fields, and consorted with his like, whereas Donatello has known cities a little, and such people as ourselves, but the resemblance is very close, and very strange. Not so strange, whispered Miriam mischievously, for no fawn in Arcadia was ever a greater simpleton than Donatello. He has hardly a man's share of wit, small as that may be. It is a pity there are no longer any of this congenial race of rustic creatures for our friend to consort with. Hush, naughty one, returned Hilda. You are very ungrateful, for you well know he has wood enough to worship you, at all events. Then the greater fool he, said Miriam, so bitterly that Hilda's quiet eyes were somewhat startled. Donatello, my dear friend, said Kenyon, in Italian, pray gratify us all by taking the exact attitude of this statue. The young man laughed, and threw himself into the position in which the statue had been standing for two or three thousand years. In truth, allowing for the difference of costume, and if a lion's skin could have been substituted for his modern talma, and a rustic pipe for his stick, Donatello might have figured perfectly as the marble fawn, miraculously softened into flesh and blood. Yes, the resemblance is wonderful, observed Kenyon, after examining the marble and the man with the accuracy of a sculptor's eye. There is one point, however, or rather two points, in respect to which our friend Donatello's abundant curls will not permit us to say whether the likeness is carried into minute detail. And the sculptor directed the attention of the party to the ears of the beautiful statue which they were contemplating. But we must do more than merely refer to this exquisite work of art. It must be described, however inadequate may be the effort, to express its magic peculiarity in words. The fawn is the marble image of a young man, leaning his right arm on the trunk or stump of a tree. One hand hangs carelessly by his side. In the other he holds the fragment of a pipe, or some such sylvan instrument of music. His only garment, a lion skin, with the claws upon his shoulder, falls halfway down his back, leaving the limbs and entire front of the figure nude. The form, thus displayed, is marvelously graceful, but has a fuller and more rounded outline, more flesh, and less of heroic muscle than the old sculptors were wont to assign to their type of masculine beauty. The character of the face corresponds with the figure. It is most agreeable in outline and feature, but rounded and somewhat voluptuously developed, especially about the throat and chin. The nose is almost straight, but very slightly curves inward, thereby acquiring an indescribable charm of geniality and humor. The mouth, with its full yet delicate lips, seems so nearly to smile outright that it calls forth a responsive smile. A whole statue, unlike anything else that ever was wrought in that severe material of marble, conveys the idea of an amiable and sensual creature, easy, mirthful, apt for jollity, yet not incapable of being touched by pathos. It is impossible to gaze long at this stone image without conceiving a kindly sentiment towards it, as if its substance were warm to the touch, and imbued with actual life. It comes very close to some of our pleasantest sympathies. Perhaps it is the very lack of moral severity, of any high and heroic ingredient in the character of the fawn, that makes it so delightful an object to the human eye, and to the frailty of the human heart. The being here represented is endowed with no principle of virtue, and would be incapable of comprehending such. But he would be true and honest by dint of his simplicity. We should expect from him no sacrifice or effort for an abstract cause. There is not an atom of martyr's stuff in all that softened marble. But he has a capacity for strong and warm attachment, 
and might act devotedly through its impulse, and even die for it at need. It is possible, too, that the fawn might be educated through the medium of his emotions, so that the coarser animal portion of his nature might eventually be thrown into the background, though never utterly expelled. The animal nature, indeed, is a most essential part of the fawn's composition, for the characteristics of the brute creation meet and combine with those of humanity in this strange yet true and natural conception of antique poetry and art. Praxiteles has subtly diffused throughout his work that mute mystery which so hopelessly perplexes us whenever we attempt to gain an intellectual or sympathetic knowledge of the lower orders of creation. The riddle is indicated, however, only by two definite signs. These are the two ears of the fawn, which are leaf-shaped, terminating in little peaks, like those of some species of animals. Though not so seen in the marble, they are probably to be considered as clothed in fine, downy fur. In the coarser representations of this class of mythological creatures, there is another token of brute kindred, a certain caudal appendage, which, if the fawn of Praxiteles must be supposed to possess it at all, is hidden by the lion skin that forms his garment. The pointed and furry ears, therefore, are the sole indications of his wild forest nature. Only a sculptor of the finest imagination, the most delicate taste, the sweetest feeling, and the rarest artistic skill, in a word, a sculptor and a poet too, could have first dreamed of a fawn in this guise, and then have succeeded in imprisoning the sportive and frisky thing in marble. Neither man nor animal, and yet no monster, but a being in whom both races meet on friendly ground. The idea grows coarse as we handle it and hardens in our grasp. But if the spectator broods long over the statue, he will be conscious of its spell. All the pleasantness of sylvan life, all the genial and happy characteristics of creatures that dwell in woods and fields, will seem to be mingled and kneaded into one substance, along with the kindred qualities in the human soul. Trees, grass, flowers, woodland streamlets, cattle, deer, and unsophisticated man. The essence of all these was compressed long ago, and still exists, within that discolored marble surface of the fawn of Praxiteles. And, after all, the idea may have been no dream, but rather a poet's reminiscence of a period when man's affinity with nature was more strict, and his fellowship with every living thing more intimate and dear. End of chapter 1 of volume 1chapter 2 of the marble fawn this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org the marble fawn by nathaniel hawthorne volume 1 chapter 2 the fawn donatello playfully cried miriam do not leave us in this perplexity Shake aside those brown curls, my friend, and let us see whether this marvelous resemblance extends to the very tips of the ears. If so, we shall like you all the better. No, no, dearest Signorina, answered Donatello, laughing, but with a certain earnestness. I entreat you to take the tips of my ears for granted. As he spoke, the young Italian made a skip and jump, light enough for a veritable fawn so as to place himself quite beyond the reach of the fair hand that was outstretched, as if to settle the matter by actual examination. I shall be like a wolf of the Apennines, he continued, taking his stand on the other side of the dying gladiator, if you touch my ears ever so softly. None of my race could endure it. It has always been a tender point with my forefathers and me. He spoke in Italian, with the Tuscan rusticity of accent, and an unshaped sort of utterance betokening that he must heretofore have been chiefly conversant with rural people. "'Well, well,' said Miriam, "'your tender point, your two tender points, if you have them, shall be safe, so far as I am concerned. But how strange this likeness is, after all, and how delightful, if it really includes the pointed ears. Oh, it is impossible, of course,' she continued in English, with a real and commonplace young man like Donatello, 
But you see how this peculiarity defines the position of the fawn, and while putting him where he cannot exactly assert his brotherhood, still disposes us kindly towards the kindred creature. He is not supernatural, but just on the verge of nature, and yet within it. What is the nameless charm of this idea, Hilda? You can feel it more delicately than I. It perplexes me, said Hilda, thoughtfully, and shrinking a little. Neither do I quite like to think about it. But surely, said Kenyon, you agree with Miriam and me that there is something very touching and impressive in this statue of the fawn. In some long past age he must really have existed. Nature needed, and still needs, this beautiful creature, standing betwixt man and animal, sympathizing with each, comprehending the speech of either race, and interpreting the whole existence of one to the other. What a pity that he has forever vanished from the hard and dusty paths of life, unless, added the sculptor in a sportive whisper, Donatello be actually he. You cannot conceive how this fantasy takes hold of me, responded Miriam, between jest and earnest. Imagine now a real being similar to this mythic fawn. How happy, how genial, how satisfactory would be his life, enjoying the warm, sensuous, earthy side of nature, reveling in the merriment of woods and streams, living as our four-footed kindred do, as mankind did in its innocent childhood, before sin, sorrow, or morality itself had ever been thought of. Ah, Kenyon, if Hilda and you and I, if I, at least, had pointed ears, for I suppose the fawn had no conscience, no remorse, no burden on the heart, no troublesome recollections of any sort, no dark future either. What a tragic tone was that last, Miriam, said the sculptor, and looking into her face he was startled to behold it pale and tear-stained. How suddenly this mood has come over you! Let it go as it came, said Miriam, like a thunder-shower in this Roman sky. All is sunshine again, you see. Donatello's refractoriness, as regarded his ears, had evidently cost him something, and he now came close to Miriam's side, gazing at her with an appealing air, as if to solicit forgiveness. His mute, helpless gesture of entreaty had something pathetic in it, and yet might well enough excite a laugh, so like it was to what you may see in the aspect of a hound when he thinks himself in fault or disgrace. It was difficult to make out the character of this young man, so full of animal life as he was, so joyous in his deportment, so handsome, so physically well-developed. He made no impression of incompleteness, of maimed or stinted nature. And yet, in social intercourse, these familiar friends of his, habitually and instinctively allowed for him, as for a child or some other lawless thing, exacting no strict obedience to conventional rules, and hardly noticing his eccentricities enough to pardon them. There was an indefinable characteristic about Donatello that set him outside of rules. He caught Miriam's hand, kissed it, and gazed into her eyes without saying a word. She smiled, and bestowed on him a little careless caress, singularly like what one would give to a pet dog when he puts himself in the way to receive it. Not that it was so decided a caress, either, but only the merest touch, somewhere between a pat and a tap of the finger. It might be a mark of fondness, or perhaps a playful pretense of punishment. At all events, it appeared to afford Donatello exquisite pleasure, insomuch that he danced quite round the wooden railing that fences in the dying gladiator. "'It is the very step of the dancing fawn,' said Miriam, apart, to Hilda. What a child, or what a simpleton he is! I continually find myself treating Donatello as if he were the merest unfledged chicken, and yet he can claim no such privileges in the right of his tender age, for he is at least—how old should you think him, Hilda? Twenty years, perhaps, replied Hilda, glancing at Donatello, but indeed I cannot tell, hardly so old on second thoughts, or possibly older. He has nothing to do with time but has a look of eternal youth in his face. "'All underwitted people have that look,' said Miriam scornfully. "'Donatello has certainly the gift of eternal youth, as Hilda suggests,' observed Kenyon, laughing. 
For judging by the date of this statue, which I am more and more convinced Praxiteles carved on purpose for him, he must be at least twenty-five centuries old, and he still looks as young as ever. "'What age have you, Donatello?' asked Miriam. "'Signorina, I do not know,' he answered. "'No great age, however, for I have only lived since I met you.' "'Now what old man of society could have turned a silly compliment more smartly than that?' exclaimed Miriam. "'Nature and art are just at one sometimes. "'But what a happy ignorance is this of our friend Donatello, not to know his own age. "'It is equivalent to being immortal on earth.' "'if I could only forget mine.' "'It is too soon to wish that,' observed the sculptor. "'You are scarcely older than Donatello looks.' "'I shall be content, then,' rejoined Miriam. "'If I could only forget one day of all my life.' "'Then she seemed to repent of this illusion, and hastily added, "'A woman's days are so tedious that it is a boon to leave even one of them out of the account.' The foregoing conversation had been carried on in a mood in which all imaginative people, whether artists or poets, love to indulge. In this frame of mind they sometimes find their profoundest truths side by side with the idlest jest, and utter one or the other, apparently without distinguishing which is the most valuable, or assigning any considerable value to either. The resemblance between the marble fawn and their living companion had made a deep, half-serious, half-mirthful impression on these three friends, and had taken them into a certain airy region. Lifting up, as it is so pleasant to feel them lifted, their heavy earthly feet from the actual soil of life. The world had been set afloat, as it were, for a moment, and relieved them for just so long of all customary responsibility for what they thought and said. It might be under this influence— or perhaps because sculptors always abuse one another's works, that Kenyon threw in a criticism upon the dying gladiator. I used to admire this statue exceedingly, he remarked, but latterly I find myself getting weary and annoyed that the man should be such a length of time leaning on his arm in the very act of death. If he is so terribly hurt, why does he not sink down and die without further ado? Flitting moments, imminent emergencies— imperceptible intervals between two breaths, ought not to be encrusted with the eternal repose of marble. In any sculptural subject there should be a moral standstill, since there must of necessity be a physical one. Otherwise it is like flinging a block of marble up into the air, and, by some trick of enchantment, causing it to stick there. You feel that it ought to come down, and are dissatisfied that it does not obey the natural law. "'I see,' said Miriam mischievously. You think that sculpture should be a sort of fossilizing process. But in truth, your frozen art has nothing like the scope and freedom of Hilda's and mine. In painting, there is no similar objection to the representation of brief snatches of time. Perhaps, because a story can be so much more fully told in picture, and buttressed about with circumstances that give it an epoch. For instance, a painter never would have sent down yonder fawn out of his far antiquity, lonely and desolate, with no companion to keep his simple heart warm. "'Ah, the fawn!' cried Hilda, with a little gesture of impatience. "'I have been looking at him too long, and now, instead of a beautiful statue, immortally young, I see only a corroded and discolored stone. This change is very apt to occur in statues.' "'And a similar one in pictures, surely,' retorted the sculptor. "'It is the spectator's mood that transfigures the transfiguration itself.' I defy any painter to move and elevate me without my own consent and assistance. Then you are deficient of a sense, said Miriam. The party now strayed onward from hall to hall of that rich gallery, pausing here and there to look at the multitude of noble and lovely shapes which have been dug up out of the deep grave in which old Rome lies buried. And still, the realization of the antique fawn in the person of Donatello gave a more vivid character to all these marble ghosts. Why should not each statue grow warm with life? Antinous might lift his brow, and tell us why he is forever sad. The Lycian Apollo might strike his lyre, and at the first vibration that other fawn in red marble, who keeps up a motionless dance, should frisk gaily forth, leading yonder satyrs and shaggy goat-shanks to clatter their little hoofs upon the floor, and all join hands with Donatello. 
Bacchus, too, a rosy flush diffusing itself over his time-stained surface, could come down from his pedestal and offer a cluster of purple grapes to Donatello's lips, because the god recognizes him as the woodland elf who so often shared his revels. And here, in this sarcophagus, the exquisitely carved figures might assume life, and chase one another round its verge with that wild merriment which is so strangely represented on those old burial coffers, though still with some subtle allusion to death, carefully veiled, but forever peeping forth amid emblems of mirth and riot. As the four friends descended the stairs, however, their play of fancy subsided into a much more somber mood, a result apt to follow upon such exhilaration as that which had so recently taken possession of them. Do you know, said Miriam, confidentially to Hilda, I doubt the reality of this likeness of Donatello to the fawn, which we have been talking so much about. To say the truth, it never struck me so forcibly as it did Kenyon and yourself. Though I gave in to whatever you were pleased to fancy, for the sake of a moment's mirth and wonder. I was certainly in earnest, and you seemed equally so, replied Hilda, glancing back at Donatello, as if to reassure herself of the resemblance. But faces change so much from hour to hour, that the same set of features has often no keeping with itself, to an eye, at least, which looks at expression more than outline. How sad and somber he has grown all of a sudden. Angry, too, methinks. Nay, it is anger much more than sadness, said Miriam. I have seen Donatello in this mood once or twice before. If you consider him well, you will observe an odd mixture of the bulldog, or some other equally fierce brute, in our friend's composition. A trait of savageness hardly to be expected in such a gentle creature as he usually is. Donatello is a very strange young man. I wish you would not haunt my footsteps so continually. You have bewitched the poor lad, said the sculptor, laughing. You have a faculty of bewitching people, and it is providing you with a singular train of followers. I see another of them behind yonder pillar, and it is his presence that has aroused Donatello's wrath. They had now emerged from the gateway of the palace, and partly concealed by one of the pillars of the portico stood a figure such as may often be encountered in the streets and piazzas of Rome, and nowhere else. He looked as if he might just have stepped out of a picture, and in truth was likely enough to find his way into a dozen pictures, being no other than one of those living models, dark, bushy-bearded, wild of aspect and attire, whom artists convert into saints or assassins, according as their pictorial purpose. Volume 1, Chapter 3 of The Marble Fawn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 1, Chapter 3 Subterranean Reminiscences Miriam's model has so important a connection with our story that it is essential to describe the singular mode of his first appearance, and how he subsequently became a self-appointed follower of the young female artist. In the first place, however, we must devote a page or two to certain peculiarities in the position of Miriam herself. There was an ambiguity about this young lady, which, though it did not necessarily imply anything wrong, would have operated unfavorably as regarded her reception in society, anywhere but in Rome. The truth was that nobody knew anything about Miriam, either for good or evil. She had made her appearance without introduction, had taken a studio, put her card upon the door, and showed very considerable talent as a painter in oils. Her fellow professors of the brush, it is true, showered abundant criticisms upon her pictures, allowing them to be well enough for the idle half-efforts of an amateur, but lacking both the trained skill and the practice that distinguished the works of a true artist. Nevertheless, be their faults what they might, Miriam's pictures met with good acceptance among the patrons of modern art. Whatever technical merit they lacked, its absence was more than supplied by a warmth and passionateness which she had the faculty of putting into her productions, and which all the world could feel. 
Her nature had a great deal of color, and in accordance with it, so likewise had her pictures. Miriam had great apparent freedom of intercourse. Her manners were so far from evincing shyness that it seemed easy to become acquainted with her, and not difficult to develop a casual acquaintance into intimacy. Such at least was the impression which she made upon brief contact, but not such the ultimate conclusion of those who really sought to know her. So airy, free, and affable was Miriam's deportment towards all who came within her sphere, that possibly they might never be conscious of the fact, but so it was, that they did not get on, and were seldom any further advanced into her good graces to-day than yesterday. By some subtle quality she kept people at a distance, without so much as letting them know that they were excluded from her inner circle. She resembled one of those images of light which conjurers evoke and cause to shine before us, in apparent tangibility, only an arm's length beyond our grasp. We make a step in advance, expecting to seize the illusion, but find it still precisely so far out of our reach. Finally, society began to recognize the impossibility of getting nearer to Miriam, and gruffly acquiesced. There were two persons, however, whom she appeared to acknowledge as friends, in the closer and truer sense of the word. And both of these more favored individuals did credit to Miriam's selection. One was a young American sculptor, of high promise and rapidly increasing celebrity. The other, a girl of the same country, a painter like Miriam herself, but in a widely different sphere of art. Her heart flowed out towards these two. She requited herself by their society and friendship, and especially by Hilda's, for all the loneliness with which, as regarded the rest of the world, she chose to be surrounded. Her two friends were conscious of the strong, yearning grasp which Miriam laid upon them, and gave her their affection in full measure. Hilda, indeed, responding with the fervency of a girl's first friendship, and Kenyon, with a manly regard, in which there was nothing akin to what is distinctively called love. A sort of intimacy subsequently grew up between these three friends and a fourth individual. It was a young Italian, who, casually visiting Rome, had been attracted by the beauty which Miriam possessed in a remarkable degree. He had sought her, followed her, and insisted, with simple perseverance, upon being admitted at least to her acquaintance a boon which had been granted, when a more artful character, seeking it by more subtle mode of pursuit, would probably have failed to obtain it. This young man, though anything but intellectually brilliant, had many agreeable characteristics, which won him the kindly and half-contemptuous regard of Miriam and her two friends. It was he whom they called Donatello, and whose wonderful resemblance to the fawn of Praxiteles forms the keynote of our narrative. Such was the position in which we find Miriam some few months after her establishment at Rome. It must be added, however, that the world did not permit her to hide her antecedents without making her the subject of a good deal of conjecture, as was natural enough, considering the abundance of her personal charms, and the degree of notice that she attracted as an artist. There were many stories about Miriam's origin and previous life, some of which had a very probable air while others were evidently wild and romantic fables. We cite a few, leaving the reader to designate them either under the probable or the romantic head. It was said, for example, that Miriam was the daughter and heiress of a great Jewish banker, an idea perhaps suggested by a certain rich oriental character in her face, and had fled from her paternal home to escape a union with a cousin, the heir of another of that golden brotherhood the object being to retain their vast accumulation of wealth within the family. Another story hinted that she was a German princess, whom, for reasons of state, it was proposed to give in marriage, either to a decrepit sovereign or a prince still in his cradle. According to a third statement, she was the offspring of a southern American planter, who had given her an elaborate education and endowed her with his wealth, but the one burning drop of African blood in her veins so affected her with a sense of ignominy that she relinquished all and fled her country. By still another account, she was the lady of an English nobleman, and out of mere love and honor of art, had thrown aside the splendor of her rank, and come to seek a subsistence by her pencil in a Roman studio. 
In all the above cases, the fable seemed to be instigated by the large and bounteous impression which Miriam invariably made, as if necessity and she could have nothing to do with one another. Whatever deprivations she underwent must needs be voluntary. But there were other surmises, taking such a commonplace view as that Miriam was the daughter of a merchant or financier, who had been ruined in a great commercial crisis, and possessing a taste for art, she had attempted to support herself by the pencil, in preference to the alternative of going out as governess. Be these things how they might, Miriam, fair as she looked, was plucked up out of a mystery, and had its roots still clinging to her. She was a beautiful and attractive woman, but based as it were upon a cloud, and all surrounded with misty substance, so that the result was to render her sprite-like in her most ordinary manifestations. This was the case even in respect to Kenyon and Hilda, her especial friends. But such was the effect of Miriam's natural language, her generosity, kindliness, and native truth of character, that these two received her as a dear friend into their hearts, taking her good qualities as evident and genuine, and never imagining that what was hidden must be therefore evil. We now proceed with our narrative. The same party of friends, whom we have seen at the sculpture gallery of the capital, chanced to have gone together, some months before, to the catacomb of St. Calixtus. They went joyously down into that vast tomb, and wandered by torchlight, through a sort of dream, in which reminiscences of church aisles and grimy cellars, and chiefly the latter, seemed to be broken into fragments, and hopelessly intermingled. The intricate passages along which they followed their guide had been hewn, in some forgotten age, out of a dark red, crumbly stone. On either side were horizontal niches, where, if they held their torches closely, the shape of a human body was discernible in white ashes, into which the entire mortality of a man or woman had resolved itself. Among all this extinct dust there might perchance be a thigh-bone, which crumbled at a touch, or possibly a skull, grinning at its own wretched plight, as is the ugly and empty habit of the thing. Sometimes their gloomy pathway tended upward, so that, through a crevice, a little daylight glimmered down upon them, or even a streak of sunshine peeped into a burial niche. Then again they went downward by gradual descent, or by abrupt, rudely hewn steps, into deeper and deeper recesses of the earth. Here and there the narrow and tortuous passages widened somewhat, developing themselves into small chapels, which once, no doubt, had been adorned with marble work, and lighted with ever-burning lamps and tapers. All such illumination and ornament, however, had long since been extinguished and stripped away, except indeed that the low roofs of a few of these ancient sites of worship were covered with dingy stucco, and frescoed with scriptural scenes and subjects in the dreariest stage of ruin. In one such chapel the guide showed them a low arch, beneath which the body of St. Cecilia had been buried after her martyrdom, and where it lay till a sculptor saw it, and rendered it forever beautiful in marble. In a similar spot they found two sarcophagi, one containing a skeleton, and the other a shriveled body, which still wore the garments of its former lifetime. "'How dismal all this is,' said Hilda, shuddering. "'I do not know why we came here, nor why we should stay a moment longer.' "'I hate it all,' cried Donatello, with peculiar energy. "'Dear friends, let us hasten back into the blessed daylight.' From the first Donatello had shown little fancy for the expedition, for, like most Italians, and in especial accordance with the law of his own simple and physically happy nature, this young man had an infinite repugnance to graves and skulls, and to all that ghastliness which the Gothic mind loves to associate with the idea of death. He shuddered and looked fearfully round, drawing nearer to Miriam, whose attractive influence alone had enticed him into that gloomy region. "'What a child you are, poor Donatello,' she observed, with the freedom which she always used towards him. "'You are afraid of ghosts.' "'Yes, Signorina, terribly afraid,' said the truthful Donatello. "'I also believe in ghosts,' answered Miriam, "'and could tremble at them in a suitable place. "'But these sepulchres are so old, "'and these skulls and white ashes so very dry, "'that methinks they have ceased to be haunted.' 
The most awful idea connected with the catacombs is their interminable extent, and the possibility of going astray into this labyrinth of darkness, which broods around the little glimmer of our tapers. "'Has anyone ever been lost here?' asked Kenyon of the guide. "'Surely, Signor. One no longer ago than my father's time,' said the guide. And he added, with the air of a man who believed what he was telling, "'But the first that went astray here was a pagan of old Rome, who hid himself in order to spy out and betray the blessed saints, who then dwelt and worshipped in these dismal places. You have heard the story, Signor? A miracle was wrought upon the accursed one, and ever since, for fifteen centuries at least, he has been groping in the darkness, seeking his way out of the catacomb. "'Has he ever been seen?' asked Hilda, who had great and tremulous faith in marvels of this kind. "'These eyes of mine never beheld him, Signorina, the saints forbid,' answered the guide. "'But it is well known that he watches near parties that come into the catacomb, especially if they be heretics, hoping to lead some straggler astray. "'What this lost wretch pines for, almost as much as for the blessed sunshine, is a companion to be miserable with him.' "'Such an intense desire for sympathy indicates something amiable in the poor fellow, at all events,' observed Kenyon. They had now reached a larger chapel than those heretofore seen. It was of a circular shape, and though hewn out of the solid mass of red sandstone, had pillars and a carved roof, and other tokens of a regular architectural design. Nevertheless, considered as a church, it was exceedingly minute, being scarcely twice a man's stature and height, and only two or three paces from wall to wall. And while their collected torches illuminated this one small consecrated spot, the great darkness spread all round it, like that immenser mystery which envelops our little life, and into which friends vanish from us one by one. "'Why, where is Miriam?' cried Hilda. The party gazed hurriedly from face to face, and became aware that one of their party had vanished. Volume 1, Chapter 4 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 1, Chapter 4 The Spectre of the Catacomb. "'Surely she cannot be lost!' exclaimed Kenyon. "'It's but a moment since she was speaking.' "'No, no!' said Hilda in great alarm. "'She was behind us all, and it is a long while since we have heard her voice.' "'Torches, torches!' cried Donatello desperately. "'I will seek her, be the darkness ever so dismal!' But the guide held him back, and assured them all that there was no possibility of assisting their lost companion, unless by shouting at the very top of their voices, as the sound would go very far along these close and narrow passages. There was a fair probability that Miriam might hear the call, and be able to retrace her steps. Accordingly they all, Kenyon with his bass voice, Donatello with his tenor, the guide with that high and hard Italian cry, which makes the streets of Rome so resonant, and Hilda with her slender scream, piercing farther than the united uproar of the rest, began to shriek, Hello! and bellow with the utmost force of their lungs. And not to prolong the reader's suspense, for we do not particularly seek to interest him in this scene, telling it only on account of the trouble and strange entanglement which followed. They soon heard a responsive call in a female voice. "'It was the signorina!' cried Donatelli joyfully. "'Yes, it was certainly dear Miriam's voice,' said Hilda. "'And here she comes! Thank heaven! Thank heaven!' The figure of their friend was now discernible by her own torchlight, crouching out of one of the cavernous passages. 
Miriam came forward, but not with the eagerness and tremulous joy of a fearful girl, just rescued from a labyrinth of gloomy mystery. She made no immediate response to their inquiries and tumultuous congratulations, and, as they afterwards remembered, there was something absorbed, thoughtful, and self-concentrated in her deportment. She looked pale, as well she might, and held her torch with a nervous grasp, the tremor of which was seen in the irregular twinkling of the flame. This last was the chief perceptible sign of any recent agitation or alarm. "'Dearest, dearest Miriam!' exclaimed Hilda, throwing her arms about her friend. "'Where have you been straying from us? Blessed be Providence, which has rescued you out of that miserable darkness!' "'Hush, dear Hilda!' whispered Miriam with a strange little laugh. Are you quite sure that it was heaven's guidance which brought me back? If so, it was by an odd messenger, as you will confess. See, there he stands. Startled at Miriam's words and manner, Hilda gazed into the duskiness whither she pointed, and there beheld a figure standing just on the doubtful limit of obscurity at the threshold of the small illuminated chapel. Kenyon discerned him at the same instant, and drew nearer with his torch, although the guide attempted to dissuade him, averring that once beyond that consecrated precincts of the chapel, the apparition would have power to tear him limb from limb. It struck the sculpture, however, when he afterwards recurred to these circumstances, that the guide manifested no such apprehension on his own account, as he professed on behalf of others, for he kept pace with Kenyon as the latter approached the figure, though still endeavouring to restrain him. In fine, they both drew near enough to to get as good a view of the spectre as the smoky light of their torches struggling with the massive gloom could supply. The stranger was of exceedingly picturesque and even melodramatic aspect. He was clad in a voluminous cloak that seemed to be made of buffalo's hide, and a pair of those goatskin breeches with the hair outward, which are still commonly worn by the peasants of the Roman Campania. In this garb they look like antique satyrs, and, in truth, the spectre of the catacomb might have represented the last survivor of that vanished race, hiding himself in sepulchral gloom, and mourning over his lost life of woods and streams. Furthermore, he had on a broad-brimmed conical hat, beneath the shadow of which a wild visage was indistinctly seen floating away, as it were, into a dusky wilderness of moustache and beard. His eyes winked and turned uneasily from the torches, like a creature to whom midnight would be more congenial than noonday. On the whole, the spectre might have made a considerable impression on the sculptor's nerves, only that he was in the habit of observing similar figures almost every day reclining on the Spanish steps, and waiting for some artist to invite them within the magic realm of picture. Nor even thus familiarized with the stranger's peculiarities of appearance could Kenyon help wondering to see such a personage shaping himself so suddenly out of the void darkness of the catacomb. "'What are you?' said the sculptor, advancing his torch nearer. "'And how long have you been wandering here?' "'A thousand and five hundred years,' muttered the guide, loud enough to be heard by all the party. "'It is the old pagan phantom that I told you of, who sought to betray the blessed saints.' "'Yes, it is a phantom,' cried Donatello with a shudder. Ah, dearest signorina, what a fearful thing has beset you in those dark corridors! Nonsense, Donatello, said the sculptor. The man is no more a phantom than yourself. 
The only marvel is how he comes to be hiding himself in the catacomb. Possibly our guide might solve the riddle. The spectre himself here settled the point of his tangibility at all events and physical substance by approaching a step nearer and laying his hand on Kenyon's arm. Inquire not what I am, nor wherefore I abide in the darkness, said he in a hoarse, harsh voice, as if a great deal of damp were clustering in his throat. Henceforth I am nothing but a shadow behind her footsteps. She came to me when I sought her not. She has called me forth, and must abide the consequences of my reappearance in the world. Holy Virgin, I wish the Signorina joy of her prize, said the guide half to himself, and in any case the catacomb is well rid of him. We need follow the scene no further. So much is essential to the subsequent narrative that during the short period, while astray in those tortuous passages, Miriam had encountered an unknown man, and led him forth with her, or was guided back by him, first into the torchlight, thence into the sunshine. It was the further singularity of this affair that the connection, thus briefly and casually formed, did not terminate with the incident that gave it birth, as if her service to him or his service to her, whichever it might be, had given him an indefeasible claim on Miriam's regard and protection. The spectre of the catacomb never long allowed her to lose sight of him from that day forward. He haunted her footsteps with more than the customer persistency of Italian mendicants, when once they have recognized a benefactor. For days together, it is true, he occasionally vanished, but always reappeared, gliding after her through the narrow streets, or climbing the hundred steps of her staircase and sitting at her threshold. Being often admitted to her studio, he left his features or some shadow or reminiscence of them in many of her sketches and pictures. The moral atmosphere of these productions was thereby so influenced that rival painters pronounced it a case of hopeless mannerism, which would destroy all Miriam's prospects of true excellence in art. The story of this adventure spread abroad, and made its way beyond the usual gossip of the forestieri, even into Italian circles, where, enhanced by a still potent spirit of superstition, it grew far more wonderful than as above recounted. Thence it came back among the Anglo-Saxons, and was communicated to the German artists, who so richly supplied it with romantic ornaments and excrescences, after their fashion, that it became a fantasy worthy of Tick or Hoffman. For nobody has any conscience about adding to the improbabilities of a marvellous tale. The most reasonable version of the incident that could anywise be rendered acceptable to the auditors was substantially the one suggested by the guide of the catacomb, in his allusion to the legend of Memmius. This man, or demon, or man-demon, was a spy during the persecutions of the early Christians, probably under the emperor Diocletian, and penetrated into the catacomb of St. Calixtus, with the malignant purpose of tracing out the hiding places of the refugees. But while he stole craftily through those dark corridors, he chanced to come upon a little chapel, where tapers were burning before an altar and a crucifix, and a priest was in the performance of his sacred office. By divine indulgence there was a single moment's grace allowed to Memmius, during which had he been capable of Christian faith and love, he might have knelt before the cross and received the holy light into his soul, and so have been blessed for ever. But he resisted the sacred impulse, 
As soon, therefore, as that one moment had glided by, the light of the consecrated tapers, which represent all truth, bewildered the wretched man with everlasting error, and the blessed cross itself was stamped as a seal upon his heart so that he should never open to receive conviction. Thenceforth this heathen Memmius has haunted the wide and dreary precincts of the catacomb, seeking, as some say, to beguile new victims into his own misery, but, according to other statements, endeavouring to prevail on any unwary visitor to take him by the hand and guide him out into the daylight. Should his wiles and entreaties take effect, however, the man-demon would remain only a little while above ground. He would gratify his fiendish malignity by perpetrating signal mischief on his benefactor, and perhaps bringing some old pestilence or other forgotten and long-buried evil on society, or possibly teaching the modern world some decayed and dusty kind of crime which the antique Romans knew, and then would hasten back to the catacomb, which after so long haunting it has grown his most congenial home. Miriam herself with her chosen friends, the sculptor and the gentle Hilda, often laughed at the monstrous fictions that had gone abroad in reference to her adventure. Her two confidants, for such they were on all ordinary subjects, had not failed to ask an explanation of the mystery, since undeniably a mystery there was, and one sufficiently perplexing in itself, without any help from the imaginative faculty, and sometimes responding to their inquiries with a melancholy sort of playfulness, Miriam let her fancy run off into wilder fables than any which German ingenuity or Italian superstition had contrived. For example, with a strange air of seriousness over all her face, only belied by a laughing gleam in her dark eyes, she would aver that the spectre, who had been an artist in his mortal lifetime, had promised to teach her a long-lost but invaluable secret of old Roman fresco painting. The knowledge of this process would place Miriam at the head of modern art, the sole condition being agreed upon that she should return with him into his sightless gloom, after enriching a certain extent of stuccoed wall with the most brilliant and lovely designs. And what true votary of art would not purchase unrivalled excellence even at so vast a sacrifice, or, if her friend still solicited a sober account, Miriam replied that meeting the old infidel in one of the dismal passages of the catacomb, she had entered into controversy with him, hoping to achieve the glory and satisfaction of converting him to the Christian faith. For the sake of so excellent a result, she had even staked her own salvation against his, binding herself to accompany him back into his penal gloom, if within a twelve-month's space she should not have convinced him of the errors through which he had so long drooped and stumbled. But, alas, up to the present time the controversy had gone direfully in favour of the man-demon and Miriam, as she whispered in Hilda's ear, had awful forebodings that in a few more months she must take an eternal farewell of the sun. It was somewhat remarkable that all her romantic fantasies arrived at this selfsame dreary termination. It appeared impossible for her even to imagine any other than a disastrous result from her connection with her ill-omened attendant. This singularity might have meant nothing, however, had it not suggested a despondent state of mind, which was likewise indicated by many other tokens. Miriam's friends had no difficulty in perceiving that, in one way or another, her happiness was very seriously compromised. 
her spirits were often depressed into deep melancholy if ever she was gay it was seldom with a healthy cheerfulness she grew moody moreover and subject to fits of passionate ill-temper which usually wrecked itself on the heads of those who loved her best not that miriam's indifferent acquaintances were safe from similar outbreaks of her displeasure especially if they ventured upon any allusion to the model in such cases they were left with little disposition to renew the subject but inclined on the other hand to interpret the whole matter as much to her discredit as the least favorable coloring of the facts would allow it may occur to the reader that there was really no demand for so much rumor and speculation in regard to an incident which might well enough have been explained without going many steps beyond the limits of probability the spectre might have been merely a roman beggar whose fraternity often harbor in stranger shelters than the catacombs or one of those pilgrims who still journey from remote countries to kneel and worship at the holy sites among which these haunts of the early christians are esteemed especially sacred or as was perhaps a more plausible theory he might be a thief of the city a robber of the campagna a political offender or an assassin with blood upon his hand whom the negligence or connivance of the police allowed to take refuge in those subterranean fastnesses where such outlaws have been accustomed to hide themselves from a far antiquity downward or he might have been a lunatic fleeing instinctively from man and making it his dark pleasure to dwell among the tombs like him whose awful cry echoes afar to us from scripture times and as for the stranger's attaching himself so devotedly to miriam her personal magnetism might be allowed a certain weight in the explanation for what remains his pertinacity need not seem so very singular to those who consider how slight a link serves to connect these vagabonds of idle italy with any person that may have the ill hap to bestow charity or be otherwise serviceable to them or betray the slightest interest in their fortunes thus little would remain to be accounted for except for the deportment of miriam herself her reserve her brooding melancholy her petulance and moody passion if generously interpreted even these morbid symptoms might have sufficient cause in the stimulating and exhaustive influences of imaginative art exercised by a delicate young woman in the nervous and unwholesome atmosphere of rome such at least was the view of the case which hilda and kenyon endeavored to impress on their own minds and impart to those whom their opinions might influence one of miriam's friends took the matter sadly to heart this was the young italian donatello as we have seen had been an eye-witness of the stranger's first appearance and had ever since nourished a singular prejudice against the mysterious dusky death-scented apparition it resembled not so much a human dislike or hatred as one of those instinctive unreasoning antipathies which the lower animals sometimes display and which generally prove more trustworthy than the acutest insight into character the shadow of the model always flung into the light which miriam diffused around her caused no slight trouble to donatello yet he was of a nature so remarkably genial and joyous so simply happy that he might well afford to have something subtracted from his comfort and make tolerable shift to live upon what remained chapter 5 of the marble fawn 
This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Chapter 5 Miriam's Studio. The courtyard and staircase of a palace built three hundred years ago are a peculiar feature of modern Rome, and interest the stranger more than many things of which he has heard loftier descriptions. You pass through the grand breadth and height of a squalid entranceway, and perhaps see a range of dusky pillars, forming a sort of cloister round the court, and in the intervals, from pillar to pillar, are strewn fragments of antique statues, headless and legless torsos, and busts that have invariably lost what it might be well if living men could lay aside in that unfragrant atmosphere, the nose, bar reliefs, the spoil of some far older palace, are set in the surrounding walls, every stone of which has been ravished from the Colosseum or any other imperial ruin which earlier barbarism had not already leveled with the earth. Between two of the pillars, moreover, stands an old sarcophagus without its lid, and with all its more prominently projecting sculptures broken off. Perhaps it once held famous dust, and the bony framework of some historic man, although now only a receptacle for the rubbish of the courtyard and a half-worn broom. In the center of the court, under the blue Italian sky, and with the hundred windows of the vast palace gazing down upon it, from four sides, appears a fountain. It brims over from one stone basin to another, or gushes from a naiad's urn, or spurts its many little jets from the mouths of nameless monsters, which were merely grotesque and artificial, when Bernini, or whoever was their unnatural father, first produced them. But now the patches of moss, the tufts of grass, the trailing maidenhair, and all sorts of verdant weeds that thrive in the cracks and crevices of moist marble— tell us that nature takes the fountain back into her great heart, and cherishes it as kindly as if it were a woodland spring. And hark! The pleasant murmur, the gurgle, the plash! You might hear just those tinkling sounds from any tiny waterfall in the forest, though here they gain a delicious pathos from the stately echoes that reverberate their natural language. So the fountain is not altogether glad, after all, it's three centuries at play. In one of the angles of the courtyard, a pillared doorway gives access to the staircase, with its spacious breadth of low marble steps, up which in former times have gone the princes and cardinals of the great Roman family who built this palace. Or they have come down with still grander and loftier mien, on their way to the Vatican or the Quirinal, there to put off their scarlet hats in exchange for the triple crown. But in fine, all these illustrious personages have gone down their hereditary staircase for the last time, leaving it to be the thoroughfare of ambassadors, English noblemen, American millionaires, artists, tradesmen, washerwomen, and people of every degree, all of whom find such gilded and marble-paneled saloons as their pomp and luxury demand, or such homely garrets as their necessity can pay for, within this one multifarious abode. Only in not a single nook of the palace, built for splendor and the accommodation of a vast retinue, but with no vision of a happy fireside or any mode of domestic enjoyment, does the humblest or the haughtiest occupant find comfort. Up such a staircase, on the morning after the scene at the sculpture gallery, sprang the light foot of Donatello. He ascended from story to story, passing lofty doorways, set within rich frames of sculptured marble, and climbing unweariedly upward, until the glories of the first piano and the elegance of the middle height were exchanged for a sort of alpine region, cold and naked in its aspect. Steps of rough stone, rude wooden balustrades, a brick pavement in the passages, a dingy whitewash on the walls, these were here the palatial features. Finally he paused before an oaken door, on which was pinned a card bearing the name of Miriam Schaefer, artist in oils. Here Donatello knocked, and the door immediately fell somewhat ajar, 
its latch having been pulled up by means of a string on the inside. Passing through a little anteroom, he found himself in Miriam's presence. "'Come in, wild fawn,' she said, "'and tell me the latest news from Arcady.' The artist was not just then at her easel, but was busied with the feminine task of mending a pair of gloves. There is something extremely pleasant and even touching, at least a very sweet, soft, and winning effect, in this peculiarity of needlework, distinguishing women from men. Our own sex is incapable of any such by-play, aside from the main business of life. But women, be they of what earthly rank they may, however gifted with intellect or genius, or endowed with awful beauty, have always some little handiwork ready to fill the tiny gap of every vacant moment. A needle is familiar to the fingers of them all. A queen, no doubt, plies it on occasion. The woman poet can use it as adroitly as her pen. The woman's eye, that has discovered a new star, turns from its glory to send the polished little instrument gleaming along the hem of her kerchief or to darn a casual fray in her dress. And they have greatly the advantage of us in this respect. The slender thread of silk or cotton keeps them united with the small, familiar, gentle interests of life, the continually operating influences, of which do so much for the health of the character, and carry off what would otherwise be a dangerous accumulation of morbid sensibility. A vast deal of human sympathy runs along this electric line, stretching from the throne to the wicker chair of the humblest seamstress, and keeping high and low in a species of communion with their kindred beings. Methinks it is a token of healthy and gentle characteristics when women of high thoughts and accomplishments love to sew, especially as they are never more at home with their own hearts than while so occupied. And when the work falls in a woman's lap, of its own accord, and the needle involuntarily ceases to fly, it is a sign of trouble, quite as trustworthy as the throb of the heart itself. This was what happened to Miriam. Even while Donatello stood gazing at her, she seemed to have forgotten his presence, allowing him to drop out of her thoughts, and the torn glove to fall from her idle fingers. Simple as he was, the young man knew by his sympathies that something was amiss. "'Dear lady, you are sad,' said he, drawing close to her. "'It is nothing, Donatello,' she replied, resuming her work. "'Yes, a little sad, perhaps. "'But that is not strange for us people of the ordinary world, "'especially for women. "'You are of a cheerfuller race, my friend, "'and know nothing of this disease of sadness. "'But why do you come into this shadowy room of mine?' "'Why do you make it so shadowy?' asked he. "'We artists purposely exclude sunshine in all but a partial light,' said Miriam. "'because we think it necessary to put ourselves at odds with nature "'before trying to imitate her. "'That strikes you very strangely, does it not? "'But we make very pretty pictures sometimes "'with our artfully arranged lights and shadows. "'Amuse yourself with some of mine, Donatello, "'and by and by I shall be in the mood "'to begin the portrait we were talking about. "'The room had the customary aspect of a painter's studio.' one of those delightful spots that hardly seem to belong to the actual world, but rather to be the outward type of a poet's haunted imagination, where there are glimpses, sketches, and half-developed hints of beings and objects grander and more beautiful than we can anywhere find in reality. The windows were closed with shutters or deeply curtained, except one, which was partly open to a sunless portion of the sky, admitting only from high upward that partial light which, with its strongly marked contrast of shadow, is the first requisite towards seeing objects pictorially. Pencil drawings were pinned against the wall or scattered on the tables. Unframed canvases turned their backs on the spectator, presenting only a blank to the eye, and churlishly concealing whatever riches of scenery or human beauty Miriam's skill had depicted on the other side. In the obscurest part of the room, Donatello was half startled at perceiving duskily a woman with long dark hair, who threw up her arms with a wild gesture of tragic despair, and appeared to beckon him into the darkness along with her. "'Do not be afraid, Donatello,' said Miriam, smiling to see him peering doubtfully into the mysterious dusk. "'She means you no mischief. 
nor could perpetrate any if she wished it ever so much. It is a lady of exceedingly pliable disposition, now a heroine of romance, and now a rustic maid, yet all for show, being created indeed on purpose to wear rich shawls and other garments in a becoming fashion. This is the true end of her being, although she pretends to assume the most varied duties and perform many parts in life, while really the poor puppet has nothing on earth to do. Upon my word, I am satirical, unawares, and seem to be describing nine women out of ten in the person of my lay figure. For most purposes, she has the advantage of the sisterhood. Would I were like her? How it changes her aspect, exclaimed Donatello, to know that she is but a jointed figure. When my eyes first fell upon her, I thought her arms moved, as if beckoning me to help her in some direful peril. "'Are you often troubled with such sinister freaks of fancy?' asked Miriam. "'I should not have supposed it.' "'To tell you the truth, dear signorina,' answered the young Italian, "'I am apt to be fearful in old gloomy houses and in the dark. "'I love no dark or dusky corners, except it be in a grotto, "'or among the thick green leaves of an arbor, or in some nook of the woods, "'such as I know many in the neighborhood of my home. "'Even there?' If a stray sunbeam steal in, the shadow is all the better for its cheerful glimmer. Yes, you are a fawn, you know, said the fair artist, laughing at the remembrance of the scene of the day before. But the world is sadly changed nowadays, grievously changed, poor Donatello, since those happy times when your race used to dwell in the Arcadian woods, playing hide-and-seek with the nymphs in grottos and nooks of shrubbery. You have reappeared on earth some centuries too late. I do not understand you now, answered Donatello, looking perplexed. Only, signorina, I am glad to have my lifetime while you live. And where you are, be it in cities or fields, I would fain be there too. I wonder whether I ought to allow you to speak in this way, said Miriam, looking thoughtfully at him. Many young women would think it behooved them to be offended. Hilda would never let you speak so, I dare say. But he is a mere boy she added aside, a simple boy, putting his boyish heart to the proof on the first woman whom he chances to meet. If yonder lay figure had had the luck to meet him first, she would have smitten him as deeply as I. "'Are you angry with me?' asked Donatella dolorously. "'Not in the least,' answered Miriam frankly, giving him her hand. "'Pray, look over some of these sketches till I have leisure to chat with you a little. I hardly think I am in spirits enough to begin your portrait to-day.' Donatello was as gentle and docile as a pet spaniel, as playful, too, in his gentle disposition, or saddening with his mistress's variable mood, like that or any other kindly animal which has the faculty of bestowing its sympathies more completely than men or women can ever do. Accordingly, as Miriam bade him, he tried to turn his attention to a great pile and confusion of pen and ink sketches and pencil drawings, which lay tossed together on a table. As it chanced, however, they gave the poor youth little delight. The first that he took up was a very impressive sketch, in which the artist had jotted down her rough ideas for a picture of Yael driving the nail through the temples of Sisera. It was dashed off with remarkable power, and showed a touch or two that were actually lifelike and deathlike, as if Miriam had been standing by when Yael gave the first stroke of her murderous hammer or as if she herself were Yale, and felt irresistibly impelled to make her bloody confession in this guise. Her first conception of the stern Jewess had evidently been that of perfect womanhood, a lovely form, and a high heroic face of lofty beauty. But dissatisfied either with her own work or the terrible story itself, Miriam had added a certain wayward quirk of her pencil, which at once converted the heroine into a vulgar murderess. It was evident that a Yale like this would be sure to search Cicero's pockets as soon as the breath was out of his body. In another sketch she had attempted the story of Judith, which we see represented by the old masters so often, and in such various styles. Here, too, beginning with a passionate and fiery conception of the subject in all earnestness, she had given the last touches and utter scorn, as it were, of the feelings which at first took such powerful possession of her hand. 
the head of Holofernes, which, by the by, had a pair of twisted moustaches like those of a certain potentate of the day, being fairly cut off, was screwing its eyes upward and twirling its features into a diabolical grin of triumphant malice, which it flung right in Judith's face. On her part, she had the startled aspect that might be conceived of a cook if a calf's head should sneer at her when about to be popped into the dinner pot. Over and over again there was the idea of woman acting the part of a vengeful mischief towards man. It was indeed very singular to see how the artist's imagination seemed to run on these stories of bloodshed, at which woman's hand was crimsoned by the stain, and how, too, in one form or another, grotesque or sternly sad, she failed not to bring out the moral. That woman must strike through her own heart to reach a human life, whatever were the motive that impelled her. One of the sketches represented the daughter of Herodias receiving the head of John the Baptist in a charger. The general conception appeared to be taken from Bernardo Luini's picture in the Afuzi Gallery at Florence. But Miriam had imparted to the saint's face a look of gentle and heavenly reproach, with sad and blessed eyes fixed upward at the maiden, by the force of which miraculous glance her whole womanhood was at once awakened to love and endless remorse. These sketches had a most disagreeable effect on Donatello's peculiar temperament. He gave a shudder. His face assumed a look of trouble, fear, and disgust. He snatched up one sketch after another, as if about to tear it in pieces. Finally, shoving away the pile of drawings, he shrank back from the table and clasped his hands over his eyes. "'What is the matter, Donatello?' asked Miriam, looking up from a letter which she was now writing. "'Ah, I did not mean you to see those drawings. They are ugly phantoms that stole out of my mind. Not things that I created, but things that haunt me. See, here are some trifles that perhaps will please you better.' She gave him a portfolio, the sketches in which indicated a happier mood of mind, and one, it is to be hoped, more truly characteristic of the artist. Supposing neither of these classes of subject to show anything of her own individuality— Miriam had evidently a great scope of fancy, and a singular faculty of putting what looked like heart into her productions. The latter sketches were domestic and common scenes, so finely and subtly idealized that they seemed such as we may see at any moment and everywhere. While still there was the indefinable something added, or taken away, which makes all the difference between sordid life and an earthly paradise. The feeling and sympathy in all of them were deep and true. There was the scene that comes once in every life, of the lover winning the soft and pure avowal of bashful affection, from the maiden whose slender form half leans towards his arm, half shrinks from it. We know not which. There was wedded affection in its successive stages, represented in a series of delicately conceived designs, touched with a holy fire that burned from youth to age in those two hearts, and gave one identical beauty to the faces throughout all the changes of feature. There was a drawing of an infant's shoe, half worn out, with the airy print of the blessed foot within, a thing that would make a mother smile or weep out of the very depths of her heart, and yet an actual mother would not have been likely to appreciate the poetry of the little shoe until Miriam revealed it to her. It was wonderful, the depth and force with which the above and other kindred subjects were depicted, and the profound significance which they often acquired. The artist, still in her fresh youth, could not probably have drawn any of these dear and rich experiences from her own life, unless perchance that first sketch of all, the avowal of maiden affection, were a remembered incident and not a prophecy. But it is more delightful to believe that, from first to last, they were the productions of a beautiful imagination, dealing with the warm and pure suggestions of a woman's heart, and thus idealizing a truer and lovelier picture of the life that belongs to woman, that an actual acquaintance with some of its hard and dusty facts could have inspired. So considered, the sketches intimated such a force and variety of imaginative sympathies as would enable Miriam to fill her life richly with the bliss and suffering of womanhood, however barren it might individually be. There was one observable point, indeed. 
betokening that the artist relinquished for her personal self the happiness which she could so profoundly appreciate for others. In all those sketches of common life, and the affections that spiritualize it, a figure was portrayed apart. Now it peeped between the branches of a shrubbery, amid which two lovers sat. Now it was looking through a frosted window from the outside, while a young wedded pair sat at their new fireside within. And once it leaned from a chariot, which six horses were whirling onward in a pomp and pride, and gazed at a scene of humble enjoyment by a cottage door. Always it was the same figure, and always depicted with an expression of deep sadness. And in every instance, slightly as they were brought out, the face and form had the traits of Miriam's own. "'Do you like these sketches better, Donatello?' asked Miriam. "'Yes,' said Donatello, rather doubtfully. "'Not much, I fear,' responded she, laughing. "'And what should a boy like you, a fawn, too, know about the joys and sorrows, the intertwining light and shadow of human life? I forgot that you were a fawn. You cannot suffer deeply. Therefore you can but half enjoy. Here, now is a subject which you can better appreciate.' The sketch represented merely a rustic dance, but with such extravagance of fun as was delightful to behold. And here there was no drawback except that strange sigh and sadness which always come when we are merriest. "'I'm going to paint the picture in oils,' said the artist, "'and I want you, Donatello, for the wildest dancer of them all. "'Will you sit for me some day, or rather dance for me?' "'Oh, most gladly, signorina!' exclaimed Donatello. "'See, it shall be like this.' And forthwith he began to dance and flit about the studio like an incarnate sprite of jollity, pausing at last on the extremity of one toe, as if that were the only portion of himself whereby his frisky nature could come in contact with the earth. The effect in that shadowy chamber, whence the artist had so carefully excluded the sunshine, was as enlivening as if one bright ray had contrived to shimmer in and frolic around the walls and finally rest just in the center of the floor. "'That was admirable,' said Miriam, with an approving smile. If I can catch you on my canvas, it will be a glorious picture. Only I'm afraid you will dance out of it by the very truth of the representation, just when I shall have given it the last touch. We will try it one of these days. And now, to reward you for that jolly exhibition, you shall see what has been shown to no one else. She went to her easel, on which was placed a picture with its back turned towards the spectator. Reversing the position, there appeared the portrait of a beautiful woman, such as one sees only two or three, if even so many times, in all a lifetime, so beautiful that she seemed to get into your consciousness and memory, and could never afterwards be shut out, but haunt your dreams, for pleasure or for pain, holding your inner realm as a conquered territory, though without dining to make herself at home there. She was very youthful and had what was usually thought to be a Jewish aspect, a complexion in which there was no roseate bloom, yet neither was it pale, dark eyes into which you might look as deeply as your glance would go, and still be conscious of a depth that you had not sounded, though it lay open to the day. She had black, abundant hair, with none of the vulgar glossiness of other women's sable locks. If she were really of Jewish blood, then this was Jewish hair and a dark glory such as crowns no Christian maiden's head. Gazing at this portrait, you saw what Rachel might have been when Jacob deemed her worth the wooing seven years and seven more. Or perchance she might ripen to be what Judith was when she vanquished Holofernes with her beauty and slew him for too much adoring it. Miriam watched Donatello's contemplation of the picture, and seeing his simple rapture, a smile of pleasure brightened on her face, mixed with a little scorn. At least her lips curled and her eyes gleamed, as if she disdained either his admiration or her own enjoyment of it. "'Then you like the picture, Donatello?' she asked. "'Oh, beyond what I can tell,' he answered. "'So beautiful! So beautiful!' "'And do you recognize the likeness?' "'Signorina!' exclaimed Donatello, turning from the picture to the artist. In astonishment that she should ask the question. 
The resemblance is as little to be mistaken as if you had bent over the smooth surface of a fountain and possessed the witchcraft to call forth the image that you made there. It is yourself. Donatello said the truth, and we forbore to speak descriptively of Miriam's beauty earlier in our narrative, because we foresaw this occasion to bring it perhaps more forcibly before the reader. We know not whether the portrait were a flattered likeness. Probably not regarding it merely as the delineation of a lovely face, although Miriam, like all self-painters, may have endowed herself with certain graces which other eyes might not discern. Artists are fond of painting their own portraits, and in Florence there is a gallery of hundreds of them, including the most illustrious, in all of which there are autobiographical characteristics, so to speak, traits, expressions, loftinesses, and amenities, which would have been invisible, had they not been painted from within. Yet their reality and truth are none the less. Miriam, in like manner, had doubtless conveyed some of the intimate results of her heart knowledge into her own portrait, and perhaps wished to try whether they would be perceptible to so simple and natural an observer as Donatello. "'Does the expression please you?' she asked. "'Yes,' said Donatello hesitatingly. "'if it would only smile so like the sunshine as you sometimes do. "'No, it is sadder than I thought at first. "'Cannot you make yourself smile a little, Signorina? "'A forced smile is uglier than a frown,' said Miriam, "'a bright natural smile breaking out over her face even as she spoke. "'Oh, catch it now!' cried Donatello, clapping his hands. "'Let it shine upon the picture. There! It has vanished already. "'And you are sad again, very sad.' and the pitcher gazes sadly forth at me, as if some evil had befallen it in the little time since I looked last. "'How perplexed you seem, my friend,' answered Miriam. "'I really half believe you are a fawn. There is such a mystery and terror for you in these dark moods, which are just as natural as daylight to us people of ordinary mould. I advise you, at all events, to look at other faces, with those innocent and happy eyes, and never more to gaze at mine.' "'You speak in vain,' replied the young man, with a deeper emphasis than she had ever before heard in his voice. "'Shroud yourself in what gloom you will. I must needs follow you.' "'Well, well, well,' said Miriam impatiently. "'But leave me now. For to speak plainly, my good friend, you grow a little... Volume 1, Chapter 6 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 1, Chapter 6 The Virgin's Shrine. After Donatello had left the studio, Miriam herself came forth, and taking her way through some of the intricacies of the city, entered what might be called either a widening of a street or a small piazza. The neighborhood comprised a baker's oven, emitting the usual fragrance of sour bread, a shoe shop, a linen draper's shop, a pipe and cigar shop, a lottery office, a station for French soldiers, with a sentinel pacing in front, and a fruit stand at which a Roman matron was selling the dried kernels of chestnuts, wretched little figs, and some bouquets of yesterday. A church, of course, was near at hand, the façade of which ascended into lofty pinnacles, whereon were perched two or three winged figures of stone, either angelic or allegorical blowing stone trumpets in close vicinity to the upper windows of an old and shabby palace. This palace was distinguished by a feature not very common in the architecture of Roman edifices, that is to say, a medieval tower, square, massive, lofty, and battlemented and machicolated at the summit. 
at one of the angels of the battlements stood a shrine of the virgin such as we see everywhere at the street corners of rome but seldom or never except in this solitary instance at a height above the ordinary level of men's views and aspirations connected with this old tower and its lofty shrine there is a legend which we cannot here pause to tell but for centuries a lamp has been burning before the virgin's image at noon at midnight and at all hours of the twenty-four and must be kept burning for ever as long as the tower shall stand or else the tower itself the palace and whatever estate belongs to it shall pass from its hereditary possessor in accordance with an ancient vow and become the property of the church as miriam approached she looked upward and saw not indeed the flame of the never-dying lamp which was swallowed up in the broad sunlight that brightened the shrine but a flock of white doves skimming fluttering and wheeling about the topmost height of the tower their silver wings flashing in the pure transparency of the air several of them sat on the ledge of the upper window pushing one another off by their eager struggle for this favorite station and all tapping their beaks and flapping their wings tumultuously against the panes some had alighted in the street far below but flew hastily upward at the sound of the window being thrust ajar and opening in the middle on rusty hinges as roman windows do a fair young girl dressed in white showed herself at the aperture for a single instant and threw forth as much as her two small hands could hold of some kind of food for the flock of eleemosynary doves it seemed greatly to the taste of the feathered people for they tried to snatch beakfuls of it from her grasp caught it in the air and rushed downward after it upon the pavement what a pretty scene this is thought miriam with a kindly smile and how like a dove she is herself the fair pure creature the other doves know her for a sister i am sure miriam passed beneath the deep portal of the palace and turning to the left began to mount flight after flight of a staircase which for the loftiness of its aspiration was worthy to be jacob's ladder or at all events the staircase of the tower of babel the city bustle which is heard even in rome the rumble of wheels over the uncomfortable paving stones the hard harsh cries re-echoing in the high and narrow streets grew faint and died away as the turmoil of the world will always die if we set our faces to climb heavenward higher and higher still and now glancing through the successive windows that threw in their narrow light upon the stairs her view stretched across the roofs of the city unimpeded even by the stateliest palaces only the domes of churches ascend into this airy region and hold up their golden crosses on a level with her eye except that out of the very heart of rome the column of antonius thrusts itself upward with saint paul upon its summit the sole human form that seems to have kept her company finally the staircase came to an end save that on one side of the little entry where it terminated a flight of a dozen steps gave access to the roof of the tower and the legendary shrine on the other side was a door at which miriam knocked but rather as a friendly announcement of her presence than with any doubt of hospitable welcome for awaiting no response she lifted the latch and entered what a hermitage you have found for yourself dear hilda she exclaimed you breathe sweet air above all the evil scents of rome and even so in your maiden elevation you dwell above our vanities and passions our moral dust and mud with the doves and the angels for your nearest neighbors i should not wonder if the catholics were to make a saint of you like your namesake of old 
especially as you have almost avowed yourself to their religion by undertaking to keep the lamp alight before the virgin's shrine no no miriam said hilda who had come joyfully forward to greet her friend you must not call me a catholic a christian girl even a daughter of the puritans may surely pay honour to the idea of divine womanhood without giving up the faith of her forefathers but how kind you are to climb into my dovecot it is no trifling proof of friendship indeed answered miriam i should think there were three hundred stairs at least but it will do you good continued hilda at height of some fifty feet above the roofs of rome gives me all the advantages that i could get from fifty miles of distance the air so exhilarates my spirits that sometimes i feel half inclined to attempt a flight from the top of my tower in the faith that i should float upward oh pray don't try it said miriam laughing if it should turn out that you are less than an angel you would find the stones of the roman pavement very hard and if an angel indeed i am afraid you would never come down among us again this young american girl was an example of the freedom of life which it is possible for a female artist to enjoy at rome she dwelt in her tower as free to descend into the corrupted atmosphere of the city beneath as one of her companion doves to fly downward into the street all alone perfectly independent under her own sole guardianship unless watched over by the virgin whose shrine she tended doing what she liked without a suspicion or a shadow upon the snowy whiteness of her fame the customs of artist life bestow such liberty upon the sex which is elsewhere restricted within so much narrower limits and it is perhaps an indication that whenever we admit women to a wider scope of pursuits and professions we must also remove the shackles of our present conventional rules which would then become an insufferable restraint on either maid or wife the system seems to work unexceptionably in rome and in many other cases as in hilda's purity of heart and life are allowed to assert themselves and to be their own proof and security to a degree unknown in the society of other cities hilda in her native land had early shown what was pronounced by connoisseurs a decided genius for the pictorial art even in her school days still not so very distant she had produced sketches that were seized upon by men of taste and hoarded as among the choicest treasures of their portfolios scenes delicately imagined lacking perhaps the reality which comes only from a close acquaintance with life but so softly touched with feeling and fancy that you seem to be looking at humanity with angels eyes with years and her experience she might be expected to attain a darker and more forcible touch which would impart to her designs the relief they needed had hilda remained in her own country it is not improbable that she might have produced original works worthy to hang in that gallery of native art which we hope is destined to extend its rich length through many future centuries an orphan however without near relatives and possessed of a little property she had found it within her possibilities to come to italy that central clime with the eyes and the heart of every artist turn as if pictures could not be made to glow in any other atmosphere as if statues could not assume grace and expression save in that land of whitest marble hilda's gentle courage had brought her safely over land and sea her mild unflagging perseverance had made a place for her in the famous city even like a flower that finds a chink for itself and a little earth to grow in on whatever ancient wall its slender root may fasten here she dwelt in her tower possessing a friend or two in rome 
but no home companion except the flock of doves whose cot was in a ruinous chamber contiguous to her own they soon became as familiar with the fair-haired saxon girl as if she were a born sister of their broad and her customary white robe bore such an analogy to their snowy plumage that the confraternity of artists called her hilda the dove and recognized her aerial apartments as the dovecot and while the other doves flew far and wide in quest of what was good for them hilda likewise spread her wings and sought such ethereal and imaginative sustenance as god ordains for creatures of her kind we know not whether the result of her italian studies so far as it could yet be seen will be accepted as a good or desirable one certain it is that since her arrival in the pictorial land hilda seemed to have entirely lost the impulse of original design which brought her thither no doubt the girl's early dreams had been of sending forms and use of beauty into the visible world out of her own mind of compelling scenes of poetry and history to live before men's eyes through conceptions and by methods individual to herself but more and more as she grew familiar with the miracles of art that enrich so many galleries in rome hilda had ceased to consider herself as an original artist no wonder that this change should have befallen her she was endowed with a deep and sensitive faculty of appreciation she had the gift of discerning and worshipping excellence in a most unusual measure no other person it is probable recognized so adequately and enjoyed with such deep delight the pictorial wonders that were here displayed she saw no not saw but felt through and through a picture she bestowed upon it all the warmth and richness of a woman's sympathy not by any intellectual effort but by this strength of heart and this guiding light of sympathy she went straight to the central point in which the master had conceived his work thus she viewed it as it were with his own eyes and hence her comprehension of any picture that interested her was perfect this power and depth of appreciation depended partly upon hilda's physical organization which was at once healthful and exquisitely delicate and connected with this advantage she had a command of hand a nicety and force of touch which is an endowment separate from pictorial genius though indispensable to its exercise it has probably happened in many other instances as it did in hilda's case that she ceased to aim at original achievement in consequence of the very gifts which so exquisitely fitted her to profit by familiarity with the works of the mighty old masters reverencing these wonderful men so deeply she was too grateful for all they bestowed upon her too loyal too humble in their awful presence to think of enrolling herself in their society beholding the miracles of beauty which they had achieved the world seemed already rich enough in original designs and nothing more was so desirable as to diffuse those self-same beauties more widely among mankind all the youthful hopes and ambitions the fanciful ideas which she had brought from home of great pictures to be conceived in her feminine mind were flung aside and so far as those most intimate with her could discern relinquished without a sigh all that she would henceforth attempt and that most reverently not to say religiously was to catch and reflect some of the glory which had been shed upon canvas from immortal pencils of old so hilda became a copyist in the pinatotheca of the vatican in the galleries of the pamphili doria palace the borghese the corsini the schiara 
her easel was set up before many a famous picture by guido dominicino raphael and the devout painters of earlier schools than these other artists and visitors from foreign lands beheld the slender girlish figure in front of some world-known work absorbed unconscious of everything around her seeming to live only in what she sought to do they smiled no doubt at the audacity which led her to dream of copying those mighty achievements but if they paused to look over her shoulder and had sensibility enough to understand what was before their eyes they soon felt inclined to believe that the spirits of the old masters were hovering over hilda and guiding her delicate white hand in truth from whatever realm of bliss and many-coloured beauty those spirits might descend it would have been no unworthy errand to help so gentle and pure a worshipper of their genius in giving the last divine touch to repetitions of their works her copies were indeed marvellous accuracy was not the phrase for them a chinese copy is accurate hilda's had that evanescent and ethereal life that flitting fragrance as it were of the originals which it is as difficult to catch and retain as it would be for a sculptor to get the very movement and varying color of a living man into his marble bust only by watching the efforts of the most skilful copyists men who spend a lifetime as some of them do in multiplying copies of a single picture and observing how invariably they leave out just the indefinable charm that involves the last inestimable value can we understand the difficulties of the task which they undertake it was not hilda's general practice to attempt reproducing the whole of a great picture but to select some high noble and delicate portion of it in which the spirit and essence of the picture culminated the virgin's celestial sorrow for example or a hovering angel imbued with immortal light or a saint with a glow of heaven in his dying face and these would be rendered with her whole soul if a picture had darkened into an indistinct shadow through time and neglect or had been injured by cleaning or retouched by some profane hand she seemed to possess the faculty of seeing it in its pristine glory the copy would come from her hands with what the beholder felt must be the light which the old master had left upon the original in bestowing his final and most ethereal touch in some instances even at least so those believed who best appreciated hilda's power and sensibility she had been enabled to execute what the great masters had conceived in his imagination but had not so perfectly succeeded in putting upon canvas a result surely not impossible when such depth of sympathy as she possessed was assisted by the delicate skill and accuracy of her slender hand in such cases the girl was but a finer instrument a more exquisitely effective piece of mechanism by the help of which the spirit of some great departed painter now first achieved his ideal centuries after his own earthly hand that other tool had turned to dust not to describe her as too much a wonder however hilda or the dove as her well-wishers half laughingly delighted to call her had been pronounced by good judges incomparably the best copyist in rome after minute examination of her works the most skilful artist declared that she had been led to her results by following precisely the same process step by step through which the original painter had trodden to the development of his idea other copyists if such they are worthy to be called attempt only a superficial imitation copies of the old masters in this sense are produced by thousands there are artists as we have said 
who spend their lives in painting the works of perhaps one single work of one illustrious painter over and over again thus they convert themselves into guido machines or raphaelic machines their performances it is true are often wonderfully deceptive to a careless eye but working entirely from the outside and seeking only to reproduce the surface these men are sure to leave out that indefinable nothing that inestimable something that constitutes the life and soul through which the picture gets its immortality hilda was no such machine as this she wrought religiously and therefore wrought a miracle it strikes us that there is something far higher and nobler in all this in her thus sacrificing herself to the devout recognition of the highest excellence in art than there would have been in cultivating her not inconsiderable share of talent for the production of works from her own ideas she might have set up for herself and won no ignoble name she might have helped to fill the already crowded and cumbered world with pictures not destitute of merit but falling short if by ever so little of the best that has been done she might thus have gratified some tastes that were incapable of appreciating raphael but this could be done only by lowering the standard of art to the comprehension of the spectator she chose the better and loftier and more unselfish part laying her individual hopes her fame her prospects of enduring remembrance at the feet of those great departed ones whom she so loved and venerated and therefore the world was the richer for this feeble girl since the beauty and glory of a great picture are confined within itself she won out that glory by patient faith and self-devotion and multiplied it for mankind from the dark chill corner of a gallery from some curtained chapel in a church where the light came seldom and aslant from the prince's carefully guarded cabinet where not one eye in thousands was permitted to behold it she brought the wondrous picture into daylight and gave all its magic splendor for the enjoyment of the world hilda's faculty of genuine admiration is one of the rarest to be found in human nature and let us try to recompense her in kind by admiring her generous self-surrender and her brave humble magnanimity in choosing to be the handmaid of those old magicians instead of a minor enchantress within a circle of her own the handmaid of raphael whom she loved with the virgin's love would it have been worth hilda's while to relinquish this office for the sake of giving the world a picture or two which it would call original pretty fancies of snow and moonlight the counterpart in picture of so many feminine achievements in literature Volume One, Chapter Seven of the Marble Faun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Faun by Nathaniel Hawthorne, Volume One, Chapter Seven, Beatrice. Miriam was glad to find the dove in her turret home, for being endowed with an infinite activity, and taking exquisite delight in the sweet labor of which her life was full, it was Hilda's practice to flee abroad betimes, and haunt the galleries till dusk. Happy were those, but they were very few, whom she ever chose to be the companions of her day. They saw the art treasures of Rome under her guidance, as they had never seen them before. 
nor that Hilda could dissertate or talk learnedly about pictures, she would probably have been puzzled by the technical terms of her own art. Not that she had much to say about what she most profoundly admired, but even her silent sympathy was so powerful that it drew your own along with it, endowing you with a second sight that enabled you to see excellences with almost the depth of delicacy of her own perceptions. All the Anglo-Saxon denizens of Rome by this time knew Hilda by sight. Unconsciously, the poor child had become one of the spectacles of the Eternal City, and was often pointed out to strangers, sitting at her easel among the wild-bearded young men, the white-haired old ones, and the shabbily dressed, painfully plain women, who make up the throng of copyists. The old custodes knew her well, and watched over her as their own child. Sometimes a young artist instead of going on with the copy of the picture before which he had placed his easel, would enrich his canvas with an original portrait of Hilda at her work. A lovelier subject could not have been selected, nor one which required nicer skill and insight in doing it anything like justice. She was pretty at all times in our native New England style, with her light brown ringlets, her delicately tinged but healthful cheek, her sensitive, intelligent, yet most feminine and kindly face. But every few moments this pretty and girlish face grew beautiful and striking, as some inward thought and feeling brightened, rose to the surface, and then, as it were, passed out of sight again, so that taking into view this constantly recurring change, it really seemed as if Hilda were only visible by the sunshine of her soul. In other respects she was a good subject for a portrait, being distinguished by a gentle picturesqueness, which was perhaps unconsciously bestowed by some minute peculiarity of dress, such as artists seldom fail to assume. The effect was to make her appear like an inhabitant of picture-land, a partly ideal creature, not to be handled, nor even approached too closely. In her feminine self, Hilda was natural, and of a pleasant deportment, endowed with a mild cheerfulness of temper, not overflowing with animal spirits, but never long despondent. There was a certain simplicity that made every one her friend, but it was combined with a subtile attribute of reserve, that insensibly kept those at a distance who were not suited to her sphere. Miriam was the dearest friend whom she had ever known, being a year or two the elder, of longer acquaintance with Italy, and better fitted to deal with its crafty and selfish inhabitants. She had helped Hilda to arrange her way of life and had encouraged her through those first weeks when Rome is so dreary to every newcomer. "'But how lucky that you are at home to-day,' said Miriam, continuing the conversation, which was begun many pages back. "'I hardly hoped to find you, though I had a favour to ask, a commission to put into your charge. But what picture is this?' See, said Hilda, taking her friend's hand and leading her in front of the easel, I wanted your opinion of it. If you have really succeeded, observed Miriam, recognizing the picture at the first glance, it will be the greatest miracle you have yet achieved. The picture represented simply a female head, a very youthful, girlish, perfectly beautiful face, enveloped in white drapery, from beneath which strayed a lock or two of what seemed a rich, though hidden, luxuriance of auburn hair. The eyes were large and brown, and met those of the spectator, but evidently with a strange, ineffectual effort to escape. There was a little redness about the eyes, very slightly indicated, so that you would question 
whether or no the girl had been weeping. The whole face was quiet. There was no distortion or disturbance of any single feature, nor was it easy to see why the expression was not cheerful, or why a single touch of the artist's pencil should not brighten it into joyousness. But, in fact, it was the very saddest picture ever painted or conceived. It involved an unfathomable depth of sorrow, the sense of which came to the observer by a sort of intuition. It was a sorrow that removed this beautiful girl out of the sphere of humanity, and set her in a far-off region, the remoteness of which, while yet her face is so close before us, makes us shiver as at a spectre. "'Yes, Hilda,' said her friend, after closely examining the picture, "'you have done nothing else so wonderful as this. But by what unheard of solicitations or secret interest have you obtained leave to copy Guido's Beatrice Sensi? It is an unexampled favour, and the impossibility of getting a genuine copy has filled the Roman picture-shops with Beatrice's gay grievous and coquettish but never a true one among them there has been one exquisite copy i have heard said hilda by an artist capable of appreciating the spirit of the picture it was thompson who brought it away piecemeal being forbidden like the rest of us to set up his easel before it as for me i knew the prince barberini would be deaf to all entreaties so I had no resource but to sit down before the picture day after day, and let it sink into my heart. I do believe it is now photographed there. It is a sad face to keep so close to one's heart. Only what is so very beautiful can never be quite a pain. Well, after studying it in this way, I know not how many times— I came home and have done my best to transfer the image to canvas. Here it is, then, said Miriam, contemplating Hilda's work with great interest and delight, mixed with the painful sympathy that the picture excited. Everywhere we see oil paintings, crayon sketches, cameos, engravings, lithographs, pretending to be Beatrice, and representing the poor girl with blubbered eyes, a leer of coquetry, a merry look as if she were dancing, a piteous look as if she were beaten, and twenty other modes of fantastic mistake. But here is Guido's very Beatrice, she that slept in the dungeon and awoke betimes to ascend the scaffold. And now that you have done it, Hilda, can you interpret what the feeling is that gives this picture such a mysterious force? For my part, though deeply sensible of its influence, I cannot seize it. Nor can I in words, replied her friend. But while I was painting her, I felt all the time as if she were trying to escape from my gaze. She knows that her sorrow is so strange and so immense that she ought to be solitary for ever, both for the world's sake and her own. And this is the reason we feel such a distance between Beatrice and ourselves, even when our eyes meet hers. It is infinitely heartbreaking to meet her glance, and to feel that nothing can be done to help or comfort her. Neither does she ask help or comfort, knowing the hopelessness of her case better than we do. She is a fallen angel, fallen and yet sinless, and it is only this depth of sorrow, with its weight and darkness, that keeps her down upon earth, and brings her within our view, even while it sets her beyond our reach. "'You deem her sinless?' asked Miriam. That is not so plain to me. If I can pretend to see at all into that dim region whence she gazes so strangely and sadly at us, Beatrice's own conscience 
does not acquit her of something evil and never to be forgiven. Sorrow so black as hers oppresses her very nearly as sin would, said Hilda. Then, inquired Miriam, do you think that there was no sin in the deed for which she suffered? Ah, replied Hilda, shuddering, I really had quite forgotten Beatrice's history, and was thinking of her only as the picture seems to reveal her character. Yes, yes, it was terrible guilt, an inexpiable crime, and she feels it to be so. Therefore it is that the forlorn creature so longs to elude our eyes, and for ever vanish away into nothingness. Her doom is just. Oh, Hilda, your innocence is like a sharp steel sword, exclaimed her friend. Your judgments are often terribly severe, though you seem all made up of gentleness and mercy. Beatrice's sin may not have been so great, perhaps it was no sin at all, but the best virtue possible in the circumstances. If she viewed it as a sin, it may have been because her nature was too feeble for the fate imposed upon her. Ah, continued Miriam passionately, if I could only get within her consciousness, if I could but clasp Beatrice, sense his ghost, and draw it into myself, I would give my life to know whether she thought herself innocent or the one great criminal since time began. As Miriam gave utterance to these words, Hilda looked from the picture into her face, and was startled to observe that her friend's expression had become almost exactly that of the portrait, as if her passionate wish and struggle to penetrate poor Beatrice's mystery had been successful. Oh, for heaven's sake, Miriam, do not look so, she cried. What an actress you are, and I never guessed it before. Ah, now you are yourself again, she added, kissing her. Leave Beatrice to me in future. Cover up your magical picture, then, replied her friend, else I never can look away from it. It is strange, dear Hilda, how an innocent, delicate, white soul like yours has been able to seize the subtle mystery of this portrait, as you surely must in order to reproduce it so perfectly. Well, we will not talk of it any more. Do you know, I have come to you this morning on a small matter of business. Will you undertake it for me? Oh, certainly said Hilda, laughing, if you choose to trust me with business. Nay, it's not a matter of any difficulty, answered Miriam, merely to take charge of this packet and keep it for me a while. But why not keep it yourself? asked Hilda. Partly because it will be safer in your charge, said her friend. I'm a careless sort of person in ordinary things, while you, for all you dwell so high above the world, have certain little housewifely ways of accuracy and order. The packet is of some slight importance, and yet it may be I shall not ask you for it again. In a week or two, you know, I am leaving Rome. You, setting at defiance the malarial fever, mean to stay here and haunt your beloved galleries through the summer. Now, four months hence, unless you hear more from me, I would have you deliver the packet according to its address. Hilda read the direction. It was to Signore Luca Barboni at the Palazzo Censi, third piano. I will deliver it with my own hand, said she, precisely four months from today, unless you bid me to the contrary. Perhaps I shall meet the ghost of Beatrice in that grim old palace of her forefathers. In that case, rejoined Miriam, do not fail to speak to her and try to win her confidence. Poor thing! 
she would be all the better for pouring her heart out freely, and would be glad to do it if she were sure of sympathy. It irks my brain and heart to think of her, all shut up within herself. She withdrew the cloth that Hilda had drawn over the picture, and took another long look at it. Poor Sister Beatrice! For she was still a woman, Hilda, still a sister, be her sin or sorrow what they might. How well you have done it, Hilda! I know not whether Guido will thank you or be jealous of your rivalship. Jealous, indeed, exclaimed Hilda. If Guido had not wrought through me, my pains would have been thrown away. After all, resumed Miriam, if a woman had painted the original picture, there might have been something in it which we miss now. I have a great mind to undertake a copy myself, and try to give it what it lacks. Well, good-bye, but stay. I am going for a little airing to the grounds of the Villa Borghese this afternoon. You will think it very foolish, but I always feel the safer in your company, Hilda. "'Slender little maiden as you are, will you come?' "'Ah, not to-day, dearest Miriam,' she replied. "'I have set my heart on giving another touch or two to this picture, "'and shall not stir abroad till nearly sunset.' "'Farewell, then,' said her visitor. "'I leave you in your dovecot. "'What a sweet, strange life you lead here, "'conversing with the souls of the old masters.' feeding and fondling your sister-doves, and trimming the virgin's lamp. Hilda, do you ever pray to the virgin while you tend her shrine? Sometimes I have been moved to do so, replied the dove, blushing and lowering her eyes. She was a woman once. Do you think it would be wrong? Nay, that is for you to judge, said Miriam. But when you pray next, dear friend, remember me. She went down the long descent of the lower staircase, and just as she reached the street, the flock of doves again took their hurried flight from the pavement to the topmost window. She threw her eyes upward and beheld them hovering about Hilda's head, for, after her friend's departure, the girl had been more impressed than before by something very sad and troubled in her manner. She was therefore leaning forth from her airy abode, and flinging down a kind maidenly kiss, and a gesture of farewell, in the hope that these might alight upon Miriam's heart, and comfort its unknown sorrow a little. Kenyon the sculptor, who chanced to be passing the head of the street, took note of the ethereal kiss, and wished that he could have caught it in the air, and got Hilda's leave to keep it. Volume 1, Chapter 8 of The Marble Fawn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 1, Chapter 8 The Suburban Villa Donatello, while it was still a doubtful question betwixt afternoon and morning, set forth to keep the appointment which Miriam had carelessly tendered him in the grounds of the Villa Borghese. The entrance to these grounds, as all my readers know, for everybody nowadays has been in Rome, is just outside of the Porta del Popolo. Passing beneath that not very impressive specimen of Michelangelo's architecture, a minute's walk will transport the visitor from the small, uneasy lava stones of the Roman pavement into broad, graveled carriage drives, 
whence a little farther stroll brings him to the soft turf of a beautiful seclusion. A seclusion, but seldom a solitude, for priest, noble and populace, stranger and native, all who breathe Roman air find free admission, and come hither to taste the languid enjoyment of the daydream that they call life. But Donatello's enjoyment was of a livelier kind. He soon began to draw long and delightful breaths among those shadowy walks. Judging by the pleasure which the sylvan character of the scene excited in him, it might be no merely fanciful theory to set him down as the kinsman, not far remote of that wild, sweet, playful, rustic creature to whose marble image he bore so striking a resemblance. How mirthful a discovery would it be, and yet with a touch of pathos in it, if the breeze which sported fondly with his clustering locks were to waft them suddenly aside and show a pair of leaf-shaped furry ears. What an honest strain of wildness would it indicate, and into what regions of rich mystery would it extend Donatello's sympathies, to be thus linked, and by no monstrous chain, with what we call the inferior trios of being, whose simplicity, mingled with his human intelligence, might partly restore what man has lost of the divine. The scenery amid which the youth now strayed was such as arrays itself in the imagination when we read the beautiful old mists, and fancy a brighter sky, a softer turf, a more picturesque arrangement of venerable trees, than we find in the rude and untrained landscapes of the western world. The elex trees, so ancient and time-honored were they, seemed to have lived for ages undisturbed, and to feel no dread of profanation by the axe any more than overthrow by the thunderstroke. It had already passed out of their dreamy old memories, that only a few years ago they were grievously imperiled by the Gauls' last assault upon the walls of Rome. As if confident in the long peace of their lifetime, they assumed attitudes of indolent repose. They leaned over the green turf in ponderous grace, throwing abroad their great branches without danger of interfering with other trees, though other majestic trees grew near enough for dignified society, but too distant for constraint. Never was there a more venerable quietude than that which slept among their sheltering boughs, never a sweeter sunshine than that now gladdening the gentle gloom which these leafy patriarchs strove to diffuse over the swelling and subsiding lawns. In other portions of the grounds the stone pines lifted their dense clump of branches upon a slender length of stem so high that they looked like green islands in the air, flinging down a shadow upon the turf so far off that you hardly knew which tree had made it. Again there were avenues of cypress, resembling dark flames of huge funeral candles, which spread dusk and twilight round about them, instead of cheerful radiance. The more open spots were all abloom, even so early in the season, with anemones of wondrous size, both white and rose-colored, and violets that betrayed themselves by their rich fragrance, even if their blue eyes failed to meet your own. Daisies, too, were abundant, but larger than the modest little English flower, and therefore of small account. These wooded and flowery lawns are more beautiful than the finest of English park scenery, more touching, more impressive, through the neglect that leaves nature so much to her own ways and methods. Since man seldom interferes with her, 
she sets to work in her quiet way and makes herself at home. There is enough of human care, it is true, bestowed long ago and still bestowed, to prevent wildness from growing into deformity. And the result is an ideal landscape, a woodland scene that seems to have been projected out of the poet's mind. If the ancient faun were other than a mere creation of old poetry, and could have reappeared anywhere, it must have been in such a scene as this. In the openings of the wood there are fountains splashing into marble basins, the depths of which are shaggy with water-weeds, or they tumble like natural cascades from rock to rock, sending their murmur afar, to make the quiet and silence more appreciable. Scattered here and there with careless artifice stand old altars bearing Roman inscriptions, statues grey with the long corrosion of even that soft atmosphere, half hide and half reveal themselves, high on pedestals, or perhaps fallen and broken on the turf. Terminal figures, columns of marble or granite porticos, arches, are seen in the vistas of the wood paths, either veritable relics of antiquity, or with so exquisite a touch of artful ruin on them that they are better than if really antique. At all events, grass grows on the tops of the shattered pillars, and weeds and flowers root themselves in the chinks of the massive arches and fronts of temples, and clamber at large over their pediments, as if this were the southern summer since their winged seeds alighted there. What a strange idea! What a needless labor to construct artificial ruins in Rome! the native soil of ruin. But even these sportive imitations, wrought by man in emulation of what time has done to temples and palaces, are perhaps centuries old, and, beginning as illusions, have grown to be venerable in sober earnest. The result of all is a scene, pensive, lovely, dreamlike, enjoyable, and sad such as is to be found nowhere save in these princely villa residences in the neighborhood of Rome, a scene that must have required generations and ages during which growth, decay, and man's intelligence wrought kindly together to render it so gently wild as we behold it now. The final charm is bestowed by the malaria. There is a piercing, thrilling, delicious kind of regret in the idea of so much beauty thrown away, or only enjoyable as its half-development in winter and early spring, and never to be dwelt amongst as the home scenery of any human being. For if you come hither in summer and stray through these glades in the golden sunset, Fever walks arm in arm with you, and death awaits you at the end of the dim vista. Thus the scene is like Eden in its loveliness, like Eden, too, in the fatal spell that removes it beyond the scope of man's actual possessions. But Donatello felt nothing of this dreamlike melancholy that haunts the spot. As he passed among the sunny shadows, his spirit seemed to acquire new elasticity. The flicker of the sunshine, the sparkle of the fountain's gush, the dance of the leaf upon the bough, the woodland fragrance, the green freshness, the old sylvan peace and freedom, were all intermingled in those long breasts which he drew. The ancient dust, the mouldiness of Rome, the dead atmosphere in which he had wasted so many months, the hard payments, the smell of ruin and decaying generations, the chill palaces, the convent bells, the heavy incense of altars, the life that he had led in those dark, narrow streets, 
among priests, soldiers, nobles, artists, and women. All the sense of these things rose from the young man's consciousness, like a cloud which had darkened over him without his knowing how densely. He drank in the natural influences of the scene, and was intoxicated as by an exhilarating wine. He ran races with himself along the gleam and shadow of the wood paths. He leapt up to catch the overhanging bow of an elix, and swinging himself by it alighted far onward, as if he had flown thither through the air. In a sudden rapture he embraced the trunk of a sturdy tree, and seemed to imagine it a creature worthy of affection and capable of a tender response. He clasped it closely in his arms, as a fawn might have clasped the warm feminine grace of the nymph whom antiquity supposed to dwell within that rough encircling rind. Then, in order to bring himself closer to the genial earth, with which his kindred instincts linked him so strongly, he threw himself at full length on the turf, and pressed down his lips, kissing the violets and daisies, which kissed him back again, though shyly, in their maiden fashion. While he lay there, it was pleasant to see how the green and blue lizards, who had been basking on some rock or on a fallen pillar, that absorbed the warmth of the sun, scrupled not to scramble over him with their small feet, and how the birds alighted on the nearest twigs and sang their little roundelays, unbroken by any chirrup of alarm. They recognized him, it may be, as something akin to themselves, or else they fancied that he was rooted and grew there, for these wild pets of nature dreaded him no more in his bioyant life than if a mound of soil and grass and flowers had long since covered his dead body, converting it back to the sympathies from which human existence had estranged it. All of us, after a long abode in cities, have felt the blood gush more joyously through our veins with the first breath of rural air. Few could feel it so much as Donatello, a creature of simple elements, bred in the sweet sylvan life of Tuscany, and for months back dwelling amid the mouldy gloom and dim splendour of old Rome. Nature has been shut out for numberless centuries from those stony-hearted streets to which he had latterly grown accustomed. There is no trace of her, except for what blades of grass spring out of the pavements of the less trodden piazzas, or what weeds cluster and tuft themselves on the cornices of ruins. Therefore his joy was like that of a child that had gone astray from home, and finds him suddenly in his mother's arms again. At last, deeming it full time for Miriam to keep her tryst, he climbed to the tip-top of the tallest tree, and thence looked about him, swaying to and fro in the gentle breeze, which was like the respiration of that great leafy living thing. Donatello saw beneath him the whole circuit of the enchanted ground, the statues and columns pointing upward from among the shrubbery, the fountains flashing in the sunlight, the paths winding hither and thither, and continually finding out some nook of new and ancient pleasantness. He saw the villa, too, with its marble front encrusted all over with bas-reliefs, and statues in its many niches. It was as beautiful as a fairy palace and seemed an abode in which the lord and lady of this fair domain might fitly dwell, and come forth each morning to enjoy as sweet a life as their happiest dreams of the past night could have depicted. All this he saw, but his first glance had taken in too wide a sweep, 
and it was not till his eyes fell almost directly beneath him that Donatello beheld Miriam, just turning into the path that led across the roots of his very tree. He descended among the foliage, waiting for her to come close to the trunk, and then suddenly dropped from an impending bough and alighted at her side. It was as if the swaying of the branches had let a ray of sunlight through. The same ray likewise glimmered among the gloomy meditations that encompassed Miriam, and lit up the pale, dark beauty of her face, while it responded pleasantly to Donatello's glance. "'I hardly know,' said she, smiling, "'whether you have sprouted out of the earth or fallen from the clouds. In either case you are welcome.' And they walked onward together. Volume One, Chapter Nine of the Marble Faun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Faun by Nathaniel Hawthorne, Volume One, Chapter Nine, The Faun and Nymph. Miriam's sadder mood, it might be, had at first an effect on Donatello's spirits. It checked the joyous ebullition into which they would otherwise have effervesced when he found himself in her society, not as heretofore in the old gloom of Rome, but under that bright soft sky and in those Arcadian woods. He was silent for a while it being indeed seldom donatello's impulse to express himself copiously in words his usual modes of demonstration were by the natural language of gesture the instinctive movement of his agile frame and the unconscious play of his features which within a limited range of thought and emotion would speak volumes in a moment by and by his own mood seemed to brighten Miriam's, and was reflected back upon himself. He began inevitably, as it were, to dance along the wood-path, flinging himself into attitudes of strange comic grace. Often, too, he ran a little way in advance of his companion, and then stood to watch her as she approached along the shadowy and sun-flecked path. With every step she took, he expressed his joy at her nearer and nearer presence by what might be thought an extravagance of gesticulation, but which doubtless was the language of the natural man, though laid aside and forgotten by other men, now that words have been feebly substituted in the place of signs and symbols. He gave Miriam the idea of a being, not precisely man, nor yet a child, but in a high and beautiful sense an animal, a creature in a state of development less than what mankind has attained, yet the more perfect within itself for that very deficiency. This idea filled her mobile imagination with agreeable fantasies, which, after smiling at them herself, she tried to convey to the young man. "'What are you, my friend?' she exclaimed, always keeping in mind his singular resemblance to the fawn of the capital. "'If you are, in good truth, that wild and pleasant creature whose face you wear, pray make me known to your kindred. They will be found hereabouts, if anywhere. Knock at the rough rind of this elex tree, and summon forth the dryad. Ask the water nymph to rise dripping from yonder fountain and exchange a moist pressure of the hand with me. Do not fear that I shall shrink, even if one of your rough cousins, a hairy satyr, 
should come capering on his goat legs out of the haunts of far antiquity and propose to dance with me among these lawns and will not bacchus with whom you consorted so familiarly of old and who loved you so well will he not meet us here and squeeze rich grapes into his cup for you and me donatello smiled he laughed heartily indeed in sympathy with the mirth that gleamed out of miriam's deep dark eyes but he did not seem quite to understand her mirthful talk nor to be disposed to explain what kind of creature he was or to inquire with what divine or poetic kindred his companion feigned to link him he appeared only to know that miriam was beautiful and that she smiled graciously upon him that the present moment was very sweet and himself most happy with the sunshine the sylvan scenery and woman's kindly charm which it enclosed within its small circumference it was delightful to see the trust which he reposed in miriam and his pure joy in her propinquity he asked nothing sought nothing save to be near the beloved object and brimmed over with ecstasy at that simple boon a creature of the happy tribes below us sometimes shows the capacity of this enjoyment a man seldom or never donatello said miriam looking at him thoughtfully but amused yet not without a shade of sorrow you seem very happy what makes you so because i love you answered donatello he made this momentous confession as if it were the most natural thing in the world and on her part such was the contagion of his simplicity miriam heard it without anger or disturbance though with no responding emotion it was as if they had strayed across the limits of arcadia and come under a civil policy where young men might avow their passion with as little restraint as a bird pipes its note to a similar purpose why should you love me foolish boy said she we have no points of sympathy at all there are not two creatures more unlike in this wild world than you and i you are yourself and i am donatello replied he therefore i love you there needs no other reason certainly there was no better or more explicable reason it might have been imagined that donatello's unsophisticated heart would be more readily attracted to a feminine nature of clear simplicity like his own than to one already turbid with grief or wrong as miriam seemed to be perhaps on the other hand his character needed the dark element which it found in her the force and energy of will that sometimes flashed through her eyes may have taken him captive or not improbably the varying lights and shadows of her temper now so mirthful and anon so sad with mysterious gloom had bewitched the youth analyze the matter as we may the reason assigned by donatello himself was as satisfactory as we are likely to attain miriam could not think seriously of the avowal that had passed he held out his love so freely in his open palm that she felt it could be nothing but a toy which she might play with for an instant and give back again and yet donatello's heart was so fresh a fountain that had miriam been more world-worn than she was she might have found it exquisite to slake her thirst with the feelings that welled up and brimmed over from it she was far very far from the dusty medieval epoch when some women have a taste for such refreshment 
even for her however there was an inexpressible charm in the simplicity that prompted donatello's words and deeds though unless she caught them in precisely the true light they seemed but folly the offspring of a maimed and imperfectly developed intellect alternately she almost admired or folly scorned him and knew not which estimate resulted from the deeper appreciation but it could not she decided for herself be other than an innocent pastime if they too sure to be separated by their different paths in life to the morrow were to gather up some of the little pleasure that chanced to grow about their feet like the violets and wood anemones to-day yet an impulse of rectitude impelled miriam to give him what she still held to be a needless warning against an imaginary peril if you were wiser donatello you would think me a dangerous person said she if you follow my footsteps they will lead you to no good you ought to be afraid of me i would as soon think of fearing the air we breathe he replied and well you may for it is full of malaria said miriam she went on hinting at an intangible confession such as persons with overburdened hearts often make to children or dumb animals or to holes in the earth where they think their secrets may be at once revealed and buried those who come too near me are in danger of great mischiefs i do assure you take warning therefore it is a sad fatality that has brought you from your home among the apennines some rusty old castle i suppose with a village at its foot and an arcadian environment of vineyards fig trees and olive orchards a sad mischance i say that has transported you to my side you have had a happy life hitherto have you not donatello oh yes answered the young man and though not of a retrospective turn he made the best effort he could to send his mind back into the past i remember thinking it happiness to dance with the contadinas at the village feast to taste the new sweet wine at vintage time and the old ripened wine which our poder is famous for in the cold winter evenings and to devour great luscious figs and apricots peaches cherries and melons i was often happy in the woods too with hounds and horses and very happy in watching all sorts of creatures and birds that haunt the leafy solitudes but never half so happy as now in these delightful groves she asked here and with you answered donatello just as we are now what a fullness of content in him how silly and how delightful said miriam to herself then addressing him again but donatello how long will this happiness last how long he exclaimed for it perplexed him even more to think of the future than to remember the past why should it have an end how long for ever for ever for ever the child the simpleton said miriam with sudden laughter and checking it as suddenly but is he a simpleton indeed here in those few natural words he has expressed that deep sense that profound conviction of its own immortality which genuine love never fails to bring he perplexes me yes and bewitches me wild gentle beautiful creature that he is it is like playing with a young greyhound 
her eyes filled with tears at the same time that a smile shone out of them then first she became sensible of a delight and grief at once in feeling this zephyr of a new affection with its untainted freshness blow over her weary stifled heart which had no right to be revived by it the very exquisiteness of the enjoyment made her know that it ought to be a forbidden one donatello she hastily exclaimed for your own sake leave me it is not such a happy thing as you imagine it to wander in these woods with me a girl from another land burdened with a doom that she tells to none i might make you dread me perhaps hate me if i choose and i must choose if i find you loving me too well i fear nothing said donatello looking into her unfathomable eyes with perfect trust i love always i speak in vain thought miriam within herself well then for this one hour let me be such as he imagines me to-morrow will be time enough to come back to my reality my reality what is it is the past so indestructible the future so immitigable is the dark dream in which i walk of such solid stony substance that there can be no escape out of its dungeon be it so there is at least that ethereal quality in my spirit that it can make me as gay as donatello himself for this one hour and immediately she brightened up as if an inward flame heretofore stifled were now permitted to fill her with its happy lustre glowing through her cheeks and dancing in her eye-beams donatello brisk and cheerful as he seemed before showed a sensibility to miriam's gladdened mood by breaking into still wilder and ever varying activity he frisked around her bubbling over with joy which clothed itself in words that had little individual meaning and in snatches of song that seemed as natural as bird notes then they both laughed together and heard their own laughter returning in the echoes and laughed again at the response so that the ancient and solemn groove became full of merriment for these two blithe spirits a bird happening to sing cheerily donatello gave a peculiar call and the little feathered creature came fluttering about its head as if it had known him through many summers how close he stands to nature said miriam observing this pleasant familiarity between her companion and the bird he shall make me as natural as himself for this one hour as they strayed through that sweet wilderness she felt more and more the influence of his elastic temperament miriam was an impressible and impulsive creature as unlike herself in different moods as if a melancholy maiden and a glad one were both bound within the girdle about her waist and kept in magic thraldom by the brooch that clasped it naturally it is true she was the more inclined to melancholy yet fully capable of that high frolic of the spirits which richly compensates for many gloomy hours if her soul was apt to lurk in the darkness of a cavern she could sport madly in the sunshine before the cavern's mouth except the freshest mirth of animal spirits like donatello's there is no merriment no wild exhilaration comparable to that of melancholy people escaping from the dark region in which it is their custom to keep themselves imprisoned so the shadowy miriam almost outdid donatello on his own ground 
they ran races with each other side by side with shouts and laughter they pelted one another with early flowers and gathering them up twined them with green leaves into garlands for both their heads they played together like children or creatures of immortal youth so much had they flung aside the sombre habitudes of daily life that they seemed born to be sportive for ever and endowed with eternal mirthfulness instead of any deeper joy it was a glimpse far backward into arcadian life or further still into the golden age before mankind was burdened with sin and sorrow and before pleasure had been darkened with those shadows that bring it into high relief and make it happiness hark cried donatello stopping short as he was about to bind miriam's fair hands with flowers and lead her along in triumph there's music somewhere in the grove it is your kinsman pan most likely said miriam playing on his pipe let us go seek him and make him puff out his rough cheeks and pipe his merriest air come the strain of music will guide us onward like a gaily colored thread of silk or like a chain of flowers responded donatello drawing her along by that which he had twined this way Volume One, Chapter Ten of the Marble Faun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Faun by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume One, Chapter Ten. The Sylvan Dance. As the music came fresher on their ears, they danced to its cadence, extemporizing new steps and attitudes. Each varying movement had a grace which might have been worth putting into marble for the long delight of days to come, but vanished with the movement that gave it birth, and was effaced from memory by another. In Miriam's motion, freely as she flung herself into the frolic of the hour, there was still an artful beauty in donatello's there was a charm of indescribable grotesqueness hand in hand with grace sweet bewitching most provocative of laughter and yet aching to pathos so deeply did it touch the heart this was the ultimate peculiarity the final touch distinguishing between the sylvan creature and the beautiful companion at his side setting apart only this miriam resembled a nymph as much as donatello did a fawn there were fleeting moments indeed when she played the sylvan character as perfectly as he catching glimpses of her then you would have fancied that an oak had sundered its rough bark to let her dance freely forth endowed with the same spirit in her human form as that which rustles in the leaves or that she had emerged through the pebbly bottom of a fountain a water nymph to play and sparkle in the sunshine flinging a quivering light around her and suddenly disappearing in a shower of rainbow drops as the fountain sometimes subsides into its basin so in miriam there was symptoms that the frolic of her spirits would at last tire itself out ah donatello cried she laughing as she stopped to take a breath you have an unfair advantage over me i am no true creature of the woods while you are a real fawn i do believe when your curls shook just now methought i had a peep at the pointed ears Donatello snapped his fingers above his head, as fauns and satyrs taught us first to do, 
and seemed to radiate jollity out of his whole nimble person nevertheless there was a kind of dim apprehension in his face as if he dreaded that a moment's pause might break the spell and snatch away the sportive companion whom he had waited for through so many dreary months dance dance cried he joyously if we take breath we shall be as we were yesterday there now is the music just beyond this clump of trees dance miriam dance they had now reached an open grassy glade of which there are many in that artfully constructed wilderness set round with stone seats on which the aged moss had kindly essayed to spread itself instead of cushions on one of the stone benches sat the musicians whose strains had enticed our wild couple thitherward they proved to be a vagrant band such as rome and all italy abounds with comprising a harp a flute and a violin which though greatly the worse for wear the performers had skill enough to provoke and modulate into tolerable harmony it chanced to be a feast day and instead of playing in the sun-scorched piazzas of the city or beneath the windows of some unresponsive palace they had bethought themselves to try the echoes of these woods for on the festas of the church rome scatters its merrymakers all abroad ripe for the dance or any other pastime as miriam and donatello emerged from among the trees the musician scraped tinkled or blew each according to his various kind of instrument more inspiringly than ever a dark-checked little girl with bright black eyes stood by shaking a tambourine set round with tinkling bells and thumping it on its parchment head without interrupting his brisk though measured movement donatello snatched away this unmelodious contrivance and flourishing it above his head produced music of indescribable potency still dancing with frisky step and striking the tambourine and ringing its little bells all in one jovial act it might be that there was magic in the sound or contagion at least in the spirit which had got possession of miriam and himself for very soon a number of festal people were drawn to the spot and struck into the dance singly or in pairs as if they were all gone mad with jollity among them were some of the plebeian damsels whom we meet bareheaded in the roman streets with silver stilettos thrust through their glossy hair the contadinas too from the campagna and the villages with their rich and picturesque costumes of scarlet and all bright hues such as fairer maidens might not venture to put on then came the modern roman from trastevere perchance with his old cloak drawn about him like a toga which anon as his active motion heated him he flung aside three french soldiers capered freely into the throng in wide scarlet trousers their short swords dangling at their sides and three german artists in grey flaccid hats and flaunting beards and one of the pope's swiss guardsmen in the strange motley garb which michael angelo contrived for them two young english tourists one of them a lord two contadine partners and dashed in as did also a shaggy man in goatskin breeches who looked like rustic pan in person and footed it as merrily as he besides the above there was a herdsman or two from the campagna and a few peasants in sky-blue jackets and small clothes tied with ribbons at the knees haggard and sallow were these last poor serfs having little to eat and nothing but the malaria to breathe but still they plucked up a momentary spirit and joined hands in donatello's dance here as it seemed had the golden age come back again within the precincts of this sunny glade thawing mankind out of their cold formalities 
releasing them from irksome restraint, mingling them together in such childlike gaiety that new flowers, of which the old bosom of the earth is full, sprang up beneath their footsteps. The sole exception to the geniality of the moment, as we have understood, was seen in a countryman of our own, who sneered at the spectacle and declined to compromise his dignity by making part of it. The harper thrummed with rapid fingers. The violin player flashed his bow back and forth across the strings. The flautist poured his breath in quick puffs of jollity, while Donatello shook the tambourine above his head and led the merry throng with unvariable steps. As they followed one another in a wild ring of mirth, it seemed the realization of one of those bas-reliefs where a dance of nymphs, satyrs, or bacchanals is twined around the circle of an antique vase, or it was like the sculpture seen on the front and sides of a sarcophagus, where, as often as any other device, a festive procession mocks the ashes and white bones that are treasured up within you might take it for a marriage pageant but after a while if you look at these merrymakers following them from end to end of the marble coffin you doubt whether their gay movements is leading them to a happy close a youth has suddenly fallen in the dance a chariot is overturned and broken flinging the charioteer headlong to the ground a maiden seems to have grown faint or weary and is drooping on the bosom of a friend always some tragic incident is shadowed forth or thrust sidelong into the spectacle and when once it has caught your eye you can look no more at the festal portions of the scene except with reference to this one slightly suggested doom and sorrow as in its mirth, so in the darker characteristic here alluded to, there was an analogy between the sculptured scene on the sarcophagus and the wild dance which we have been describing. In the midst of its madness and riot, Miriam found herself suddenly confronted by a strange figure that shook its fantastic garments in the air and pranced before her on its tiptoes, almost vying with the agility of donatello himself it was the model a moment afterwards donatello was aware that she had retired from the dance he hastened towards her and flung himself on the grass beside the stone bench on which miriam was sitting but a strange distance of unapproachableness had all at once enveloped her and though he saw her within reach of his arm, yet the light of her eyes seemed as far off as that of a star. Nor was there any warmth in the melancholy smile with which she regarded him. "'Come back!' cried he. "'Why should this happy hour end so soon?' "'It must end here, Donatello,' said she in answer to his words and outstretched hand and such hours i believe do not often repeat themselves in a lifetime let me go my friend let me vanish from you quietly among the shadows of these trees see the companions of our pastime are vanishing already whether it was that the harp strings were broken the violin out of tune or the flautist out of breath so it chanced that the music had ceased and the dancers come abruptly to a pause all that motley throng of rioters was dissolved as suddenly as it had been drawn together in miriam's remembrance the scene had a character of fantasy it was as if a company of satyrs fauns and nymphs with pan in the midst of them had been disporting themselves in these venerable woods only a moment ago and now in another moment because some profane eyes had looked at them too closely or some intruder had cast a shadow on their mirth the sylvan pageant had utterly disappeared if a few of the merrymakers lingered among the trees 
they had hidden their racy peculiarities under the garb and aspect of ordinary people and sheltered themselves in the weary commonplace of daily life just an instant before it was arcadia and the golden age the spell being broken it was now only that old tract of pleasure ground close by the people's gate of rome a tract where the crimes and calamities of ages the many battles blood recklessly poured out and deaths of myriads have corrupted all the soil creating an influence that makes the air deadly to human lungs you must leave me said miriam to donatello more imperatively than before have i not said it go and look not behind you miriam whispered donatello grasping her hand forcibly who is it that stands in the shadow yonder beckoning you to follow him hush leave me repeated miriam your hour is past his hour has come donatello still gazed in the direction which he had indicated and the expression of his face was fearfully changed being so disordered perhaps with terror at all events with anger and invincible repugnance that miriam hardly knew him his lips were drawn apart so as to disclose his set teeth thus giving him a look of animal rage which we seldom see except in persons of the simplest and rudest natures a shudder seemed to pass through his very bones i hate him muttered he be satisfied i hate him too said miriam she had not thought of making this avowal but was irresistibly drawn to it by the sympathy of the dark emotion in her own breast with that so strongly expressed by donatello two drops of water or of blood do not more naturally flow into each other than did her hatred into his shall i clutch him by the throat whispered donatello with a savage scowl bid me do so and we are rid of him for ever in heaven's name no violence exclaimed miriam affrighted out of the scornful control which she had hitherto held over her companion by the fierceness that he so suddenly developed oh have pity on me donatello if for nothing else yet because in the midst of my wretchedness i let myself be your playmate for this one wild hour follow me no farther henceforth leave me to my doom dear friend kind simple loving friend make me not more wretched by the remembrance of having thrown fierce hates or loves into the wellspring of your happy life not follow you repeated donatello soothed from anger into sorrow less by the purport of what she said than by the melancholy sweetness of her voice not follow you what other path have i we will talk of it once again said miriam still soothingly soon to-morrow when you will only Volume 1, Chapter 11 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 1, Chapter 11. Fragmentary Sentences in the borghese grove so recently uproarious with merriment and music here remained only miriam and her strange follower a solitude had suddenly spread itself around them 
It perhaps symbolized a peculiar character in the relation of these two, insulating them and building up an insuperable barrier between their life streams and other currents, which might seem to flow in close vicinity. For it is one of the chief earthly incommodities of some species of misfortune, or of a great crime, that it makes the actor in the one or the sufferer of the other an alien in the world by interposing a wholly unsympathetic medium betwixt himself and those whom he yearns to meet. Owing, it may be, to this moral estrangement, this chill remoteness of their position, there have come to us but a few vague whisperings of what passed in Miriam's interview that afternoon with the sinister personage who had dogged her footsteps ever since the visit to the catacomb. In weaving these mystic utterances into a continuous scene, we undertake a task resembling in its perplexity that of gathering up and piecing together the fragments or a letter which has been torn and scattered to the winds. Many words of deep significance, many entire sentences, and those possibly the most important ones, have flown too far on the winged breeze to be recovered. If we insert our own conjectural amendments, we perhaps give a purport utterly at variance with a true one. Yet, unless we attempt something in this way, there must remain an unsightly gap and a lack of continuousness and dependence in our narrative so that it would arrive at certain inevitable catastrophes without due warning of their imminence. Of so much we are sure that there seemed to be a sadly mysterious fascination in the influence of this ill-omened person over Miriam. It was such as beasts and reptiles of subtle and evil nature sometimes exercise upon their victims. Marvellous it was to see the hopelessness with which, being naturally of so courageous a spirit, she resigned herself to the thraldom in which she held her. That iron chain of which some of the massive links were round her feminine waist, and the others in his ruthless hand, or which perhaps bound the pair together by a bond equally torturing to each must have been forged in some such unhallowed furnace as is only kindled by evil passions and fed by evil deeds yet let us trust there may have been no crime in miriam but only one of those fatalities which are among the most insoluble riddles propounded to mortal comprehension the fatal decree by which every crime is made to be the agony of many innocent persons as well of the single guilty one. It was, at any rate, but a feeble and despairing kind of remonstrance, which she had now the energy to oppose against his persecution. "'You follow me too closely,' she said in low, faltering accents. "'You allow me too scanty room to draw my breath. Do you know what will be the end of this?' i know well what must be the end he replied tell me then said miriam that i may compare your foreboding with my own mine is a very dark one there can be but one result and that soon answered the model you must throw off your present mask and assume another you must vanish out of the scene quit rome with me and leave no trace whereby to follow you it is in my power as you well know to compel your acquiescence in my bidding you are aware of the penalty of a refusal not that penalty with which you would terrify me said miriam another there may be but not so grievous what is that other he inquired death simply death she answered 
death said her persecutor is not so simple and opportune a thing as you imagine you are strong and warm with life sensitive and irritable as your spirit is these many months of trouble this latter thraldom in which i hold you have scarcely made your cheek paler than i saw it in your girlhood miriam for i forbear to speak another name at which these leaves would shiver above our heads miriam you cannot die might not a dagger find my heart said she for the first time meeting his eyes would not poison make an end of me will not the tiber drown me it might he answered for i allow that you are mortal but miriam believe me it is not your fate to die while there remains so much to be sinned and suffered in the world we have a destiny which we must needs fulfill together i too have struggled to escape it i was as anxious as yourself to break the tie between us to bury the past in a fathomless grave to make it impossible that we should ever meet until you confront me at the bar of judgment you little can imagine what steps i took to render all this secure and what was the result our strange interview in the bowels of the earth convinced me of the futility of my design ah fatal chance cried miriam covering her face with her hands yes your heart trembled with horror when you recognized me rejoined he but you did not guess that there was an equal horror in my own why would not the weight of earth above our heads have crumbled down upon us both forcing us apart but bearing us equally cried miriam in a burst of vehement passion oh that we could have wandered in those dismal passages till we both perished taking opposite paths in the darkness so that when we lay down to die our last breath might not mingle it were vain to wish it said the model in all that labyrinth of midnight past we should have found one another out to live or die together our fates cross and are entangled the threads are twisted into a strong cord which is dragging us to an evil doom could the knots be severed we might escape but neither can your slender fingers untie these knots nor my masculine force break them we must submit pray for rescue as i have exclaimed miriam pray for deliverance from me since i am your evil genius as you mine dark as your life has been i have known you to pray in times past at these words of miriam a tremor and horror appeared to seize upon her persecutor insomuch that he shook and grew a shy pale before her eyes in this man's memory there was something that made it awful for him to think of prayer nor would any torture be more intolerable than to be reminded of such divine comfort and succour as await pious souls merely for the asking this torment was perhaps the token of a native temperament deeply susceptible of religious impressions but which had been wronged violated and debased until at length it was capable only of terror from the sources that were intended for our purest and loftiest consolation he looked so fearfully at her and with such intense pain struggling in his eyes that miriam felt pity 
and now all at once it struck her that he might be mad it was an idea that had never before seriously occurred to her mind although as soon as suggested it fitted marvellously into many circumstances that lay within her knowledge but alas such was her evil fortune that whether mad or no his power over her remained the same and was likely to be used only the more tyrannously if exercised by a lunatic i would not give you pain she said soothingly your faith allows you the consolations of penance and absolution try what help there may be in these and leave me to myself do not think it miriam said he we are bound together and can never part again why should it seem so impossible she rejoined think how i had escaped from all the past i had made for myself a new sphere and found new friends new occupations new hopes and enjoyments my heart methinks was almost as unburdened as if there had been no miserable life behind me the human spirit does not perish of a single wound nor exhaust itself in a single trial of life let us but keep asunder and all may go well for both we fancied ourselves forever sundered he replied yet we met once in the bowels of the earth and were we to part now our fates would fling us together again in a desert on a mountain top or in whatever spot seemed safest you speak in vain therefore you mistake your own will for an iron necessity said miriam otherwise you might have suffered me to glide past you like a ghost when we met among those ghosts of ancient days even now you might bid me pass as freely never said he with unmitigable will your reappearance has destroyed the work of years you know the power that i have over you obey my bidding or within a short time it shall be exercised nor will i cease to haunt you till the moment comes then said miriam more calmly i foresee the end and have already warned you of it it will be death your own death miriam or mine he asked looking fixedly at her do you imagine me a murderess said she shuddering you at least have no right to think me so yet rejoined he with a glance of dark meaning men have said that this white hand had once a crimson stain he took her hand as he spoke and held it in his own in spite of the repugnance amounting to nothing short of agony with which she struggled to regain it holding it up to the fading light for there was already dimness among the trees he appeared to examine it closely as if to discover the imaginary blood stain with which he taunted her he smiled as he let it go it looks very white said he but i have known hands as white which all the water in the ocean would not have washed clean it had no stain retorted miriam bitterly until you grasped it in your own the wind has blown away whatever else they may have spoken they went together towards the town and on their way continued to make reference no doubt to some strange and dreadful history of their former life belonging equally to this dark man and to the fair and youthful woman whom he persecuted in their words or in the breath that uttered them there seemed to be an odour of guilt 
and a scent of blood yet how can we imagine that a stain of insanguine crime should attach to miriam or how on the other hand should spotless innocence be subjected to a thraldom like that which she endured from the spectre whom she herself had evoked out of the darkness be this as it might miriam we have reason to believe still continued to beseech him humbly passionately wildly only to go his way and leave her free to follow her own sad path thus they strayed onward through the green wilderness of the borghese grounds and soon came near the city wall where had miriam raised her eyes she might have seen hilda and the sculptor leaning on the parapet but she walked in a mist of trouble and could distinguish little beyond its limits as they came within public observation her persecutor fell behind throwing off the imperious manner which he had assumed during their solitary interview the porta del popolo swarmed with life the merrymakers who had spent the feast day outside the walls were now thronging in a party of horsemen were entering beneath the arch a travelling carriage had been drawn up just within the verge and was passing through the villainous ordeal of the papal custom-house in the broad piazza too there was a motley crowd but the stream of miriam's trouble kept its way through this flood of human life and neither mingled with it nor was turned aside with a sad kind of feminine ingenuity she found a way to kneel before her tyrant undetected though in full sight of all the people still beseeching him for freedom Volume One, Chapter Twelve of *The Marble Faun*. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. *The Marble Faun* by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume One, Chapter Twelve. A Stroll on the Pincian. Hilda, after giving the last touches to the picture of Beatrice Cenci, had flown down from her dovecot late in the afternoon, and gone to the Pincian Hill, in the hope of hearing a strain or two of exhilarating music. There, as it happened, she met the sculptor, for, to say the truth, Kenyon had well noted the fair artist's ordinary way of life and was accustomed to shape his own movements so as to bring him often within her sphere. The Pincian Hill is the favorite promenade of the Roman aristocracy. At the present day, however, like most other Roman possessions, it belongs less to the native inhabitants than to the barbarians from Gaul, Great Britain, and beyond the sea, who have established a peaceful usurpation over whatever is enjoyable or memorable in the eternal city. These foreign guests are indeed ungrateful if they do not breathe a prayer for Pope Clement, or whatever Holy Father it may have been, who leveled the summit of the mount so skilfully, and bounded it with the parapet of the city wall, who laid out those broad walks and drives, and overhung them with the deepening shade of many kinds of tree, who scattered the flowers of all seasons and of every clime abundantly over those green central lawns, who scooped out hollows in fit places, and, setting great basins of marble in them, caused ever-gushing fountains to fill them to the brim, who reared up the immemorial obelisk out of the soil that had long hidden it, who placed pedestals along the borders of the avenues, and crowned them with busts of that multitude of worthies, statesmen, heroes, artists, 
men of letters, and of song, whom the whole world claims as its chief ornaments, though Italy produced them all. In a word, the Pincian Garden is one of the things that reconcile the stranger, since he fully appreciates the enjoyment and feels nothing of the cost, to the rule of an irresponsible dynasty of holy fathers, who seem to have aimed at making life as agreeable an affair as it can well be. In this pleasant spot the red-trousered French soldiers are always to be seen, bearded and grizzled veterans, perhaps with medals of Algiers or the Crimea on their breasts. To them is assigned the peaceful duty of seeing that children do not trample on the flower-beds, nor any youthful lover rifle them of their fragrant blossoms to stick in the beloved one's hair. Here sits, drooping upon some marble bench in the treacherous sunshine, the consumptive girl whose friends have brought her for cure to a climate that instills poison into its very purest breath. Here all day come nursery maids, burdened with rosy English babies, or guiding the footsteps of little travellers from the far western world. Here, in the sunny afternoons, roll and rumble all kinds of equipages, from the cardinal's old-fashioned and gorgeous purple carriage to the gay barouche of modern date. Here horsemen gallop on thoroughbred steeds, here, in short, all the transitory population of Rome, the world's great watering-place, rides, drives, or promenades. Here are beautiful sunsets, and here, whichever way you turn your eyes, are scenes as well worth gazing at, both in themselves and for their historic interest, as any that the sun ever rose and set upon. Here, too, on certain afternoons of the week, a French military band flings out rich music over the poor old city, floating her with strains as loud as those of her own equalist triumphs. Hilda and the sculptor, by the contrivance of the latter, who loved best to be alone with his young countrywoman, had wandered beyond the throng of promenaders, whom they left in a dense cluster around the music. They strayed indeed to the farthest point of the Pincian Hill, and leaned over the parapet, looking down upon the Muro Torto, a massive fragment of the oldest Roman wall, which juts over as if ready to tumble down by its own weight, yet seems still the most indestructible piece of work that men's hands ever piled together. In the blue distance rose Soracte, and other heights, which have gleamed far to our imaginations, but look scarcely real to our bodily eyes, because, being dreamt about so much, they have taken the aerial tints which belong only to a dream. These, nevertheless, are the solid framework of hills that shut in Rome, and its wide surrounding Campania. No land of dreams, but the broadest page of history, crowded so full with memorable events, that one obliterates another, as if time had crossed and recrossed his own records till they grew illegible. But not to meddle with history, with which our narrative is no otherwise concerned, than that the very dust of Rome is historic and inevitably settles on our page and mingles with our ink, we will return to our two friends, who were still leaning over the wall. Beneath them lay the broad sweep of the Borghese grounds, covered with trees amid which appeared the white gleam of pillars and statues, and the flash of an upspringing fountain, all to be overshadowed at a later period of the year, by the thicker growth of foliage. The advance of vegetation in this softer climate is less abrupt than the inhabitant of the cold north is accustomed to observe. 
Beginning earlier, even in February, spring is not compelled to burst into summer with such headlong haste. There is time to dwell upon each opening beauty, and to enjoy the budding leaf, the tender green, the sweet youth and freshness of the year. It gives us its maiden charm before settling into the married summer, which again does not so soon sober itself into matronly autumn. In our own country the virgin spring hastens to its bridal too abruptly, but here, after a month or two of kindly growth, the leaves of the young trees which cover that portion of the Borghese grounds nearest the city wall were still in their tender half-development. In the remote depths among the old groves of ilex trees, Hilda and Kenyon heard the faint sound of music, laughter, and mingling voices. It was probably the uproar, spreading even so far as the walls of Rome, and growing faded and melancholy in its passage, of that wild sylvan merriment, which we have already attempted to describe. By and by it ceased, although the two listeners still tried to distinguish it between the bursts of nearer music from the military band but there was no renewal of that distant mirth. Soon afterwards they saw a solitary figure advancing along one of the paths that led from the obscurer part of the ground towards the gateway. "'Look, is it not Donatello?' said Hilda. "'He it is, beyond a doubt,' replied the sculptor. "'But how gravely he walks, and with what long looks behind him!' He seems either very weary or very sad. I should not hesitate to call it sadness if Donatello were a creature capable of the sin and folly of low spirits. In all these hundred paces, while we have been watching him, he has not made one of those little caprioles in the air which are characteristic of his natural gait. I begin to doubt whether he is a veritable fawn. Then, said Hilda, with perfect simplicity, you have thought him, and do think him, one of that strange, wild, happy race of creatures that used to laugh and sport in the woods, in the old, old times? So do I, indeed, but I never quite believed till now that fawns existed anywhere but in poetry. The sculptor at first merely smiled. Then, as the idea took further possession of his mind, he laughed outright and wished from the bottom of his heart, being in love with Hilda, though he had never told her so, that he could have rewarded or punished her for its pretty absurdity with a kiss. Oh, Hilda, what a treasure of sweet faith and pure imagination you hide under that little straw hat! cried he at length. A fawn, a fawn, great Pan is not dead then after all. The whole tribe of mythical creatures yet live in the moonlit seclusion of a young girl's fancy, and find it a lovelier abode and play-place. I doubt not than their Arcadian haunts of yore. What bliss if a man of marble like myself could stray thither too! "'Why do you laugh so?' asked Hilda, reddening, for she was a little disturbed at Kenyon's ridicule, however kindly expressed. "'What can I have said that you think so very foolish?' "'Well, not foolish, then,' rejoined the sculptor. "'But wiser, it may be, than I can fathom. Really, however, the idea does strike one as delightfully fresh, when we consider Donatello's position and external environment. Why, my dear Hilda, he is a Tuscan-born, of an old noble race in that part of Italy, and he has a moss-grown tower among the Apennines, where he and his forefathers have dwelt, under their own vines and fig-trees, from an unknown antiquity. His boyish passion for Miriam has introduced him familiarly to our little circle, 
and our republican and artistic simplicity of intercourse has included this young Italian on the same terms as one of ourselves. But if we pay due respect to rank and title, we should bend reverentially to Donatello and salute him as his excellency, the Count di Montebene. That is a droll idea, much droller than his being a fawn, said Hilda, laughing in her turn. This does not quite satisfy me, however, especially as you yourself recognized and acknowledged his wonderful resemblance to the statue. Except as regards the pointed ears, said Kenyon, adding aside and one other little peculiarity, generally observable in the statues of fauns. As for his excellency, the Count de Montebene's ears, replied Hilda, smiling again at the dignity with which this title invested their playful friend. You know, we could never see their shape on account of his clustering curls. Nay, I remember he once started back as shyly as a wild deer, when Miriam made a pretense of examining them. How do you explain that? Oh, I certainly shall not contend against such a weight of evidence, the fact of his fawnship being otherwise so probable, answered the sculptor, still hardly retaining his gravity. Fawn or not, Donatello or the Count di Montebene, is a singularly wild creature and, as I have remarked on other occasions, though very gentle, does not love to be touched. Speaking in no harsh sense, there is a great deal of animal nature in him, as if he had been born in the woods and had run wild all his childhood, and were as yet but imperfectly domesticated. Life, even in our day, is very simple and unsophisticated in some of the shaggy nooks of the Apennines. It annoys me very much, said Hilda, this inclination which most people have to explain away the wonder and the mystery out of everything. Why could not you allow me, and yourself too, the satisfaction of thinking him a fawn? "'Pray keep your belief, dear Hilda, if it makes you any happier,' said the sculptor, "'and I shall do my best to become a convert. "'Donatello has asked me to spend the summer with him in his ancestral tower, "'where I purpose investigating the pedigree of these sylvan counts, his forefathers, "'and if their shadows beckon me into dreamland, I shall willingly follow.' By the by, speaking of Donatello, there is a point on which I should like to be enlightened. Can I help you, then? said Hilda, in answer to his look. Is there the slightest chance of his winning Miriam's affections? suggested Kenyon. Miriam, she is so accomplished and gifted, exclaimed Hilda, and he a rude, uncultivated boy. No, no, no! It would seem impossible, said the sculptor, but on the other hand, a gifted woman flings away her affection so unaccountably sometimes. Miriam of late has been very morbid and miserable, as we both know. Young as she is, the morning light seems already to have faded out of her life, and now comes Donatello, with natural sunshine enough for himself and her and offers her the opportunity of making her heart and life all new and cheery again. People of high intellectual endowments do not require similar ones in those they love. They are just the persons to appreciate the wholesome gush of natural feeling, the honest affection, the simple joy, the fullness of contentment with what he loves, which Miriam sees in Donatello. True, she may call him a simpleton. It is a necessity of the case, for a man loses the capacity for this kind of affection in proportion as he cultivates and refines himself. Dear me, said Hilda, drawing him perceptibly away from her companion, is this the penalty of refinement? 
Pardon me, I do not believe it. It is because you are a sculptor that you think nothing can be finely wrought except it be cold and hard, like the marble in which your ideas take shape. I am a painter, and know that the most delicate beauty may be softened and warmed throughout. I said a foolish thing indeed, answered the sculptor. It surprises me, for I might have drawn a wiser knowledge out of my own experience. It is the surest test of genuine love that it brings back our early simplicity to the worldliest of us. Thus talking, they loitered slowly along beside the parapet, which borders the level summit of the Pincian with its irregular sweep. At intervals they looked through the lattice-work of their thoughts, at the varied prospects that lay before and beneath them. From the terrace where they now stood, there is an abrupt descent towards the Piazza del Popolo, and looking down into its broad space, they beheld the tall palatial edifices, the church domes, and the ornamented gateway, which grew and were consolidated out of the thought of Michael Angelo. They saw, too, the red granite obelisk, oldest of things, even in Rome, which rises in the centre of the piazza, with a fourfold fountain at its base. All Roman works and ruins, whether of the empire, the far-off republic, or the still more distant kings, assume a transient, visionary, and impalpable character, when we think that this indestructible monument supplied one of the recollections which Moses and the Israelites bore from Egypt into the desert. Perchance, on beholding the cloudy pillar and the fiery column, they whispered awe-stricken to one another. In its shape it is like that old obelisk which we and our fathers have so often seen on the borders of the Nile. And now that very obelisk, with hardly any trace of decay upon it, is the first thing that the modern traveller sees after entering the Flaminian Gate. Lifting their eyes, Hilda and her companion gazed westward, and saw beyond the invisible Tiber, the castle of St. Angelo, that immense tomb of a pagan emperor, with the archangel at its summit. Still farther off appeared a mighty pile of buildings, surmounted by the vast dome, which all of us have shaped and swelled outward, like a huge bubble, to the outmost scope of our imaginations, long before we see it floating over the worship of the city. It may be most worthily seen from precisely the point where our two friends were now standing. At any nearer view the grandeur of St. Peter's hides itself behind the immensity of its separate parts, so that we see only the front, only the sides, only the pillared length and loftiness of the portico, and not the mighty whole. But at this distance the entire outline of the world's cathedral, as well as that of the palace of the world's chief priest, is taken in at once. In such remoteness, moreover, the imagination is not debarred from lending its assistance, even while we have the reality before our eyes, and helping the weakness of human sense to do justice to so grand an object. It requires both faith and fancy to enable us to feel what is nevertheless so true, that yonder, in front of the purple outline of hills, is the grandest edifice ever built by man, painted against God's loveliest sky. After contemplating a little while a scene which their long residence in Rome had made familiar to them, Kenyon and Hilda again let their glances fall into the piazza at their feet. They there beheld Miriam, who had just entered the Porta del Popolo, and was standing by the obelisk and fountain. 
with a gesture that impressed Kenyon as at once suppliant and imperious, she seemed to intimate to a figure which had attended her thus far that it was now her desire to be left alone. The pertinacious model, however, remained immovable. And the sculptor here noted a circumstance, which, according to the interpretation he might put upon it, was either too trivial to be mentioned, or else so mysteriously significant, that he found it difficult to believe his eyes. Miriam knelt down on the steps of the fountain. So far there could be no question of the fact. To other observers, if any there were, she probably appeared to take this attitude merely for the convenience of dipping her fingers into the gush of water from the mouth of one of the stone lions. But as she clasped her hands together after thus bathing them, and glanced upward at the model, an idea took strong possession of Kenyon's mind, that Miriam was kneeling to this dark follower there in the world's face. "'Do you see it?' he said to Hilda. "'See what?' asked she, surprised at the emotion of his tone. "'I see Miriam, who has just bathed her hands in that delightfully cool water. I often dip my fingers into a Roman fountain, and think of the brook that used to be one of my playmates in my New England village.' "'I fancied I saw something else,' said Kenyon, "'but it was doubtless a mistake.' But allowing that he had caught a true glimpse into the hidden significance of Miriam's gesture, what a terrible thraldom did it suggest! Free as she seemed to be, beggar as he looked, the nameless vagrant must then be dragging the beautiful Miriam through the streets of Rome fettered and shackled more cruelly than any captive queen of yore following in an emperor's triumph and was it conceivable that she would have been thus enthralled unless some great error how great kenyon dared not think or some fatal weakness had given this dark adversary a vantage ground hilda he said abruptly who and what is miriam "'Pardon me, but are you sure of her?' "'Sure of her?' repeated Hilda, with an angry blush for her friend's sake. "'I'm sure that she is kind, good, and generous, a true and faithful friend, whom I love dearly, and who loves me as well. What more than this need I be sure of?' "'And your delicate instincts say all this in her favour? Nothing against her?' continued the sculptor without heeding the irritation of Hilda's tone. These are my own impressions, too, but she is such a mystery. We do not even know whether she is a countrywoman of ours, or an Englishwoman, or a German. There is Anglo-Saxon blood in her veins, one would say, and a right English accent on her tongue, but much that is not English breeding, nor American. Nowhere else but in Rome, and as an artist, could she hold a place in society without giving some clue to her past life. I love her dearly, said Hilda, still with displeasure in her tone, and trust her most entirely. My heart trusts her at least, whatever my head may do, replied Kenyon and Rome is not like one of our New England villages, where we need the permission of each individual neighbor for every act that we do, every word that we utter, and every friend that we make or keep. In these particulars the papal despotism allows us freer breath than our native air, and if we like to take generous views of our associates, we can do so, to a reasonable extent, without ruining ourselves. The music has ceased, said Hilda. I am going now. There are three streets that, beginning close beside each other, diverge from the Piazza del Popolo towards the heart of Rome. On the left the Via del Babuino, on the right the Via della Ripetta, 
and between these two the world-famous avenue the Corso. It appeared that Miriam and her strange companion were passing up the first mentioned of these three, and were soon hidden from Hilda and the sculptor. The two latter left the Pincian by the broad and stately walk that skirts along its brow. Beneath them, from the base of the abrupt descent, the city spread wide away in a close contiguity of red earthen roofs, above which rose eminent the domes of a hundred churches, beside here and there a tower, and the upper windows of some taller or higher situated palace, looking down on a multitude of palatial abodes. At a distance, ascending out of the central mass of edifices, they could see the top of the Antonine Column, and near it the circular roof of the Pantheon, looking heavenward with its ever-open eye. Except these two objects, almost everything that they beheld was medieval, though built, indeed, of the massive old stones and indestructible bricks of imperial Rome, for the ruins of the Colosseum, the golden house and innumerable temples of Roman gods and mansions of Caesars and senators had supplied the material for all those gigantic hovels, and their walls were cemented with mortar of inestimable cost, being made of precious antique statues burnt long ago for this petty purpose. Rome, as it now exists, has grown up under the popes, and seems like nothing but a heap of broken rubbish, thrown into the great chasm between our own days and the empire, merely to fill it up, and for the better part of two thousand years, its annals of obscure policies and wars, and continually recurring misfortunes, seem also but broken rubbish, as compared with its classic history. If we consider the present city as at all connected with the famous one of old, it is only because we find it built over its grave. A depth of thirty feet of soil has covered up the Rome of ancient days, so that it lies like the dead corpse of a giant, decaying for centuries, with no survivor mighty enough even to bury it until the dust of all those years has gathered slowly over its recumbent form and made a casual sepulchre. We know not how to characterize in any accordant and compatible terms the Rome that lies before us, its sunless alleys and streets of palaces, its churches lined with the gorgeous marbles that were originally polished for the adornment of pagan temples, its thousands of evil smells, mixed up with fragrance of rich incense, diffused from as many censers, its little life deriving feeble nutriment from what has long been dead. Everywhere some fragment of ruin suggesting the magnificence of a former epoch, everywhere, moreover, a cross, and nastiness at the foot of it. As the sum of all, there are recollections that kindle the soul, and a gloom and languor that depress it beyond any depth of melancholic sentiment that can be elsewhere known. Yet how is it possible to say an unkind or irreverential word of Rome, the city of all time, and of all the world, the spot for which man's great life and deeds have done so much, and for which decay has done whatever glory and dominion could not do. At this moment the evening sunshine is flinging its golden mantle over it, making all that we thought mean magnificent, the bells of all the churches suddenly ring out, as if it were a peal of triumph because Rome is still imperial. I sometimes fancy, said Hilda, on whose susceptibility the scene always made a strong impression, that Rome, mere Rome, will crowd everything else out of my heart. 
"'Heaven forbid!' ejaculated the sculptor. They had now reached the grand stairs that ascend from the Piazza di Spagna to the hither brow of the Pincian Hill. Old Beppo, the millionaire of his ragged fraternity, it is a wonder that no artist paints him as the cripple whom St. Peter heals at the beautiful gate of the temple, was just mounting his donkey to depart laden with the rich spoil of the day's beggary. Up the stairs, drawing his tattered cloak about his face, came the model, at whom Beppo looked askance, jealous of an encroacher of his rightful domain. The figure passed away, however, up the Via Sistina. In the piazza below, near the foot of the magnificent steps, stood Miriam, with her eyes bent on the ground as if she were counting those little, square, uncomfortable paving-stones that make it a penitential pilgrimage to walk in Rome. She kept this attitude for several minutes, and when, at last, the importunities of a beggar disturbed her from it, she seemed bewildered and pressed her hand upon her brow. "'She has been in some sad dream or other, poor thing,' said Kenyon sympathizingly. And even now she is imprisoned there in a kind of cage, the iron bars of which are made of her own thoughts. I fear she is not well, said Hilda. I am going down the stairs and will join Miriam. Farewell, then, said the sculptor. Dear Hilda, this is a perplexed and troubled world. It soothes me inexpressibly to think of you in your tower with white doves and white thoughts for your companions, so high above us all, and with a virgin for your household friend. You know not how far it throws its light, that lamp which you keep burning at her shrine. I passed beneath the tower last night, and the ray cheered me, because you lighted it. It has for me a religious significance replied Hilda quietly, and yet I am no Catholic. They parted, and Kenyon made haste along the Via Sistina, in the hope of overtaking the model whose haunts and character he was anxious to investigate, for Miriam's sake. He fancied that he saw him a long way in advance, but before he reached the fountain of the Triton, the dusky figure had vanished. End of chapter 12 of Volume 1, Chapter 13 of The Marble Fawn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 1, Chapter 13 A Sculptor's Studio About this period, Miriam seems to have been goaded by a weary restlessness that drove her abroad on any errand or none. She went one morning to visit Kenyon in his studio, whither he had invited her to see a new statue, on which he had staked many hopes, and which was now almost completed in the clay. Next to Hilda, the person for whom Miriam felt most affection and confidence, was Kenyon, and in all the difficulties that beset her life, it was her impulse to draw near Hilda for feminine sympathy and the sculptor for brotherly counsel. Yet it was to little purpose that she approached the edge of the voiceless gulf between herself and them. Standing on the outmost verge of that dark chasm, she might stretch out her hand and never clasp a hand of theirs. She might strive to call out, Help, friends, help! But as with dreamers, when they shout, her voice would perish inaudibly in the remoteness that seemed such a little way. 
this perception of an infinite shivering solitude amid which we cannot come close enough to human beings to be worn by them and where they turn to cold chilly shapes of mist is one of the most forlorn results of any accident misfortune crime or peculiarity of character that puts an individual ajar with the world very often as in miriam's case there is an insatiable instinct that demands friendship love and intimate communion but is forced to pine in empty forms a hunger of the heart which finds only shadows to feed upon Kenyon's studio was in a cross street or rather an ugly and dirty little lane between the corso and the via della ripetta and though chill narrow gloomy and bordered with tall and shabby structures the lane was not a whit more disagreeable than nine-tenths of the roman streets over the door of one of the houses was a marble tablet bearing an inscription to the purport that the sculpture rooms within had formerly been occupied by the illustrious artist canova in these precincts which canova's genius was not quite of a character to render sacred though it certainly made them interesting the young american sculptor had now established himself the studio of a sculptor is generally but a rough and dreary-looking place, with a good deal the aspect, indeed, of a stonemason's workshop. Bare floors of brick or plank and plastered walls, an old chair or two, or perhaps only a block of marble, containing, however, the possibility of ideal grace within it to sit down upon some hastily scrawled sketches of nude figures on the whitewash of the wall these last are probably the sculptor's earliest glimpses of ideas that may hereafter be solidified into imperishable stone or perhaps may remain as impalpable as a dream next there are a few very roughly modelled little figures in clay or plaster exhibiting the second stage of the idea as it advances towards a marble immortality and then is seen the exquisitely designed shape of clay more interesting than even the final marble as being the intimate production of the sculptor himself moulded throughout with his loving hands and nearest to his imagination and heart in the plaster cast from this clay model the beauty of the statue strangely disappears to shine forth again with pure white radiance in the precious marble of carrara works in all these stages of advancement and some with the final touch upon them might be found in kenyon's studio here might be witnessed the process of actually chiselling the marble with which as it is not quite satisfactory to think a sculptor in these days has very little to do in italy there is a class of men whose merely mechanical skill is perhaps more exquisite than was possessed by the ancient artificers who wrought out the designs of praxiteles or very possibly by praxiteles himself whatever of elusive representation can be effected in marble they are capable of achieving if the object be before their eyes the sculptor has but to present these men with a plaster cast of his design and a sufficient block of marble and tell them that the figure is embedded in the stone and must be freed from its encumbering superfluities and in due time without the necessity of his touching the work with his own finger he will see before him the statue that is to make him renowned his creative power has wrought it with a word 
In no other art, surely, does genius find such effective instruments, and so happily relieve itself of the drudgery of actual performance, doing wonderfully nice things by the hands of other people, when it may be suspected they could not always be done by the sculptor's own. And how much of the admiration which our artists get for their buttons and buttonholes, their shoe-ties, their neckcloths, and these, at our present epoch of taste, make a large share of the renown, would be abated if we were generally aware that the sculptor can claim no credit for such pretty performances as immortalized in marble. They are not his work but that of some nameless machine in human shape. Miriam stopped an instant in the antechamber to look at a half-finished bust, the features of which seemed to be struggling out of the stone, and, as it were, scattering and dissolving its hard substance by the glow of feeling and intelligence. As the skilful workman gave stroke after stroke of the chisel with apparent carelessness, but sure effect it was impossible not to think that the outer marble was merely an extraneous environment the human countenance within its embrace must have existed there since the limestone ledges of carrara were first made another bust was nearly completed though still one of kenyon's most trustworthy assistants was at work giving delicate touches shaving off an impalpable something, and leaving little heaps of marble dust to attest it. As these busts in the block of marble, thought Miriam, so does our individual fate exist in the limestone of time. We fancy that we carve it out, but its ultimate shape is prior to all our action. Kenyon was in the inner room, but hearing a step in the antechamber, he threw a veil over what he was at work upon, and came out to receive his visitor. He was dressed in a grey blouse, with a little cap on the top of his head, a costume which became him better than the formal garments which he wore whenever he passed out of his own domains. The sculptor had a face which, when time had done a little more for it, would offer a worthy subject for as good an artist as himself, features finely cut, as if already marble, an ideal forehead, deeply set eyes, and a mouth much hidden in a light brown beard, but apparently sensitive and delicate. "'I will not offer you my hand,' said he. It is grimy with Cleopatra's clay. No, I will not touch clay. It is earthy and human, answered Miriam. I have come to try whether there is any calm and coolness among your marbles. My own art is too nervous, too passionate, too full of agitation for me to work at it whole days together, without intervals of repose. So what have you to show me? "'Pray look at everything here,' said Kenyon. "'I love to have painters see my work. "'Their judgment is unprejudiced "'and more valuable than that of the world generally, "'from the light which their own art throws on mine, "'more valuable, too, than that of my brother sculptors "'who never judge me fairly, nor I them, perhaps.' To gratify him, Miriam looked round at the specimens in marble or plaster, of which there were several in the room, comprising originals or casts of most of the designs that Kenyon had thus far produced. He was still too young to have accumulated a large gallery of such things. What he had to show were chiefly the attempts and experiments in various directions of a beginner in art, acting as a stern tutor to himself, and profiting more by his failures than by any success of which he was yet capable. Some of them, however, had great merit, and in the pure, fine glow of the new marble, it may be they dazzled the judgment into awarding them higher praise than they deserved. 
Miriam admired the statue of a beautiful youth, a pearl-fisher, who had got entangled in the weeds at the bottom of the sea, and lay dead among the pearl oysters, the rich shells, and the seaweeds, all of like value to him now. "'The poor young man has perished among the prizes that he sought,' remarked she. "'But what a strange efficacy there is in death! If we cannot all win pearls, it causes an empty shell to satisfy us just as well. I like this statue, though it is too cold and stern in its moral lesson, and physically the form has not settled itself into sufficient repose.' In another style there was a grand, calm head of Milton, not copied from any one bust or picture, yet more authentic than any of them, because all known representations of the poet had been profoundly studied and solved in the artist's mind. The bust over the tomb in Rayfriars Church, the original miniatures and pictures, wherever to be found, had mingled each its special truth in this one work, wherein likewise by long perusal and deep love of the paradise lost, the Comus, the Lecidas, and L'Allegro, the sculptor had succeeded even better than he knew, in spiritualizing his marble with the poet's mighty genius. And this was a great thing to have achieved, such a length of time after the dry bones and dust of Milton, were like those of any other dead man. There were also several portrait busts, comprising those of two or three of the illustrious men of our own country, whom Kenyon, before he left America, had asked permission to model. He had done so because he sincerely believed that, whether he wrought the busts in marble or bronze, the one would corrode and the other crumble in the long lapse of time beneath these great men's immortality. Possibly, however, the young artist may have underestimated the durability of his material. Other faces there were, too, of men who, if the brevity of their remembrance after death can be augured from their little value in life, should have been represented in snow rather than marble. Posterity will be puzzled what to do with busts like these, the conclusions and petrifications of a vain self-estimate, but will find, no doubt, that they serve to build into stone walls, or burn into quicklime, as well as if the marble had never been blocked into the geese of human heads. But it is an awful thing indeed, this endless endurance, this almost indestructibility of a marble bust, whether in our own case or that of other men. It bids us sadly measure the little, little time during which our lineaments are likely to be of interest to any human being. It is especially singular that Americans should care about perpetuating themselves in this mode. The brief duration of our families as a hereditary household renders it next to a certainty that the great-grandchildren will not know their father's grandfather, and that a half a century hence at furthest the hammer of the auctioneer will thump its knock-down blow against his blockhead, sold at so much for the pound of stone and it ought to make us shiver, the idea of leaving our features to be a dusty white ghost among strangers of another generation, who will take our nose between their thumb and fingers, as we have seen men do by Caesars, and infallibly break it off if they can do so without detection. Yes, said Miriam, who had been revolving some such thoughts as the above. It is a good state of mind for mortal men, when he is content to leave no more definite memorial than the grass, which will sprout kindly and speedily over his grave, if we do not make the spot barren with marble. Methinks, too, it will be a fresher and better world when it flings off this great burden of stony memories, which the ages have deemed it a piety to heap upon its back. 
"'What you say,' remarked Kenyon, "'goes against my whole art. "'Sculpture and the delight which men naturally take in it "'appear to me a proof that it is good to work "'with all time before our view.' "'Well, well,' answered Miriam, "'I must not quarrel with you for flinging your heavy stones "'at poor posterity, and, to say the truth, I think you are as likely to hit the mark as anybody. These busts now, much as I seem to scorn them, make me feel as if you were a magician. You turn feverish men into cool, quiet marble. What a blessed change for them! Would you could do as much for me? Oh, gladly, cried Kenyon, who had long wished to model that beautiful and most expressive face. "'When will you begin to sit?' "'Pooh! That was not what I meant,' said Miriam. "'Come, show me something else.' "'Do you recognize this?' asked the sculptor. He took out of his desk a little old-fashioned ivory coffer, yellow with age. It was richly carved with antique figures and foliage and had Kenyon thought it fit to say that Benvenuto Cellini wrought this precious box. The skill and elaborate fancy of the work would by no means have discredited his word, nor the old artist's fame. At least it was evidently production of Benvenuto's school and century, and might once have been the jewel case of some grand lady at the court of the Medici. Lifting the lid, however, no blaze of diamonds was disclosed, but only, lapped in fleecy cotton, a small, beautifully shaped hand, most delicately sculptured in marble. Such loving care and nicest art had been lavished here, that the palm really seemed to have a tenderness in its very substance. Touching those lovely fingers, had the yellow sculptor allowed you to touch, you could hardly believe that a virgin warmth would not steal from them into your heart. Ah, this is very beautiful, exclaimed Miriam with a genial smile. It is as good in its way as Lully's hand with its baby dimples, which Powers showed me at Florence, evidently valuing it as much as if he had wrought it out of a piece of his great heart as good as harriet hosmer's clasped hands of browning and his wife symbolizing the individuality and heroic union of two high poetic lives nay i do not question that it is better than either of those because you must have wrought it passionately in spite of its maiden palm and dainty fingertips. "'Then you do recognize it?' asked Kenyon. "'There is but one right hand on earth that could have supplied the model,' answered Miriam. "'So small and slender, so perfectly symmetrical, and yet with a character of delicate energy. I have watched it a hundred times at its work but I did not dream that you had won Hilda so far. How have you persuaded that shy maiden to let you take her hand in marble? Never. She never knew it, hastily replied Kenyon, anxious to vindicate his mistress's maidenly reserve. I stole it from her. The hand is a reminiscence. After gazing at it so often, and even holding it once for an instant, when Hilda was not thinking of me. I should be a bungler indeed if I could not now reproduce it to something like the life. May you win the original one day, said Miriam kindly. I have little ground to hope it, answered the sculptor despondingly. Hilda does not dwell in our mortal atmosphere, and gentle and soft as she appears, it will be as difficult to win her heart as to entice down a white bird from its sunny freedom in the sky. It is strange, with all her delicacy and fragility, the impression she makes of being utterly sufficient to herself. No, I shall never win her. 
She is abundantly capable of sympathy and delights to receive it, but she has no need of love. I partly agree with you, said Miriam. It is a mistaken idea which men generally entertain, that nature has made women especially prone to throw their whole being into what is technically called love. We have, to say the least, no more necessity for it than yourselves, only we have nothing else to do with our hearts. When women have other objects in life, they are not apt to fall in love. I can think of many women distinguished in art, literature, and science, and multitudes whose hearts and minds find good employment in less ostentatious ways, who lead high, lonely lives, and are conscious of no sacrifice so far as your sex is concerned. And Hilda will be one of these, said Kenyon sadly. The thought makes me shiver for myself and for her, too. Well, said Miriam, smiling, perhaps she may sprain the delicate wrist which you have sculptured to such perfection. In that case you may hope. These old masters to whom she has vowed herself, and whom her slender hand and woman's heart serves so faithfully, are your only rivals. The sculptor sighed as he put away the treasure of Hilda's marble hand into the ivory coffer, and thought how slight was the possibility that he should ever feel responsive to his own the tender clasp of the original. He dared not even kiss the image that he himself had made. It had assumed its share of Hilda's remote and shy divinity. "'And now,' said Miriam, "'show me the new statue which you asked me hither.' Volume 1, Chapter 14 of The Marble Form This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Marble Form by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 1, Chapter 14 Cleopatra my new statue said kenyon who had positively forgotten it in the thought of hilda here it is under this veil not a nude figure i hope observed miriam every young sculptor seems to think that he must give the world some specimen of indecorous womanhood and call it eve venus a nymph or any name that may apologize for a lack of decent clothing I am weary, even more than I am ashamed, of seeing such things. Nowadays people are as good as born in their clothes, and there is practically not a new human being in existence. An artist, therefore, as you must candidly confess, cannot sculpture nudity with a pure heart, if only because he is compelled to steal guilty glimpses at hired models. The marble inevitably loses its chastity under such circumstances. An old Greek sculptor, no doubt, found his models in the open sunshine, and among pure and princely maidens, and thus the nude statues of antiquity are as modest as violets, and sufficiently draped in their own beauty. But as for Mr. Gibson's coloured Venuses, stained i believe with tobacco juice and all other nudities of to-day i really do not understand what they have to say to this generation and would be glad to see as many heaps of quicklime in their stead you are severe upon the professors of my art said kenyon half smiling half seriously not that you are wholly wrong either we are bound to accept drapery of some kind and make the best of it. But what are we to do? 
Must we adopt the costume of today and carve, for example, a Venus in a hoop petticoat? That would be a bolder indeed, rejoined Miriam, laughing. But the difficulty goes to confirm me in my belief that except for portrait busts, sculpture has no longer a right to claim any place among living arts. It has wrought itself out and come fairly to an end. There is never a new group nowadays, never even so much as a new attitude. Greenoff, I take my examples among men of merit, imagine nothing new, nor Crawford either, except in the tailoring line. There are not, as you will own, more than half a dozen positively original statues or groups in the world and these few are of immemorial antiquity a person familiar with the vatican the uffizi gallery the naples gallery and the louvre will at once refer any modern production to its antique prototype which moreover had begun to get out of fashion even in old roman days pray stop miriam cried kenyon or i shall fling away the chisel for ever fairly own to me then my friend rejoined miriam whose disturbed mind found a certain relief in this declamation that you sculptors are of necessity the greatest plagiarists in the world i do not own it said kenyon yet cannot utterly contradict you as regards the actual state of the art but as long as the carrara quarry still yield pure blocks and while my own country has marble mountains probably as fine in quality i shall steadfastly believe that future sculptors will revive this noblest of the beautiful arts and people the world with new shapes of delicate grace and massive grandeur perhaps he added smiling mankind will consent to wear a more manageable costume or at worst we sculptors shall get the skill to make broadcloth transparent and render a majestic human character visible through the coats and trousers of the present day be it so said miriam you are past my counsel show me the veiled figure which i am afraid i have criticized beforehand to make amends i am in the mood to praise it now but as kenyon was about to take the cloth off the clay model she laid her hand on his arm tell me first what is the subject said she for i have sometimes incurred great displeasure from members of your brotherhood by being too obtuse to puzzle out the purport of their productions it is so difficult you know to compress and define a character or story and make it patent at a glance within the narrow scoop attainable by sculpture indeed i fancy it is still the ordinary habit with sculptors first to finish their group of statuary in such development as the particular block of marble will allow and then to choose the subject as john of bologna did with his rape of the sabines have you followed that good example no my statue is intended for cleopatra replied kenyon a little disturbed by miriam's raillery the special epoch of her history you must make out for yourself he drew away the cloth that had served to keep the moisture of the clay model from being exhaled the sitting figure of a woman was seen she was draped from head to foot in a costume minutely and scrupulously studied from that of ancient egypt as revealed by the strange sculptor of that country its coins drawings painted mummy cases and whatever other tokens have been dug out of its pyramids graves and catacombs even the stiff egyptian headdress was adhered to but had been softened into a rich feminine adornment, without losing a particle of its truth. Difficulties that might well have seemed insurmountable had been courageously encountered, and made flexible to purposes of grace and dignity. 
so that cleopatra sat attired in a garb proper to her historic and queenly state as a daughter of the ptolemies and yet such as the beautiful woman would have put on as best adapted to height the magnificence of her charms and kindle a tropic fire in the cold eyes of octavius a marvellous repose that rare merit in statuary except it be the lumpish repose native to the block of stone was diffused throughout the figure the spectator felt that cleopatra had sunk down out of the fever and turmoil of her life and for one instant as it were between two pulse throbs had relinquished all activity and was resting throughout every vein and muscle it was the repose of despair indeed for octavius had seen her and remained insensible to her enchantments but still there was a great smouldering furnace deep down in the woman's heart the repose no doubt was as complete as if she were never to stir hand or foot again and yet such was the creature's latent energy and fierceness she might spring upon you like a tigress and stop the very breath that you were now drawing midway in your throat the face was a miraculous success the sculptor had not shunned to give the full nubian lips and other characteristics of the egyptian physiognomy his courage and integrity had been abundantly rewarded for cleopatra's beauty shone out richer warmer more triumphantly beyond comparison than if shrinking timidly from the truth he had chosen the tame grecian type the expression was of profound gloomy heavily revolving thought a glance into her past life and present emergencies while her spirit gathered itself up for some new struggle or was getting sternly reconciled to impending doom in one view there was a certain softness and tenderness how breathed into the statue among so many strong and passionate elements it is impossible to say catching another glimpse you beheld her as implacable as a stone and cruel as fire in a word all cleopatra fierce voluptuous passionate tender wicked terrible and full of poisonous and rapturous enchantment was kneaded into what only a week or two before had been a lump of wet clay from the tiber soon apotheosized in an indestructible material she would be one of the images that men keep for ever finding a heat in them which does not cool down throughout the centuries what a woman is this exclaimed miriam after a long pause tell me did she ever try even while you were creating her to overcome you with her fury or her love were you not afraid to touch her as she grew more and more towards hot life beneath your hand my dear friend it is a great work how have you learned to do it it is the concretion of a good deal of thought emotion and toil of brain and hand said kenyon not without a perception that his work was good but i know not how it came about at last i kindled a great fire within my mind and threw in the material as aaron threw the gold of the israelites into the furnace and in the midmost heat uprose cleopatra as you see her what i most marvel at said miriam is the womanhood that you have so thoroughly mixed up with all those seemingly discordant elements where did you get that secret you never found it in your gentle hilda yet i recognize its truth no surely it was not in hilda said kenyon her womanhood is of the ethereal type and incompatible with any shadow of darkness or evil you are right rejoined miriam there are women of that ethereal type as you term it 
and Hilda is one of them. She would die of her first wrongdoing, supposing for a moment that she could be capable of doing wrong. Of sorrow, slender as she seems, Hilda might bear a great burden, of sin not a feather's weight. Methinks now, were it my doom, I could bear either or both at once, but my conscience is still as white as Hilda's. Do you question it? Heaven forbid, Miriam, exclaimed the sculptor. He was startled at the strange turn which she had so suddenly given to the conversation. Her voice, too, so much emotion was stifled rather than expressed in it sounded unnatural oh my friend cried she with sudden passion will you be my friend indeed i am lonely 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 there is a secret in my heart that burns me that tortures me sometimes i fear to go mad of it sometimes i hope to die of it but neither of the two happens Ah, if I could but whisper it to only one human soul. And you, you see far into womanhood. You receive it widely into your large view. Perhaps, perhaps, but heaven only knows you might understand me. Oh, let me speak. Miriam, dear friend, replied the sculptor, if I can help you, speak freely, as to a brother. Help me? No, said Miriam. Kenyon's response had been perfectly frank and kind, and yet the subtlety of Miriam's emotion detected a certain reserve and alarm in his warmly expressed readiness to hear her story. In his secret soul, to say the truth, the sculptor doubted whether it were well for this poor, suffering girl to speak what she so yearned to say, or for him to listen. If there were any active duty of friendship to be performed, then, indeed, he would joyfully have come forward to do his best. But if it were only a pent-up heart that sought an outlet, in that case it was by no means so certain that a confession would do good. The more her secret struggled and fought to be told, the more certain would it be to change all former relations that had subsisted between herself and the friend to whom she might reveal it, unless he could give her all the sympathy and just the kind of sympathy that the occasion required. Miriam would hate him by and by, and herself still more, if he let her speak. This was what Kenyon said to himself, but his reluctance after all, and whether he were conscious of it or no, resulted from a suspicion that had crept into his heart and lay there in a dark corner. Obscure as it was when Miriam looked into his eyes, she detected it at once. "'Ah, I shall hate you!' cried she, echoing the thought which he had not spoken. She was half choked with a gush of passion that was thus turned back upon her. "'You are as cold and pitiless as your own marble.' "'No, but full of sympathy, God knows,' replied he. In truth, his suspicions— however warranted by the mystery in which Miriam was enveloped, had vanished in the earnestness of his kindly and sorrowful emotion. He was now ready to receive her trust. "'Keep your sympathy, then, for sorrows that admit of such solace,' said she, making a strong effort to compose herself. "'As for my griefs, I know how to manage them. It was all a mistake. You can do nothing for me, unless you petrify me into a marble companion for your Cleopatra there. And I am not of her sisterhood, I do assure you. Forget this foolish scene, my friend, and never let me see a reference to it in your eyes, when they meet mine hereafter. Since you desire it, 
all shall be forgotten answered the sculptor pressing her hands as she departed or if ever i can serve you let my readiness to do so be remembered meanwhile dear miriam let us meet in the same clear friendly light as heretofore you are less sincere than i thought you said miriam if you try to make me think that there will be no change as he attended her through the antechamber she pointed to the statue of the pearl diver my secret is not a pearl said she yet a man may drown himself in plunging after it after kenyon had closed the door she went wearily down the staircase but paused midway as if debating with herself whether to return the mischief was done thought she and i might as well have had the solace that ought to come with it i have lost by staggering a little way beyond the mark in the blindness of my distress i have lost as we shall hereafter find the genuine friendship of this clear-minded honourable true-hearted young man and all for nothing what if i should go back this moment and compel him to listen she ascended two or three of the stairs but again paused murmured to herself and shook her head no 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 she thought and i wonder how i ever came to dream of it unless i had his heart for my own and that is hilda's nor would i steal it from her it should never be the treasure place of my secret it is no precious pearl as i just now told him but my dark red carbuncle red as blood is too rich a gem to put into a stranger's casket she went down the stairs and found her shadow waiting for her in the Volume 1, Chapter 15 of The Marble Faun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Faun by Nathaniel Havthorne. Volume 1, Chapter 15 An Aesthetic Company. On the evening after Miriam's visit to Kenyon's studio, there was an assemblage composed almost entirely of Anglo-Saxons, and chiefly of American artists, with a sprinkling of their English brethren, and some few of the tourists who still lingered in Rome, now that Holy Week was past. Miriam, Hilda, and the sculptor were all three present, and with them donatello whose life was so far turned from fitz natural bent that like a pet spaniel he followed his beloved mistress wherever he could gain admittance the place of meeting was in the palatial but somewhat faded and gloomy apartment of an eminent member of the aesthetic body it was no more formal an occasion than one of those weekly receptions common among the foreign residents of rome at which pleasant people or disagreeable ones as the case may be encounter one another with little ceremony if any wise interested in art a man must be difficult to please who cannot find fit companionship among a crowd of persons whose ideas and pursuits all tend towards the general purpose of enlarging the world's stock of beautiful productions one of the chief causes that make rome the favourite residence of artists their ideal home which they sigh for in advance and are so loath to migrate from after one breathing its enchanted air is doubtless that they there find themselves in force and are numerous enough to create a congenial atmosphere in every other clime they are isolated strangers in this land of art they are free citizens 
not that individually or in the mass there appears to be any large stock of mutual affection among the brethren of the chisel and the pencil on the contrary it will impress the shrewd observer that the jealousies and petty animosities which the poets of our day have flung aside still irritate and gnaw into the hearts of this kindred class of imaginative men it is not difficult to suggest reasons why this should be the fact the public in whose good grace lie the sculptor's or the painter's prospects of success is infinitely smaller than the public to which literary men make their appeal it is composed of a very limited body of wealthy patrons and these as the artist well knows are but blind judges in matters that require the utmost delicacy of perception thus success in art is apt to become partly an affair of intrigue and it is almost inevitable that even a gifted artist should look askance at his gifted brother's fame and be chary of the good word that might help him to sell still another statue or picture you seldom hear a painter heap generous praise on anything in his special line of art a sculptor never has a favorable eye for any marble but his own nevertheless in spite of all these professional grudges artists are conscious of a social warmth from each other's presence and contiguity they shiver at the remembrance of their lonely studios in the unsympathizing cities of their native land for the sake of such brotherhood as they can find more than for any good that they get from galleries they linger year after year in italy while their originality dies out of them or is polished away as a barbarism the company this evening included several men and women whom the world has heard of and many others beyond all question whom it ought to know it would be a pleasure to introduce them upon our humble pages name by name and had we confidence enough in our own taste to crown each well-deserving brow according to its deserts the opportunity is tempting but not easily manageable and far too perilous both in respect to those individuals whom we might bring forward and the far greater number that must needs be left in the shade ink moreover is apt to have a corrosive quality and might chance to raise a blister instead of any more agreeable titillation on skins so sensitive as those of artists we must therefore forego the delight of illuminating this chapter with personal allusions to men whose renown glows richly on canvas or gleams in the white moonlight of marble otherwise we might point to an artist who has studied nature with such tender love that she takes him to her intimacy enabling him to reproduce her in landscapes that seem the reality of a better earth and yet are but the truth of the very scenes around us observed by the painter's insight and interpreted for us by his skill by his magic the moon throws her light far out of the picture and the crimson of the summer night absolutely glimmers on the beholder's face or we might indicate a poet painter whose song has the vividness of picture and whose canvas is peopled with angels fairies and water sprites done to the ethereal life because he saw them face to face in his poetic mood or we might bow before an artist who has wrought too sincerely too religiously with too earnest a feeling and too delicate a touch for the world at once to recognize how much toil and thought are compressed into the stately brow of prospero and miranda's maiden loveliness or from what a depth within this painter's heart the angel is leading forth saint peter thus it would be easy to go on perpetrating a score of little epigrammatical allusions like the above all kindly meant but none of them quite hitting the mark and often striking where they were not aimed 
it may be allowable to say however that american art is much better represented at rome in the pictorial than in the sculpturesque department yet the men of marble appear to have more weight with the public than the men of canvas perhaps on account of the greater density and solid substance of the material in which they work and the sort of physical advantage which their labors thus acquire over the elusive unreality of color to be a sculptor seems a distinction in itself whereas a painter is nothing unless individually eminent one sculptor there was an englishman endowed with a beautiful fancy and possessing at his fingers ends the capability of doing beautiful things he was a quiet simple elderly personage with eyes brown and bright under a slightly impending brow and a grecian profile such as he might have cut with his own chisel he had spent his life for forty years in making venuses cupids bacchuses and a vast deal of other marble progeny of dream-work or rather frost-work it was all a vapory exhalation out of the grecian mythology crystallizing on the dull window-panes of to-day gifted with a more delicate power than any other man alive he had foregone to be a christian reality and perverted himself into a pagan idealist whose business or efficiency in our present world it would be exceedingly difficult to define and loving and reverencing the pure material in which he wrought as surely this admirable sculptor did he had nevertheless robbed the marble of its chastity by giving it an artificial warmth of hue thus it became a sin and shame to look at his nude goddesses they had revealed themselves to his imagination no doubt with all that deity about them but bedaubed with buff colour they stood forth to the eyes of the profane in the guise of naked women but whatever criticism may be ventured on his style it was good to meet a man so modest and yet imbued with such thorough and simple conviction of his own right principles and practice and so quietly satisfied that his kind of antique achievement was all that sculpture could effect for modern life this eminent person's weight and authority among his artistic brethren were very evident for beginning unobtrusively to utter himself on a topic of art he was soon the centre of a little crowd of younger sculptors they drank in his wisdom as if it would serve all the purposes of original inspiration he meanwhile discoursing with gentle calmness as if there could possibly be no other side and offer ratifying as it were his own conclusions by a mildly emphatic yes the veteran sculptor's unsought audience was composed mostly of our own countrymen it is fair to say that they were a body of very dexterous and capable artists each of whom had probably given the delighted public a nude statue or had won credit for even higher skill by the nice carving of buttonholes shoe ties coat seams shirt bosoms and other such graceful peculiarities of modern costume smart practical men they doubtless were and some of them far more than this but still not precisely what an uninitiated person looks for in a sculptor a sculptor indeed to meet the demands which our preconceptions make upon him should be even more indispensably a poet than those who deal in measured verse and rhyme his material or instrument which serves him in the stead of shifting and transitory language is a pure white undecaying substance it ensures immortality to whatever is wrought in it and therefore makes it a religious obligation to commit no idea to its mighty guardianship save such as may repay the marble for its faithful care its incorruptible fidelity by warming it with an ethereal life 
Under this aspect, marble assumes a sacred character, and no man should dare to touch it, unless he feels within himself a certain consecration and a priesthood, the only evidence of which, for the public eye, will be the high treatment of heroic subjects, or the delicate evolution of spiritual through material beauty. No idea such as the foregoing, no misgiving suggested by them probably, troubled the self-complacency of most of these clever sculptors. Marble, in their view, had no such sanctity as we impute to it. It was merely a sort of white limestone from Carrara, cut into convenient blocks, and worth, in that state, about two or three dollars per pound and it was susceptible of being wrought into certain shapes by their own mechanical ingenuity or that of artisans in their employment, which would enable them to sell it again at a much higher figure. Such men, on the strength of some small knack in handling clay, which might have been fitly employed in making waxwork, are bold to call themselves sculptors, how terrible should be the thought that the nude woman whom the modern artist patches together bit by bit from a dozen heterogeneous models meaning nothing by her shall last as long as the venus of the capitol that his group of no matter what since it has no moral or intellectual existence will not physically crumble any sooner than the immortal agony of the Lacocon. Yet we love the artists in every kind, even these whose merits we are not quite able to appreciate. Sculptors, painters, crayon sketchers, or whatever branch of aesthetics they adopted, were certainly pleasanter people, as we saw them that evening, than the average whom we meet in ordinary society. They were not fully confined within the sordid compass of practical life. They had a pursuit which, if followed faithfully out, would lead them to the beautiful, and always had a tendency thitherward, even if they lingered to gather up golden dross by the wayside. Their actual business, though they talked about it very much as other men talk of cotton, politics, floor barrels, and sugar, necessarily illuminated their conversation with something akin to the ideal. So, when the guests collected themselves in little groups, here and there, in the wide saloon, a cheerful and airy gossip began to be heard. The atmosphere ceased to be precisely that of common life. A hint, mellow tinge such as we see in pictures, mingled itself with the lamplight. This good effect was assisted by many curious little treasures of art, which the host had taken care to strew upon his tables. They were principally such bits of antiquity as the soil of Rome and its neighborhood are still rich in, seals, gems, small figures of bronze, medieval carvings in ivory, things which have been obtained at little cost yet might have borne no inconsiderable value in the museum of a virtuoso. As interesting as any of these relics was a large portfolio of old drawings, some of which, in the opinion of their possessor, bore evidence on their faces of the touch of master hands. Very ragged and ill-conditioned they mostly were, yellow with time and tattered with rough usage, and, in their best estate, the designs had been scratched rudely with pen and ink on coarse paper, or, if drawn with charcoal or pencil, were now half rubbed out. You would not anywhere see rougher and homelier things than these. But this hasty rudeness made the sketches only the more valuable, because the artist seemed to have bestirred himself at the pinch of the moment snatching up whatever material was nearest, so as to seize the first glimpse of an idea that might vanish in the twinkling of an eye. Thus, by the spell of a creased, soiled, and discolored scrap of paper, 
you were enabled to steal close to an old master and watch him in the very effervescence of his genius according to the judgment of several connoisseurs raphael's own hand had communicated its magnetism to one of these sketches and if genuine it was evidently his first conception of a favorite madonna now hanging in the private apartment of the grand duke at florence another drawing was attributed to leonardo da vinci and appeared to be a somewhat varied design for his picture of modesty and vanity in the schiera palace there were at least half a dozen others to which the owner assigned as high an origin it was delightful to believe in their authenticity at all events for these things make the spectator more vividly sensible of a great painter's power than the final glow and perfected art of the most consummate picture that may have been elaborated from them there is an effluence of divinity in the first sketch and there if anywhere you find the pure light of inspiration which the subsequent toil of the artist serves to bring out in stronger lustre indeed but likewise adulterates it with what belongs to an inferior mood the aroma and fragrance of new thoughts were perceptible in these designs after three centuries of wear and tear the charm lay partly in their very imperfection for this is suggestive and sets the imagination at work whereas the finished picture if a good one leaves the spectator nothing to do and if bad confuses stupefies disenchants and disheartens him hilda was greatly interested in this rich portfolio she lingered so long over one particular sketch that miriam asked her what discovery she had made look at it carefully replied hilda putting the sketch into her hands if you take pains to disentangle the design from those pencil marks that seem to have been scrawled over it i think you will see something very curious it is a hopeless affair i am afraid said miriam i have neither your faith dear hilda nor your perceptive faculty fie what a blurred scrawl it is indeed the drawing had originally been very slight and had suffered more from time and hard usage than almost any other in the collection it appeared too that there had been an attempt perhaps by the very hand that drew it to obliterate the design by hilda's help however Miriam pretty distinctly made out a winged figure with a drawn sword, and a dragon or a demon prostrate at his feet. "'I am convinced,' said Hilda in a low reverential tone, "'that Guido's own touches are on that ancient scrap of paper. If so, it must be his original sketch for the picture of the archangel Michael setting his foot upon the demon.' in the church of the cappuccini the composition and general arrangement of the sketch are the same with those of the picture the only difference being that the demon has a more upturned face and scolds vindictively at the archangel who turns away his eyes in painful disgust no wonder responded miriam the expression suits the daintiness of michael's character as guido represents him he never could have looked the demon in the face miriam exclaimed her friend reproachfully you grieve me and you know it by pretending to speak contemptuously of the most beautiful and the divinest figure that mortal painter ever drew forgive me hilda said miriam you take these matters more religiously than i can for my life guido's archangel is a fine picture of course but it never impressed me as it does you well we will not talk of that answered hilda what i wanted you to notice in this sketch is the face of the demon it is entirely unlike the demon of the finished picture guido you know always affirmed 
that the resemblance to Cardinal Pamphili was either casual or imaginary. Now here is the face as he first conceived it. And a more energetic demon altogether than that of the finished picture, said Kenyon, taking the sketch into his hand. What a spirit is conveyed into the ugliness of this strong, writhing, squirming dragon under the archangel's foot. Neither is the face an impossible one. Upon my word, I have seen it somewhere, and on the shoulders of a living man. And so have I, said Hilda. It was what struck me from the first. Donatello, look at this face, cried Kenyon. The young Italian, as may be supposed, took little interest in matters of art, and seldom or never ventured an opinion respecting them. After holding the sketch a single instant in his hand, he flung it from him with a shudder of disgust and repugnance, and a frown that had all the bitterness of hatred. "'I know the face well,' whispered he. "'It is Miriam's model.' It was acknowledged both by Kenyon and Hilda that they had detected or fancied the resemblance which Donatello so strongly affirmed, and it added not a little to the grotesque and weird character which, half playfully, half seriously, they assigned to Miriam's attendant, to think of him as personating the demon's part in a picture of more than two centuries ago. Had Guido, in his effort to imagine the outmost of sin and misery, which his pencil could represent, hit ideally upon just this face, or was it an actual portrait of somebody that haunted the old master, as Miriam was haunted now? Did the ominous shadow follow him through all the sunshine of his earlier career, and into the gloom that gathered about its close? And when Guido died, did the spectre betake himself to those ancient sepulchres, there awaiting a new victim, till it was Miriam's ill hap to encounter him? I do not acknowledge the resemblance at all, said Miriam, looking narrowly at the sketch. And as I have drawn the face twenty times, I think you will own that I am the best judge. A discussion here arose in reference to Guido's archangel, and it was agreed that these four friends should visit the church of the Cappuccini the next morning, and critically examine the picture in question, the similarity between it and the sketch being, at all events, a very curious circumstance. It was now a little past ten o'clock, when some of the company, who had been standing in a balcony, declared the moonlight to be resplendent. They proposed a ramble through the streets, taking in their way some of those scenes of ruin, which produced their best effects under the splendor of the Italian Volume 1, Chapter 16 of The Marble Faun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Faun by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 1, Chapter 16 A Moonlight Ramble. The proposal for a moonlight ramble was received with acclamation by all the younger portion of the company. They immediately set forth and descended from story to story, dimly lighting their way by waxen tapers, which are a necessary equipment to those whose thoroughfare in the night-time lies up and down a Roman staircase. Emerging from the courtyard of the edifice, they looked upward and saw the sky full of light, which seemed to have a delicate purple or crimson luster, or at least some richer tinge than the cold white moonshine of other skies. 
it gleamed over the front of the opposite palace showing the architectural ornaments of its cornice and pillared portal as well as the iron-barred basement windows that gave such a prison-like aspect to the structure and the shabbiness and squalor that lay along its base a cobbler was just shutting up his little shop in the basement of the palace a cigar vendor's lantern flared in the blast that came through the archway a french sentinel placed to and fro before the portal a homeless dog that haunted thereabouts barked as obstreperously at the party as if he were the domestic guardian of the precincts the air was quietly full of the noise of falling water the cause of which was nowhere visible though apparently near at hand this pleasant natural sound not unlike that of a distant cascade in the forest may be heard in many of the roman streets and piazzas when the tumult of the city is hushed for consuls emperors and popes the great men of every age have found no better way of immortalizing their memories than by the shifting indestructible ever new yet unchanging upgush and downfall of water they have written their names in that unstable element and proved it a more durable record than brass or marble donatello you had better take one of those gay boyish artists for your companion said miriam when she found the italian youth at her side i am not now in a merry mood as when we set all the world a-dancing the other afternoon in the borghese grounds i never wish to dance any more answered donatello what a melancholy was in that tone exclaimed miriam you are getting spoilt in this dreary rome and will be as wise and as wretched as all the rest of mankind unless you go back soon to your tuscan vineyards well give me your arm then but take care that no friskiness comes over you we must walk evenly and heavily to-night the party arranged itself according to its natural affinities or casual likings a sculptor generally choosing a painter and a painter a sculptor for his companion in preference to brethren of their own art kenyon would gladly have taken hilda to himself and have drawn her a little aside from the throng of merry wayfarers but she kept near miriam and seemed in her gentle and quiet way to decline a separate alliance either with him or any other of her acquaintances so they set forth and had gone but a little way when the narrow street emerged into a piazza on one side of which glistening and dimpling in the moonlight was the most famous fountain in rome its murmur not to say its uproar had been in the ears of the company ever since they came into the open air it was the fountain of trevi which draws its precious water from a source far beyond the walls whence it flows hitherward through old subterranean aqueducts and sparkles forth as pure as the virgin who first led agrippa to its well-spring by her father's door i shall sip as much of this water as the hollow of my hand will hold said miriam i am leaving rome in a few days and the tradition goes that a parting draught at the fountain of trevi ensures the traveller's return whatever obstacles and improbabilities may seem to beset him will you drink donatello signorina what you drink i drink said the youth they and the rest of the party descended some steps to the water's brim and after a sip or two stood gazing at the absurd design of the fountain where some sculptor of bernini's school had gone absolutely mad in marble it was a great palace front with niches and many bas-reliefs out of which looked agrippa's legendary virgin and several of the allegoric sisterhood while at the base appeared neptune with his floundering steeds and tritons blowing their horns about him and twenty other artificial fantasies which the calm moonlight soothed into better taste than was native to them and after all it was as magnificent a piece of work 
as ever human skill contrived at the foot of the palatial facade was strewn with careful art and ordered irregularity a broad and broken heap of massive rock looking as if it might have lain there since the deluge over the central precipice fell the water in a semicircular cascade and from a hundred crevices on all sides snow yet gushed up and streams spouted out of the mouths and nostrils of stone monsters and fell in glistening drops while other rivulets that had run wild came leaping from one rude step to another over stones that were mossy slimy and green with sedge because in a century of their wild play nature had adopted the fountain of trevi with all its elaborate devices for her own finally the water tumbling sparkling and dashing with joyous haste and never-ceasing murmur poured itself into a great marble-brimmed reservoir and filled it with a quivering tide on which was seen continually a snowy semicircle of momentary foam from the principal cascade as well as a multitude of snow points from smaller jets the basin occupied the whole breadth of the piazza whence flights of steps descended to its border a boat might float and make voyages from one shore to another in this mimic lake in the daytime there is hardly a livelier scene in rome than the neighbourhood of the fountain of trevi for the piazza is then filled with the stalls of vegetable and fruit dealers chestnut roasters cigar vendors and other people whose petty and wandering traffic is transacted in the open air it is likewise thronged with idlers lounging over the iron railing and with forestieri who came hither to see the famous fountain here also are seen men with buckets urchins with cans and maidens a picture as old as the patriarchal times bearing their pictures upon their heads for the water of trevi is in request far and wide as the most refreshing draught for feverish lips the pleasantest to mingle with wine and the wholesomest to drink in its native purity that can anywhere be found but now at early midnight the piazza was a solitude and it was a delight to behold this untamable water sporting by itself in the moonshine and compelling all the elaborate trivialities of art to assume a natural aspect in accordance with its own powerful simplicity what would be done with this water power suggested an artist if we had it in one of our american cities would they employ it to turn the machinery of a cotton mill i wonder the good people would pull down those rampant marble deities said kenyon and possibly they would give me a commission to carve the one and thirty is that the number sister states each pouring a silver stream from a separate can into one vast basin which should represent the grand reservoir of national prosperity or if they wanted a bit of satire remarked an english artist you could set those same one and thirty states to cleansing the national flag of any stains that it may have incurred the roman washerwomen at the lavatory yonder plying their labour in the open air would serve admirably as models i have often intended to visit this fountain by moonlight said miriam because it was here that the interview took place between corinne and lord neville after their separation and temporary estrangement pray come behind me one of you and let me try whether the face can be recognized in the water leaning over the stone brim of the basin she heard footsteps stealing behind her and knew that somebody was looking over her shoulder the moonshine fell directly behind miriam illuminating the palace front and the whole scene of statues and rocks and filling the basin as it were with tremulous and palpable light corinne it will be remembered knew lord neville by the reflection of his face in the water in miriam's case however owing to the agitation of the water its transparency 
and the angel at which she was compelled to lean over, no reflected image appeared, nor from the same causes would it have been possible for the recognition between Corinne and her lover to take place. The moon, indeed, flung Miriam's shadow at the bottom of the basin, as well as two more shadows of persons who had followed her on either side. Three shadows! exclaimed Miriam. Three separate shadows, all so black and heavy that they sink in the water. There they lie on the bottom as if all three were drowned together. This shadow on my right is Donatello. I know him by his curls and the turn of his head. My left-hand companion puzzles me, a shapeless mass as indistinct as the premonition of calamity. Which of you can it be? Ah! She had turned round while speaking, and saw beside her the strange creature whose attendance on her was already familiar, as a marvel and a jest to the whole company of artists. A general burst of laughter followed the recognition, while the model leaned towards Miriam, as she shrank from him and muttered something that was inaudible to those who witnessed the scene. By his gestures, however, they concluded that he was inviting her to bathe her hands. "'He cannot be an Italian, at least not a Roman,' observed an artist. "'I never knew one of them to care about ablution. See him now.' It is as if he were trying to wash off the time-stains and earthly soil of a thousand years. Dipping his hands into the capacious washbowl before him, the model rubbed them together with the utmost vehemence. Ever and anon, too, he peeped into the water, as if expecting to see the whole fountain of Trevi turbid with the results of his ablution. Miriam looked at him some little time with an aspect of real terror, and even imitated him by leaning over to peep into the basin. Recovering herself, she took up some of the water in the hollow of her hand, and practiced an old form of exorcism by flinging it in her persecutor's face. "'In the name of all the saints!' cried she. Vanish, demon, and let me be free of you now and for ever. It will not suffice, said some of the mirthful party, unless the fountain of Trevi gushes with holy water. In fact, the exorcism was quite ineffectual upon the pertinacious demon, or whatever the apparition might be. Still he washed his brown bony taloons, still he peered into the vast basin, as if all the water of that great drinking-cup of Rome must needs be stained black or sanguine, and still he gesticulated to Miriam to follow his example. The spectators laughed loudly, but yet with a kind of constraint, for the creature's aspect was strangely repulsive and hideous. Miriam felt her arm seized violently by Donatello. She looked at him, and beheld a tiger-like fury gleaming from his wild eyes. "'Bid me drown him!' whispered he, shuddering between rage and horrible disgust. "'You shall hear his death gurgle in another instant!' "'Peace! Peace, Donatello!' said Miriam soothingly, for this naturally gentle and sportive being seemed all aflame with animal rage. "'Do him no mischief!' He is mad, and we are as mad as he, if we suffer ourselves to be disquieted by his antics. Let us leave him to bathe his hands till the fountain run dry, if he finds solace and pastime in it. What is it to you or me, Donatello? There, there, be quiet, foolish boy. Her tone and gesture were such as she might have used in taming down the wrath of a faithful hound that had taken upon himself to avenge some supposed affront to his mistress. She smoothed the young man's curls, for his fierce and sudden fury seemed to bristle among his hair, and touched his cheek with her soft palm till his angry mood was a little assuaged. "'Signorina, do I look as when you first knew me?' asked he with a heavy tremulous sigh, as they went onward, somewhat apart from their companions. "'Methinks there has been a change upon me these many months, 
and more and more these last few days the joy is gone out of my life all gone all gone feel my hand is it not very hot ah and my heart burns hotter still my poor donatello you are ill said miriam with deep sympathy and pity this melancholy and sickly rome is stealing away the rich joyous life that belongs to you go back my dear friend to your home among the hills where as i gather from what you have told me your days were filled with simple and blameless delights have you found aught in the world that is worth what you there enjoyed tell me truly donatello yes replied the young man and what in heaven's name asked she this burning pain in my heart said donatello for you are in the midst of it by this time they had left the fountain of trevi considerably behind them little further allusion was made to the scene at its margin for the party regarded miriam's persecutor as deceased in his wits and were hardly to be surprised by any eccentricity in his deportment threading several narrow streets they passed through the piazza of the holy apostles and soon came to trian's forum all over the surface of what once was rome it seems to be the effort of time to bury up the ancient city as if it were a corpse and he the sexton so that in eighteen centuries the soil over its grave has grown very deep by the slow scattering of dust and the accumulation of more modern decay upon older ruin this was the fate also of trajan's forum until some papal antiquary a few hundred years ago began to hollow it out again and disclosed the full height of the gigantic column red round with bas-reliefs of the old emperor's warlike deeds in the area before it stands a groove of stone consisting of the broken and unequal shafts of a vanished temple still keeping a majestic order and apparently incapable of further demolition the modern edifices of the piazza fully built no doubt out of the spoil of its old magnificence look down into the hollow space whence these pillars rise one of the immense grey granite shafts lay in the piazza on the verge of the area it was a great solid fact of the past making old rome actually sensible to the touch and eye and no study of history nor force of thought nor magic of song could so vitally assure us that rome once existed as this sturdy specimen of what its rulers and people wrought and see said kenyon laying his hands upon it there is still a polish remaining on the hard substance of the pillar and even now late as it is i can feel very sensibly the warmth of the noonday sun which did its best to heat it through this shaft will endure for ever the polish of eighteen centuries ago as yet but half rubbed off and the heat of to-day's sunshine lingering into the night seem almost equally ephemeral in relation to it there is comfort to be found in the pillar remarked miriam hard and heavy as it is lying here for ever as it will it makes all human trouble appear but a momentary annoyance and human happiness as evanescent too observed hilda sighing and beautiful art hardly less so i do not love to think that this dull stone merely by its massiveness will last infinitely longer than any picture in spite of the spiritual life that ought to give it immortality my poor little hilda said miriam kissing her compassionately would you sacrifice this greatest mortal consolation which we derive from the transitoriness of all things from the right of saying in every conjecture this too will pass away would you give up this unspeakable boon for the sake of making a picture eternal 
Their moralizing strain was interrupted by a demonstration from the rest of the party, who, after talking and laughing together, suddenly joined their voices and shouted at full pitch, Trajan, Trajan! Why do you deafen us with such an uproar? inquired Miriam. In truth, the whole piazza had been filled with their idle vociferation, the echoes from the surrounding houses reverberating the cry of Trajan on all sides, as if there was a great search for that imperial personage, and not so much as a handful of his ashes to be found. Why, it was a good opportunity to air our voices in this resounding piazza, replied one of the artists. Besides, we had really some hopes of summoning Tryon to look at his column, which, you know, he never saw in his lifetime. Here is your model, who they say lived and sinned before Tryon's death, still wandering about Rome, and why not the emperor of Tryon? dead emperors have very little delight in their columns i am afraid observed kenyon all that rich sculptor of tryon's bloody warfare twining from the base of the pillar to its capital may be but an ugly spectacle for his ghostly eyes if he considers that this huge storied shaft must be laid before the judgment seat as a piece of evidence of what he did in the flesh if ever I am employed to sculpture a hero's monument, I shall think of this as I put in the bas-reliefs of the pedestal. There are sermons in stones, said Hilda thoughtfully, smiling at Kenyon's morality, and especially in the stones of Rome. The party moved on, but deviated a little from the straight way, in order to glance at the ponderous remains of the temple of Mars Ultot within which a convent of nuns is now established, a dovecot in the war-god's mansion. At only a little distance they passed the portico of a temple of Minerva, most rich and beautiful in architecture, but woefully ignored by time and shattered by violence, besides being buried midway in the accumulation of soil that rises over dead Rome like a flood-tide. Within this edifice of antique sanctity, a baker's shop was now established, with an entrance on one side, for everywhere the remnants of old grandeur and divinity have been made available for the meanest necessities of today. "'The baker is just drawing his loaves out of the oven,' remarked Kenyon. "'Do you smell how sour they are?' I should fancy that Minerva, in revenge for the desecration of her temple, had slyly poured vinegar into the batch. If I did not know that the modern Romans prefer their bread in the acetous fermentation. They turned into the Via Alessandria, and thus gained the rear of the Temple of Peace, and passing beneath its great arches, pursued their way along a hedge-bordered lane. In all probability, a stately Roman street lay buried beneath that rustic-looking pathway, for they had now emerged from the close and narrow avenues of the modern city, and were treading on a soil where the seeds of antique grandeur had not yet produced the squalid crop that elsewhere sprouts from them. Grassy as the lane was, it skirted along heaps of shapeless ruin and the bare site of the vast temple that Hadrian planned and built. It terminated on the edge of a somewhat abrupt descent, at the foot of which, with a muddy ditch between, rose in the bright moonlight the great curving wall and multitudinous arches Volume 1, Chapter 17 of The Marble Form This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander The Marble Form by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 1, Chapter 17 
Miriam's Trouble As usual of a moonlight evening, several carriages stood at the entrance of this famous ruin, and the precincts and interior were anything but a solitude. The French sentinel on duty beneath the principal archway eyed our party curiously, but offered no obstacle to their admission. Within the moonlight filled and flooded the great empty space. It glowed upon tier about tier of ruined, grass-grown arches, and made them even too distinctly visible. The splendor of the revelation took away that inestimable effect of dimness and mystery by which the imagination might be assisted to build a grander structure than the Colosseum, and to shatter it with a more picturesque decay. Byron's celebrated description is better than the reality. He beheld the scene in his mind's eye, through the witchery of many intervening years, and faintly illuminated it as if with starlight, instead of this broad glow of moonshine. The party of our friends sat down, three or four of them on a prostrate column, another on a shapeless lump of marble, once a Roman altar, others on the steps of one of the Christian shrines. Gods and barbarians though they were, they chatted as gaily together as if they belonged to the gentle and pleasant race of people who now inhabit Italy. There was much pastime and gaiety just then in the area of the Colosseum, where so many gladiators and wild beasts had fought and died and where so much blood of Christian martyrs had been lapped up by that fiercest of wild beasts, the Roman populace of yore. Some youths and maidens were running merry races across the open space, and playing at hide-and-seek a little way within the duskiness of the ground tier of arches, whence now and then you could hear the half-shriek, half-laugh of a frolicsome girl whom the shadow had betrayed into a young man's arms. Elder groups were seated on the fragments of pillars and blocks of marble that lay round the verge of the arena, talking in the quick, short ripple of the Italian tongue. On the steps of the great black cross in the centre of the Colosseum sat a party, singing scraps of songs, with much laughter and merriment between the stanzas. It was a strange place for song and mirth. That black cross marks one of the special blood spots of the earth where thousands of times over the dying gladiator fell and more of human agony has been endured for the mere pastime of the multitude than on the breadth of many battlefields. From all this crime and suffering, however, the spot has derived a more than common sanctity. An inscription promises seven years' indulgence, seven years of remission from the pains of purgatory, and earlier enjoyment of heavenly bliss for each separate kiss imprinted on the black cross. What better use could be made of life after middle age? when the accumulated sins are many and the remaining temptations few, than to spend it all in kissing the black cross of the Colosseum. Besides its central consecration, the whole area has been made sacred by a range of shrines, which are erected round the circle, each commemorating some scene or circumstance of the Saviour's passion and suffering. In accordance with an ordinary custom, a pilgrim was making his progress from shrine to shrine upon his knees, and saying a penitential prayer at each. Light-footed girls ran across the path along which he crept, or sported with their friends close by the shrines where he was kneeling. The pilgrim took no heed, and the girls meant no irreverence for in Italy religion jostles along side by side with business and sport, after a fashion of its own, and people are accustomed to kneel down and pray, or see others praying, between two fits of merriment, or between two sins. To make an end of our description, 
a red twinkle of light was visible amid the breadth of shadow that fell across the upper part of the Colosseum. Now it glimmered through a line of arches, or through a broader gleam as it rose out of some profound abyss of ruin. Now it was muffled by a heap of shrubbery which had adventurously clambered to that dizzy height and so the red light kept ascending to loftier and loftier ranges of the structure, until it stood like a star where the blue sky rested against the Coliseum's topmost wall. It indicated a party of English or Americans paying the inevitable visit by moonlight and exalting themselves with raptures that were Byron's, not their own. Our company of artists sat on the fallen column, the pagan altar, and the steps of the Christian shrine, enjoying the moonlight and shadow, the present gaiety, and the gloomy reminiscences of the scene, in almost equal share. Artists indeed are lifted by the ideality of their pursuits a little way off the earth and are therefore able to catch the evanescent fragrance that floats in the atmosphere of life above the heads of the ordinary crowd. Even if they seem endowed with little imagination individually, yet there is a property, a gift, a talisman, common to their class, entitling them to partake somewhat more bountifully than other people in the thin delights of moonshine and romance. "'How delightful this is!' said Hilda, and she sighed for very pleasure. "'Yes,' said Kenyon, who sat on the column at her side. "'The Colosseum is far more delightful, as we enjoy it now, than when eighty thousand persons sat squeezed together, row above row, to see their fellow creatures torn by lions and tigers, limb from limb. What a strange thought that the Coliseum was really built for us, and has not come to its best uses till almost two thousand years after it was finished. The Emperor Vespasian scarcely had us in his mind, said Hilda, smiling, but I thank him none the less for building it. He gets small thanks, I fear, from the people whose bloody instincts he pampered, rejoined Kenyon. Fancy a nightly assemblage of eighty thousand melancholy and remorseful ghosts looking down from those tiers of broken arches, striving to repent of the savage pleasures which they once enjoyed, but still longing to enjoy them over again. You bring a gothic horror into this peaceful moonlight scene, said Hilda. Nay, I have good authority for peopling the Colosseum with phantoms, replied the sculptor. Do you remember that veritable scene in Benvenuto Cellini's autobiography, in which a necromancer of his acquaintance draws a magic circle, just where the black cross stands now, I suppose, and raises myriads of demons? Benvenuto saw them with his own eyes. Giants, pygmies, and other creatures of frightful aspect, capering and dancing on yonder walls. Those spectres must have been Romans in their lifetime, and frequenters of this bloody amphitheatre. I see a spectre now, said Hilda with a little thrill of uneasiness. Have you watched that pilgrim who is going round the whole circle of shrines on his knees? and praying with such fervency at every one, now that he has revolved so far in his orbit, and has the moonshine on his face as he turns towards us, methinks I recognize him. And so do I, said Kenyon. Poor Miriam, do you think she sees him? They looked round, and perceived that Miriam had risen from the steps of the shrine, and disappeared. She had shrunk back, in fact, into the deep obscurity of an arch that opened just behind them. Donatello, whose faithful watch was no more to be eluded than that of a hound, had stolen after her, and became the innocent witness of a spectacle that had its own kind of horror. 
unaware of his presence and fancying herself fully unseen the beautiful miriam began to gesticulate extravagantly gnashing her teeth flinging her arms wildly abroad stamping with her foot it was as if she had stepped aside for an instant solely to snatch the relief of a brief fit of madness persons in acute trouble or laboring under strong excitement with a necessity for concealing it are prone to relieve their nerves in this wild way although when practicable they find a more effectual solace in shrieking aloud thus as soon as she threw off her self-control under the dusky arches of the Colosseum, we may consider miriam as a mad woman concentrating the elements of a long insanity into that instant signorina signorina have pity on me cried donatello approaching her this is too terrible how dare you look at me exclaimed miriam with a start then whispering below her breath men have been struck dead for a less offence if you desire it or need it said donatello humbly i shall not be loath to die donatello said miriam coming close to the young man and speaking low but still the almost insanity of the moment vibrating in her voice if you love yourself if you desire those earthly blessings such as you of all men were made for if you would come to a good old age among your olive orchards and your tuscan vines as your forefathers did if you would leave children to enjoy the same peaceful happy innocent life then flee from me look not behind you get you gone without another word he gazed sadly at her but did not stir i tell you miriam went on there is a great evil hanging over me i know it i see it in the sky i feel it in the air it will overwhelm me as utterly as if this arch should crumble down upon our heads it will crush you too if you stand at my side depart then and make the sign of the cross as your faith bids you when an evil spirit is nigh cast me off or you are lost for ever a higher sentiment brightened upon donatello's face than had hitherto seemed to belong to its simple expression and sensuous beauty i will never quit you he said you cannot drive me from you poor donatello said miriam in a changed tone and rather to herself than him is there no other that seeks me out follows me is obstinate to share my affliction and my doom but only you they call me beautiful and i used to fancy that at my need i could bring the whole world to my feet and lo here is my utmost need and my beauty and my gifts have brought me only this poor simple boy half-witted they call him and surely fit for nothing but to be happy and i accept his aid to-morrow to-morrow i will tell him all ah what a sin to stain his joyous nature with the blackness of a woe like mine she held out her hand to him and smiled sadly as donatello pressed it to his lips they were now about to emerge from the depth of the arch but just then the kneeling pilgrim in his revolution round the orbit of the shrines had reached the one on the steps of which miriam had been sitting there as at the other shrines he prayed or seemed to pray it struck kenyon however who sat close by and saw his face distinctly that the suppliant was merely performing an enjoyed penance and without the penitence that ought to have given it effectual life even as he knelt his eyes wandered and miriam soon felt that he had detected her half hidden as she was within the obscurity of the arch he is evidently a good catholic however 
whispered one of the party. After all, I fear we cannot identify him with the ancient pagan who haunts the catacombs. The doctors of the propaganda may have converted him, said another. They have had fifteen hundred years to perform the task. The company now deemed it time to continue their ramble. Emerging from a side entrance of the Coliseum, they had on their left the Arch of Constantine, and above it the shapeless ruins of the Palace of the Caesars, portions of which have taken shape anew in medieval convents and modern villas. They turned their faces cityward, and treading over the broad flagstones of the old Roman pavement, passed through the Arch of Titus. The moon shone brightly enough within it, to show the seven-branched Jewish candlestick cut in the marble of the interior. The original of that awful trophy lies buried at this moment in the yellow mud of the Tiber, and, could its gold of Ophir again be brought to light, it would be the most precious relic of past ages in the estimation of both Jew and Gentile. Standing amid so much ancient dust, it is difficult to spare the reader the commonplaces of enthusiasm on which hundreds of tourists have already insisted. Over this half-worn pavement, and beneath this arch of Titus, the Roman armies had trodden in their outward march, to fight battles of words with away, returning victorious with royal captives and inestimable spoil a roman triumph that most gorgeous pageant of earthly pride had streamed and flaunted in hundredfold succession over these same flagstones and through this yet stalwart archway it is politic however to make few allusions to such a past nor if we would create an interest in the characters of our story is it wise to suggest how cicero's foot may have stepped on yonder stone or how Horace was wont to stroll nearby, making his footsteps chime with the measure of the ode that was ringing in his mind. The very ghosts of that massive and stately epoch have so much density that the actual people of today seem the thinner of the two, and stand more ghost-like by the arches and columns, letting the rich sculpture be discerned through their ill-compacted substance. The party kept onward, often meeting pairs and groups of midnight strollers like themselves. On such a moonlight night as this, Rome keeps itself awake and stirring, and is full of song and pastime. The noise of which mingles with your dreams, if you have gone betimes to bed. But it is better to be abroad, and take our own share of the enjoyable time, for the languor that weighs so heavily in the Roman atmosphere by day is lightened beneath the moon and stars. They had now reached the precincts of the forest. Volume 1, Chapter 18 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 1, Chapter 18. On the Edge of the Precipice. Let us settle it, said Kenyon, stamping his foot firmly down, that this is precisely the spot where the chasm opened, into which Curtius precipitated his good steed and himself. Imagine the great dusky gap, impenetrably deep, and with half-shaped monsters and hideous faces looming upward out of it, to the vast affright of the good citizens who peeped over the brim. There now is a subject hitherto unthought of, for a grim and ghastly story, and methinks, with a moral as deep as the gulf itself. Within it, beyond a question, there were prophetic visions, intimations of all the future calamities of Rome, shades of Goths and Gauls, and even of the French soldiers of today. It was a pity to close it up so soon. I would give much for a peep into such a chasm.' 
I fancy, remarked Miriam, that every person takes a peep into it in moments of gloom and despondency, that is to say, in his moments of deepest insight. Where is it, then? asked Tilda. I never peeped into it. Wait, and it will open for you, replied her friend. The chasm was merely one of the orifices of that pit of blackness that lies beneath us everywhere. The firmest substance of human happiness is but a thin crust spread over it, with just reality enough to bear up the elusive stage scenery amid which we tread. It needs no earthquake to open the chasm. A footstep, a little heavier than ordinary, will serve, and we must step very daintily not to break through the crust at any moment. By and by we inevitably sink. It was a foolish piece of heroism and courteous to precipitate himself there in advance, for all Rome, you see, had been swallowed up in that gulf in spite of him. The palace of the Caesars had gone down thither, with the hollow, rumbling sound of its fragments. All the temples have tumbled into it, and thousands of statues have been thrown after. All the armies and the triumphs have marched into the great chasm with their martial music playing, as they stepped over the brink. All the heroes and statesmen and the poets, all piled upon poor Curtius, who thought to have saved them all. I am loath to smile at the self-conceit of that gallant horseman, but I cannot well avoid it. It grieves me to hear you speak thus, Miriam, said Hilda, whose natural and cheerful piety was shocked by her friend's gloomy view of human destinies. It seems to me that there is no chasm, nor any hideous emptiness under our feet, except what the evil within us digs. If there be such a chasm, let us bridge it over with good thoughts and deeds, and we shall tread safely to the other side. It was the guilt of Rome, no doubt, that caused this gulf to open, and Curtius filled it up with his heroic self-sacrifice and patriotism, which was the best virtue that the old Romans knew. Every wrong thing makes the gulf deeper. Every right one helps to fill it up. As the evil of Rome was far more than its good, the whole commonwealth finally sank into it, indeed, but of no original necessity. "'Well, Hilda, it came to the same thing at last,' answered Miriam despondingly. "'Doubtless, too,' resumed the sculptor, for his imagination was greatly excited by the idea of this wondrous chasm. "'All the blood that the Romans shed, whether on battlefields or in the Colosseum or on the cross, in whatever public or private murder, ran into this fatal gulf, and formed a mighty subterranean lake of gore right beneath our feet. The blood from the thirty wounds in Caesar's breast flowed hitherward.' and that pure little rivulet from Virginia's bosom, too. Virginia, beyond all question, was stabbed by her father, precisely where we are standing. Then the spot is hallowed forever, said Hilda. Is there such blessed potency in bloodshed? asked Miriam. Nay, Hilda, do not protest. I take your meaning rightly. They again moved forward, and still, from the form and the Via Sacra, from beneath the arches of the Temple of Peace, on one side, and the acclivity of the palace of the Caesars on the other, there arose singing voices of parties that were strolling through the moonlight. Thus the air was full of kindred melodies that encountered one another, and twined themselves into a broad, vague music, out of which no single strain could be disentangled. These good examples, as well as the harmonious influence of the hour, incited our artist friends to make proof of their own vocal powers. With what skill and breath they had, they set up a choral strain, Hail Columbia, we believe, which those old Roman echoes must have found it exceedingly difficult to repeat aright. Even Hilda poured the slender sweetness of her note into her country's song. Miriam was at first silent, being perhaps unfamiliar with the air and burden, but suddenly she threw out such a swell and gush of sound that it seemed to pervade the whole choir of other voices, and then to rise above them all, and become audible in what would else have been the silence of an upper region. That volume of melodious voice was one of the tokens of a great trouble. There had long been an impulse upon her, amounting at last to a necessity to shriek aloud, but she had struggled against it till the thunderous anthem gave her an opportunity to relieve her heart by a great cry. They passed the solitary column of focus and looked down into the excavated space, where a confusion of pillars, arches, pavements, and shattered blocks and shafts, the crumbs of various ruin dropped from the devouring maw of time, stand or lie at the base of the Capitoline Hill. That renowned hillock, for it is little more, now arose abruptly above them. The ponderous masonry with which the hillside is built up is as old as Rome itself, and looks like to endure while the world retains any substance or permanence. 
It once sustained the capital and now bears up the great pile which the medieval builders raised on the antique foundation, and that still loftier tower which looks abroad upon a large page of deeper historic interest than any other scene can show. On the same pedestal of Roman masonry, other structures will doubtless rise and vanish like ephemeral things. To a spectator on the spot, it is remarkable that the events of Roman history and Roman life itself appear not so distant as the Gothic ages which succeeded them. We stand in the form or on the height of the capital and seem to see the Roman epoch close at hand. We forget that a chasm extends between it and ourselves, in which lie all those dark, rude, unlettered centuries, around the birth time of Christianity as well as the age of chivalry and romance, the feudal system and the infancy of a better civilization than that of Rome. Or, if we remember those medieval times, they look further off than the Augustan age. The reason may be that the old Roman literature survives and creates for us an intimacy with the classic ages, which we have no means of forming with the subsequent ones. The Italian climate, moreover, robs age of its reverence and makes it look newer than it is. Not the Colosseum, nor the tombs of the Appian Way, nor the oldest pillar in the Forum, nor any other Roman ruin, be it as dilapidated as it may, ever give the impression of venerable antiquity which we gather, along with the ivy, from the grey walls of an English abbey or castle. And yet every brick or stone which we pick up among the former had fallen ages before the foundation of the latter was begun. This is owing to the kindliness with which nature takes an English ruin to her heart, covering it with ivy as tenderly as Robin Redbreast covered the dead babes with forest leaves. She strives to make it a part of herself, gradually obliterating the handiwork of man and supplanting it with her own mosses and trailing verdure, till she has won the whole structure back. But in Italy, whenever man has once hewn a stone, nature forthwith relinquishes her right to it, and never lays her finger on it again. Age after age finds its bare and naked in the barren sunshine, and leaves it so. Besides this natural disadvantage, too, each succeeding century in Rome has done its best to ruin the very ruins, so far as their picturesque effect is concerned, by stealing away the marble and hewn stone, and leaving only yellow bricks which never can look venerable. The party ascended the winding way that leads from the Forum to the piazza of the Camp de Doglio on the summit of the Capitoline Hill. They stood a while to contemplate the bronze equestrian statue of Marcus Aurelius. The moonlight glistened upon traces of the gilding that had once covered both rider and steed. These were almost gone, but the aspect of the dignity was still perfect clothing the figure as it were with an imperial robe of light it is the most majestic representation of the kingly character that ever the world has seen a sight of the old heathen emperor is enough to create an evanescent sentiment of loyalty even in the democratic bosom so august does he look so fit to rule so worthy of man's profoundest homage and obedience so inevitably attractive of his love he stretches forth his hand with an air of grand beneficence and unlimited authority as if uttering a decree from which no appeal was permissible but in which the obedient subject would find his highest interests consulted a command that was in itself a benediction the sculpture of the statue knew what a king should be observed kenyon and knew likewise the heart of mankind and how it craves a true ruler under whatever title as a child its father oh if there were but one such man as this exclaimed miriam one such man in an age and one in all the world then how speedily would the strife wickedness and sorrow of us poor creatures be relieved we would come to him with our griefs whatever they might be even a poor frail woman burdened with her heavy heart and lay them at his feet and never need to take them up again the rightful king would see to all what an idea of the regal office and duty said kenyon with a smile it is a woman's idea of the whole matter to perfection. It is Hilda's, too, no doubt. No, answered the quiet Hilda. I should never look for such assistance from an earthly king. Hilda, my religious Hilda, whispered Miriam, suddenly drawing the girl close to her. Do you know how it is with me? I will give all I have or hope, my life, oh, how freely, for one instant of your trust in God. You little guess my need of it. You really think, then, that he sees and cares for us? Miriam, you frighten me. 
"'Hush, hush, do not let them hear yet,' whispered Miriam. "'I frighten you, you say. For heaven's sakes, how? Am I strange? Is there anything wild in my behavior? "'Only for that moment,' replied Hilda, "'because you seem to doubt God's providence. "'We will talk of that another time,' said her friend. "'Just now it is very dark to me.' On the left of the piazza of the Camp Pedaglio, as you face cityward, and at the head of the long and stately flight of steps descending from the Capitoline Hill to the level of Lower Rome, there is a narrow lane or passage. Into this the party of our friends now turned. The path ascended a little and ran along under the walls of a palace, but soon passed through a gateway and terminated in a small paved courtyard. It was bordered by a low parapet. The spot, for some reason or other, impressed them as exceedingly lonely. On one side was the great height of the palace, with the moonshine falling over it, and showing all the windows barred and shuttered. Not a human eye could look down into the little courtyard, even if the seemingly deserted palace had a tenant. On all other sides of its narrow compass there was nothing but the parapet, which, as it now appeared, was built right on the edge of a steep precipice. Gazing from its eminent brow, the party beheld a crowded confusion of roofs spreading over the whole space between them and the line of hills that lay beyond the Tiber. A long, misty wreath, just dense enough to catch a little of the moonshine, floated above the houses, midway towards the hilly line, and showed the course of the unseen river. Far away on the right, the moon gleamed on the dome of St. Peter's, as well as on many lesser and nearer domes. "'What a beautiful view of the city!' exclaimed Hilda. "'And I never saw Rome from this point before. "'It ought to afford a good prospect,' said the sculptor, "'for it was from this point, at least we are at liberty to think so if we choose, "'that many a famous Roman caught his last glimpse of his native city, "'and of all other earthly things. "'This is one of the sides of the Tarpian Rock.' Look over the parapet and see what a sheer tumble there might still be for a traitor, in spite of the thirty feet of soil that have accumulated at the foot of the precipice. They all bent over and saw that the cliff fell perpendicularly downward to about the depth, or rather more, at which the tall palace rose in height above their heads. Not that it was still the natural shaggy front of the original precipice, for it appeared to be cased in ancient stonework through which the primeval rock showed its face here and there grimly and doubtfully mosses grew on the slight projections and little shrubs sprouted out of the crevices but could not much soften the stern aspect of the cliff brightly as the italian moonlight fell it down the height it scarcely showed what portion of it was man's work and what was nature's but left it all in very much the same kind of ambiguity and half knowledge in which antiquarians generally leave the identity of roman remains the roofs of some poor-looking houses which had been built against the base and sides of the cliff rose nearly midway to the top but from an angle of the parapet there was a precipitous plunge straight downward into the stone-paved court i prefer this to any other site as having been veritably the traitor's leap said kenyon because it was so convenient to the capital it was an admirable idea of those stern old fellows to fling their political criminals down from the very summit on which stood the senate house and jove's temple emblems of the institutions which they sought to violate it symbolizes how sudden was the fall in those days from the utmost height of ambition to the profoundest ruin come come it is midnight cried another artist too late to be moralizing here we are literally dreaming on the edge of a precipice let us go home it is time indeed said hilda the sculptor was not without hopes that he might be favoured with the sweet charge of escorting hilda to the foot of her tower accordingly when the party prepared to turn back he offered her his arm hilda at first accepted it but when they had partly threaded the passage between the little courtyard and the piazza del campidaglio she discovered that miriam had remained behind i must go back said she withdrawing her arm from kenyon's but pray do not come with me several times this evening i have had a fancy that miriam had something on her mind some sorrow or perplexity which perhaps it would believe her to tell me about no no do not turn back donatello will be a sufficient guardian for miriam and me the sculptor was a good deal mortified and perhaps a little angry but he knew hilda's mood of gentle decision and independence too well not to obey her he therefore suffered the fearless maiden to return alone
Meanwhile, Miriam had not noticed the departure of the rest of the company. She remained on the edge of the precipice, and Donatello along with her. It will be a fatal fall still, she said to herself, looking over the parapet, and shuddering as her eye measured the depth. Yes, surely, yes, even without the weight of an overburdened heart, a human body would fall heavily enough upon those stones to shake all its joints asunder. How soon it would be over! Donatello, of whose presence she was possibly not aware, now pressed closer to her side, and he too, like Miriam, bent over the low parapet and trembled violently. Yet he seemed to feel that perilous fascination which haunts the brow of precipices, tempting the unwary one to fling himself over to the very horror of the thing. For, after drawing hastily back, he again looked down, thrusting himself out farther than before. He then stood silent a brief space, struggling, perhaps, to make himself conscious of the historic associations of the scene. "'What are you thinking of, Donatello?' asked Miriam. "'Who are they?' said he, looking earnestly in her face, "'who have been flung over here in days gone by. "'Men that cumbered the world,' she replied, "'men whose lives were the bane of their fellow creatures, "'men who poisoned the air, which is a common breath of all, "'for their own selfish purposes. "'There was short work with such men in old Roman times, just in the moment of their triumph, a hand, as of an avenging giant, clutched them, and dashed the wretches down this precipice. Was it well done? asked the young man. It was well done, answered Miriam. Innocent persons were saved by the destruction of a guilty one who deserved his doom. While this brief conversation passed, Donatello had once or twice glanced aside with a watchful air, just as a hound may often be seen to take sidelong note of some suspicious object, while he gives his most direct attention to something nearer at hand. Miriam seemed now first to become aware of the silence that had followed upon the cheerful talk and laughter of a few moments before. Looking round, she perceived that all her company of merry friends had retired, and Hilda, too, in whose soft and quiet presence she had always an indescribable feeling of security. All gone, and only herself and Donatello left hanging over the brow of the ominous precipice. Not so, however, not entirely alone. In the basement wall of the palace, shaded from the moon, there was a deep, empty niche that had probably once contained a statue. Not empty, either, for a figure now came forth from it and approached Miriam. She must have had cause to dread some unspeakable evil from this strange persecutor, and to know that this was the very crisis of her calamity, for as he drew near, such a cold, sick despair crept over her that it impeded her breath, and benumbed her natural promptitude of thought. Miriam seemed dreamily to remember falling on her knees, but in her whole recollection of that wild moment she beheld herself as in a dim show and could not well distinguish what was done and suffered, no, not even whether she was really an actor and sufferer in the scene. Hilda, meanwhile, had separated herself from the sculptor and turned back to rejoin her friend. At a distance she still heard the mirth of her late companions, who were going down the cityward descent of the Capitoline Hill. They had set up a new stave of melody, in which her own soft voice, as well as the powerful sweetness of Miriam's, was sadly missed. The door of the little courtyard had swung upon its hinges and partly closed itself. Hilda, whose native gentleness pervaded all her movements, was quietly opening it when she was startled, midway by the noise of a struggle within, beginning and ending all in one breathless instant. Along with it, or closely succeeding it, was a loud, fearful cry, which quivered upward through the air and sank quivering downward to the earth. Then a silence. Poor Hilda had looked into the courtyard and saw the whole quick passage. Volume 1, Chapter 19 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 1, Chapter 19. The Fawn's Transformation. The door of the courtyard swung slowly and closed itself of its own accord. Mariam and Donatello were now alone there. She clasped her hands and looked wildly at the young man, whose form seemed to have dilated and whose eyes blazed with the fierce energy that had suddenly inspired him. It had kindled him into a man. It had developed within him an intelligence which was no native characteristic of the Donatello whom we had heretofore known.
But that simple and joyous creature was gone for ever. What have you done? said Miriam in a horror stricken whisper. The glow of rage was still lurid on Donatello's face and now flashed out again from his eyes. I did what ought to be done to a traitor, he replied. I did what your eyes bade me to do when I asked them with mine, as I held the wretch over the precipice. These last words struck Miriam like a bullet. Could it be so? Had her eyes provoked or assented to this deed? She had not known it, but alas, looking back into the frenzy and turmoil of the scene just acted, she could not deny. She was not sure whether it might be so or no. What a wild joy had flamed up in her heart when she beheld her persecutor in his mortal peril. Was it horror or ecstasy or both in one? Be the emotion what it might, it had blazed up more madly when Donatello flung his victim off the cliff. And more and more, while a shriek went quivering downward, with a dead thump upon the stones below had come an unutterable horror. And my eyes bade you to do it, she repeated. They both leaned over the parapet and gazed downward as earnestly as if some inestimable treasure had fallen over, and were yet recoverable. On the pavement below was a dark mass, lying in a heap, with little or nothing human in its appearance, except that the hands were stretched out as if they might have clutched for a moment at the small square stones. But there was no motion in them now. Miriam watched the heap of mortality while she could count a hundred, which she took pains to do. No stir, not a finger moved. "'You have killed him, Donatello. He's quite dead,' said she. "'Stone dead. Would I were so, too?' "'Did you not mean that he should die?' sternly asked Donatello, still in the glow of that intelligence which passion had developed in him. "'There was short time to weigh the matter, but he had his trial in that breath or two while I held him over the cliff, and a sentence in that one glance when your eyes responded to mine. Say that I have slain him against your will. Say that he died without your whole consent, and in another breath you shall see me lying beside him.' Oh, never, cried Miriam, my one own friend. Never, never, never. She turned to him, the guilty, blood-stained, lonely woman. She turned to her fellow criminal, the youth, so lately innocent, whom she had drawn into her doom. She pressed him close, close to her bosom, with a clinging embrace that brought their two hearts together, to the horror and agony of each was combined into one motion, and that a kind of rapture. Natella, you speak the truth, said she. My heart consented to what you did. We two slew yonder wretch. The deed knots us together for time and eternity like the coil of a serpent. They threw one other glance at the heap of death below to assure themselves that it was there. So like a dream was the whole thing. Then they turned from that fatal precipice and came out of the courtyard arm in arm, heart in heart. Instinctively, they were heedful not to sever themselves so much as a pace or two from one another, for fear of the terror and deadly chill that would thenceforth wait for them in solitude. Their deed, the crime which Donatello wrought and Miriam accepted on the instant, had wreathed itself, as she said, like a serpent, in inextricable links about both their souls, and drew them into one, by its terrible contractile power. It was closer than a marriage bond. So intimate in those first moments was the union, that it seemed as if their new sympathy annihilated all other ties, and that they were released from the chain of humanity. A new sphere, a special law, had been created for them alone. The world could not come near them. They were safe." When they reached the flight of steps leading downward from the capital, there was a far-off noise of singing and laughter. Swift indeed had been the rush of the crisis that was come and gone. This was still the merriment of the party that had so recently been their companions. They recognized the voices which, a little while ago, had accorded and sung in cadence with their own. But they were familiar voices no more. They sounded strangely and as it were, out of the depths of space, so remote was all that pertained to the past life of these guilty ones, in the moral seclusion that had suddenly extended itself around them. But how close and ever closer did the breath of the immeasurable waste, that lay between them and all brotherhood or sisterhood, now press them one within the other. O oh, friend, cried Miriam, so putting her soul into the word that it took heavy richness of meaning, and seemed never to have been spoken before. O oh, friend, are you conscious, as I am, of this companionship that knits our heart strings together? I feel it, Miriam, said Donatello. We draw one breath. We live one life. Only yesterday, continued Miriam, nay, only a short half hour ago, I shivered in an icy solitude. No friendship, no sisterhood, could come near enough to keep the warmth within my heart. In an instant all is changed. There can be no more loneliness." "'None, Miriam,' said Donatello. "'None, my beautiful one,' responded Miriam. 
gazing at his face, which had taken a higher, almost a heroic aspect from the strength of passion. None, my innocent one. Surely it is no crime that we have committed. One wretched and worthless life has been sacrificed to cement two other lives for evermore. Forevermore, Miriam, said Donatello, cemented with his blood. The young man started at the word which he had himself spoken. It may be that it brought home to the simplicity of his imagination what he had not before dreamed of, the ever-increasing loathsomeness of a union that consists in gulf. Cemented with blood, which were corrupt and grow more noisome for ever and for ever, but bind them none the less strictly for that. Forget it. Cast it all behind you, said Miriam, detecting by her sympathy the pang that was in his heart. The deed has done its office and has no existence any more. They flung the past behind them as she counseled, or else distilled from it a fiery intoxication which sufficed to carry them triumphantly through those first moments of their doom. For guilt has its moments of rapture, too. The foremost result of a broken law is ever an ecstatic sense of freedom. And thus there exhaled upward, out of their dark sympathy at the base of which lay a human corpse, a bliss or an insanity, which the unhappy pair imagined to be well worth the sleepy innocence that was forever lost to them. As their spirits rose to the solemn madness of the occasion, they went onward, not stealthily, not fearfully, but with a stately gait and aspect. Passion lent them, as it does to meaner shapes, its brief nobility of carriage. They trod through the streets of Rome, as if they too were among the majestic and guilty shadows, that from ages long gone by have haunted the blood-stained city. And, at Miriam's suggestion, they turned aside, for the sake of treading loftily past the old site of Pompey's Forum. "'For there was a great deed done here,' she said, "'a deed of blood like ours. "'Who knows but we may meet the high and ever-sad fraternity "'of Caesar's murderers and exchange a salutation. "'Are they our brethren now?' asked Donatello. "'Yes, all of them,' said Miriam. "'And many another whom the world little dreams of "'has been made our brother or our sister "'by what we have done within this hour.' "'And at the thought she shivered. "'Where then was the seclusion, the remoteness, the strange, lonesome paradise, "'into which she and her one companion had been transported by their crime? "'Was there indeed no such refuge, but only a crowded thoroughfare and jostling throng of criminals? "'And was it true that whatever hand had a blood stain on it, or had poured out poison, "'or strangled a babe at its birth, or clutched a grandsire's throat, "'he sleeping, and robbed him of his few last breaths?' had now the right to offer itself in fellowship with their two hands? Too certainly that right existed. It is a terrible thought that an individual wrongdoing melts into the great mass of human crime, and makes us, who dreamed only of our own little separate sin, makes us guilty of the whole. And thus Miriam and her lover were not an insulated pair, but members of an innumerable confraternity of guilty ones, all shuddering at each other. "'But not now, not yet,' she murmured to herself. "'Tonight, at least, there shall be no remorse. "'Wandering without a purpose, it so chanced that they turned into a street "'at one extremity of which stood Hilda's tower. "'There was a light in her high chamber, a light, too, at the virgin shrine, "'and the glimmer of these two was the loftiest light beneath the stars. "'Miriam drew Donatello's arm to make him stop, "'and while they stood at some distance looking at Hilda's window, "'they beheld her approach and throw it open. "'She leaned far forth and extended her clasp hands towards the sky. The good pure child, she is praying, Donatello, said Miriam, with a kind of simple joy at witnessing the devoutness of her friend. Then her own sin rushed upon her, and she shouted with the rich strength of her voice, Pray for us, Hilda, we need it. Whether Hilda heard and recognized the voice, we cannot tell. The window was immediately closed, and her form disappeared from behind the Volume 1, Chapter 20 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 1, Chapter 20. The Burial Chant. The Church of the Capuchins, where, as a reader may remember, some of our acquaintances had made an engagement to meet, stands a little aside from the Piazza Barberini. Thither, at the hour agreed upon, on the morning after the scenes last described, Miriam and Donatello directed their steps. At no time are people so sedulously careful to keep their trifling appointments, attend to their ordinary occupations, and thus put a commonplace aspect on life, 
as when conscious of some secret that, if suspected, would make them look monstrous in the general eye. Yet how tame and wearisome is the impression of all ordinary things in the contrast of such a fact! How sick and tremulous the next morning is the spirit that has dared so much only the night before! How icy cold is the heart when the fervor, the wild ecstasy of passion, has faded away, and sunk down among the dead ashes of the fire that blazed so fiercely, and was fed by the very substance of its life! how faintly does the criminal stagger onward lacking the impulse of that strong madness that hurried him into guilt and treacherously deserts him in the midst of it when miriam and donatello drew near the church they found only kenyon awaiting them on the steps hilda had likewise promised to be of the party but had not yet appeared meeting the sculptor Miriam put a force upon herself and succeeded in creating an artificial flow of spirits which to any but the nicest observation was quite as effective as a natural one she spoke sympathizingly to the sculptor on the subject of hilda's absence and somewhat annoyed him by alluding in donatello's hearing to the attachment which had never been openly avowed though perhaps plainly enough betrayed he fancied that miriam did not quite recognize the limits of the strictest delicacy he even went so far as to generalize and conclude within himself that this deficiency is a more general failing in woman than in man the highest refinement being a masculine attribute but the idea was unjust to the sex at large and especially so to this poor miriam who was hardly responsible for her frantic efforts to be gay possibly moreover the nice action of the mind is set ajar by any violent shock as of great misfortune or great crime so that the finer perceptions may be blurred thenceforth and the effect be traceable in all the minutest conduct of life did you see anything of the dear child after you left us asked miriam still keeping hilda as her topic of conversation i missed her sadly on my way homeward for nothing ensures me such delightful and innocent dreams i have experienced it twenty times as the talk late in the evening with hilda so i should imagine said the sculptor gravely but it is an advantage that i have little or no opportunity of enjoying i know not what became of hilda after my parting from you she was not especially my companion in any part of our walk the last i saw of her she was hastening back to rejoin you in the courtyard of the palazzo caffarelli impossible cried miriam starting then did you not see her again inquired kenyon in some alarm not there answered miriam quietly indeed i followed pretty closely on the heels of the rest of the party but do not be alarmed on hilda's account the virgin is bound to watch over the good child for the sake of the piety with which she keeps a lamp alight at her shrine and besides i have always felt that hilda is just as safe in these evil streets of rome as her white doves when they fly downwards from the tower top and run to and fro among the horses feet there is certainly a providence on purpose for hilda if for no other human creature i religiously believe it rejoined the sculptor and yet my mind would be the easier if i knew that she had returned safely to her tower then make yourself quite easy answered miriam i saw her and it is this last sweet sight that i remember leaning from her window midway between earth and sky kenyon now looked at donatello you see motor spirits my dear friend he observed this languid roman atmosphere is not the airy wine that you were accustomed to breathe at home i have not forgotten your hospitable invitation to meet you this summer at your castle among the apennines it is my fixed purpose to come i assure you we shall both be the better for some deep droughts of the mountain breezes it may be said donatello with unwonted sombreness the old house seemed joyous when i was a child but as i remember it now it was a grim place too the sculpture looked more attentively at the young man and was surprised and alarmed to observe how entirely the fine fresh glow of animal spirits had departed out of his face hitherto moreover even while he was standing perfectly still there had been a kind of possible gambol indicated in his aspect it was quite gone now all his youthful gaiety and with it his simplicity of manner was eclipsed if not utterly extinct you are surely ill my dear fellow exclaimed kenyon am i perhaps so said donatello indifferently i never have been ill and know not what it may be do not make the poor lad fancy sink whispered miriam pulling the sculptor's sleeve he is of a nature to lie down and die at once if he finds himself drawing such melancholy breaths as we ordinary people are enforced to burden our lungs withal but we must get him away from this old dreamy and dreary rome where nobody but himself ever thought of being gay 
Its influences are too heavy to sustain the life of such a creature. The above conversation had passed chiefly on the steps of the Capuccini, and having said so much, Miriam lifted the leathern curtain that hangs before all church doors in Italy. Hilda has forgotten her appointment, she observed, or else her maiden slumbers are very sound this morning. We will wait for her no longer. They entered the nave. The interior of the church was of moderate compass, but of good architecture, with vaulted roof over the nave and a row of dusky chapels on either side of it instead of the customary side aisles each chapel had its saintly shrine hung round with offerings its picture above the altar although closely veiled if by any painter of renown and its hallowed tapers burning continually to set alight the devotion of the worshippers the pavement of the nave was chiefly of marble and looked old and broken and was shabbily patched here and there with tiles of brick it was inlaid moreover with tombstones of the medieval taste on which were quaintly sculptured borders figures and portraits in bas-relief and latin epitaphs now grown illegible by the tread of footsteps over them the church appertains to a convent of capuchin monks and as usually happens when a reverend brotherhood have such an edifice in charge the floor seemed never to have been scrubbed or swept and had as little the aspect of sanctity as a kennel whereas in all churches of nunneries the maiden sisterhood invariably show the purity of their own hearts by the virgin cleanliness and visible consecration of the walls and pavement as our friends entered the church their eyes rested at once on a remarkable object in the centre of the nave it was either the actual body or as might rather have been supposed at first glance the cunningly wrought waxen face and suitably draped figure of a dead monk this image of wax or clay cold reality whichever it might be lay on a slightly elevated bier with three tall candles burning on each side another tall candle at the head and another at the foot there was music too in harmony with so funereal a spectacle from beneath the pavement of the church came the deep lugubrious strain of a del profundis which sounded like an utterance of the tomb itself so dismally did it rumble through the burial vaults and ooze up among the flat gravestones and sad epitaphs filling the church as with a gloomy mist i must look more closely at that dead monk before we leave the church remarked the sculptor in the study of my art i have gained many a hint from the dead which the living could never have given me i can well imagine it answered miriam one clay image is readily copied from another but let us first see guido's picture the light is favorable now accordingly they turned into the first chapel on the right hand as you entered the nave and there they beheld not the picture indeed but a closely drawn curtain the churchmen of italy make no scruple of sacrificing the very purpose for which a work of sacred art has been created that of opening the way for religious sentiment through the quick medium of sight by bringing angels saints and martyrs down visible upon earth of sacrificing this high purpose and for aught they know the welfare of many souls along with it to the hope of a paltry fee every work by an artist of celebrity is hidden behind a veil and seldom revealed except to protestants who scorn it as an object of devotion and value it only for its artistic merit the sacristan was quickly found however and lost no time in disclosing the youthful archangel setting his divine foot on the head of his fallen adversary it was an image of that greatest of future events which we hope for so ardently at least while we are young but find so very long in coming the triumph of goodness over the evil principle where can hilda be exclaimed kenyon it is not her custom ever to fail in an engagement and the present one was made entirely on her account except her you know we were all agreed in our recollection of the picture but we were wrong and held a right you perceive said miriam directing his attention to the point on which the dispute of the night before had arisen it is not easy to detect her astray as regards any picture on which those clear soft eyes of hers have ever rested and she has studied and admired few pictures so much as this observed the sculptor no wonder for there is hardly another so beautiful in the world what an expression of heavenly severity in the archangel's face there is a degree of pain trouble and disgust at being brought in contact with sin even for the purpose of quelling and punishing it and yet a celestial tranquillity pervades his whole being i have never been able said miriam to admire this picture nearly so much as hilda does in its moral and intellectual aspect 
If it cost her more trouble to be good, if her soul were less white and pure, she would be a more competent critic of this picture, and would estimate it not half so high. I see its defects today more clearly than ever before. What are some of them? asked Kenyon. The archangel now, Miriam continued, how fair he looks with his unruffled wings with his unhacked sword and clad in his bright armour and that exquisitely fitting sky-blue tunic cut in the latest paradisiacal mode what a dainty air of the first celestial society with what half-scornful delicacy he sets his prettily sandaled foot on the head of his prostrate foe but is it thus that virtue looks the moment after its death struggle with evil no no i could have told guido better a full third of the archangel's feathers should have been torn from his wings, the rest all ruffled, till they looked like Satan's own. His sword should be streaming with blood, and perhaps broken halfway to the hilt. His armor crushed, his robes rent, his breast gory, a breathing gash on his brow, cutting right across the stern scowl of battle. He should press his foot hard down upon the old serpent, as if his very soul depended upon it feeling him squirm mightily, and doubting whether the fight were half over yet, and how the victory might turn. And with all this fierceness, this grimness, this unutterable horror, that should still be something high, tender, and holy in Michael's eyes, and around his mouth, but the battle never was such a child's play as Guido's dapper archangel seems to have found it. "'For heaven's sakes, Miriam,' said Kenyon, astonished at the walled energy of her talk, "'paint the picture of man's struggle against sin according to your own idea. "'I think it will be a masterpiece. "'The picture would have its share of truth, I assure you,' she answered. "'But I am sadly afraid the victory would fail on the wrong side. "'Just fancy a smoke-blackened, fiery-eyed demon bestriding that nice young angel, "'clutching his white throat with one of his hinder claws, "'and giving a triumphant whisk of his scaly tail, "'with a poisonous dart at the end of it. "'That is what they risk, poor souls, who do battle with Michael's enemy.' If now, perhaps, struck Miriam, that her mental disquietude was impelling her to an undue vivacity, for she paused and turned away from the picture, without saying a word more about it. All this while, moreover, Donatello had been very ill at ease, casting awe-stricken and inquiring glances at the dead monk, as if he could look nowhere but at the ghastly object, merely because it shocked him. Death is probably a peculiar horror and ugliness— when forced upon the contemplation of a person so naturally joyous as Donatello, who lived with completeness in the present moment, and was able to form but vague images of the future. "'What is the matter, Donatello?' whispered Miriam soothingly. "'You are quite in a tremble, my poor friend. What is it?' "'This awful chant from beneath the church,' answered Donatello. "'It oppresses me. The air is so heavy with it that I can scarcely draw my breath. "'And yonder dead monk, I feel as if he were lying right across my heart. "'Take courage,' whispered she again. "'Come, we will approach close to the dead monk. "'The only way in such cases is to stare the ugly horror right in the face. "'Never a sidelong glance, nor half-look, "'for those are what show a frightful thing in its frightfulest aspect. "'Lean on me, dearest friend. "'My heart is very strong for both of us be brave and all is well donatello hung back for a moment but then pressed close to miriam's side and suffered her to lead him up to the buyer the sculptor followed a number of persons chiefly women with several children among them were standing about the corpse and as our three friends drew nigh a mother knelt down and caused her little boy to kneel both kissing the beads and crucifix that hung from the monk's girdle Possibly he had died in the odor of sanctity. Volume 1, Chapter 21 of The Marble Fawn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 1. Chapter 21. The Dead Capuchin. The dead monk was clad as when alive, in the brown woolen frock of the Capuchins, with the hood drawn over his head, but so as to leave the features and a portion of the beard uncovered. His rosary and cross hung at his side, 
His hands were folded over his breast. His feet, he was of a barefooted order in his lifetime, and continued so in death, protruded from beneath his habit, stiff and stark, with a more waxen look than even his face. They were tied together at the ankles with a black ribbon. The countenance, as we have already said, was fully displayed. It had a purplish hue upon it, unlike the paleness of an ordinary corpse, but as little resembling the flush of natural life. The eyelids were but partially drawn down, and showed the eyeballs beneath, as if the deceased friar were stealing a glimpse at the bystanders to watch whether they were duly impressed with the solemnity of his obsequies. The shaggy eyebrows gave sternness to the look. Miriam passed between two of the lighted candles and stood close beside the bier. "'My God!' murmured she. "'What is this?' She grasped Donatello's hand, and at the same instant felt him give a convulsive shudder, which she knew to have been caused by a sudden and terrible throb of the heart. His hand, by an instantaneous change, became like ice within hers, which likewise grew so icy that their insensible fingers might have rattled one against the other. No wonder that their blood curdled, no wonder that their hearts leaped and paused. The dead face of the monk, gazing at them beneath its half-closed eyelids, was the same visage that had glared upon their naked souls the past midnight, as Donatello flung him over the precipice. The sculptor was standing at the foot of the bier, and had not yet seen the monk's features. "'Those naked feet,' said he, I know not why, but they affect me strangely. They have walked to and fro over the hard pavements of Rome, and through a hundred other rough ways of his life, where the monk went begging for his brotherhood, along the cloisters and dreary corridors of his convent too, from his youth upward. It is a suggestive idea to track those worn feet backward through all the paths they have trodden ever since they were the tender and rosy little feet of a baby, and, cold as they now are, were kept warm in his mother's hand. As his companions, whom the sculptor supposed to be close by him, made no response to his fanciful musing, he looked up and saw them at the head of the bier. He advanced thither himself. Ha! exclaimed he. He cast a horror-stricken and bewildered glance at Miriam, but withdrew it immediately. Not that he had any definite suspicion, or it may be even a remote idea, that she could be held responsible in the least degree for this man's sudden death. In truth, it seemed too wild a thought to connect. In reality, Miriam's persecutor of many past months, and the vagabond of the preceding night, with the dead capuchin of to-day. It resembled one of those unaccountable changes and interminglings of identity, which so often occur among the personages of a dream. But Kenyon, as befitted the professor of an imaginative art, was endowed with an exceedingly quick sensibility, which was apt to give him intimations of the true state of matters that lay beyond his actual vision. There was a whisper in his ear. It said, Hush! Without asking himself wherefore, he resolved to be silent as regarded the mysterious discovery which he had made, and to leave any remark or exclamation to be voluntarily offered by Miriam. If she never spoke, then let the riddle be unsolved. And now occurred a circumstance that would seem too fantastic to be told if it had not actually happened precisely as we set it down. As the three friends stood by the bier, they saw that a little stream of blood had begun to ooze from the dead monk's nostrils. It crept slowly towards the thicket of his beard, where, in the course of a moment or two, it hid itself. "'How strange!' ejaculated Kenyon. "'The monk died of apoplexy, I suppose.' or by some sudden accident, 
and the blood has not yet congealed. Do you consider that a sufficient explanation? asked Miriam, with a smile from which the sculptor involuntarily turned away his eyes. Does it satisfy you? And why not? he inquired. Of course, you know the old superstition about this phenomenon of blood flowing from a dead body, she rejoined. How can we tell but that the murderer of this monk, or possibly it may only be that privileged murderer, his physician, may have just entered the church? I cannot jest about it, said Kenyon. It is an ugly sight. True, true, horrible to see or dream of, she replied, with one of those long tremulous sighs which so often betray a sick heart by escaping unexpectedly. We will not look at it any more. Come away, Donatello. Let us escape from this dismal church. The sunshine will do you good. When had ever a woman such a trial to sustain as this? By no possible supposition could Miriam explain the identity of the dead capuchin quietly and decorously laid out in the nave of his convent church, with that of her murdered prosecutor, flung heedlessly at the foot of the precipice. The effect upon her imagination was as if a strange and unknown corpse had miraculously, while she was gazing at it, assumed the likeness of that face, so terrible henceforth in her remembrance. It was a symbol, perhaps, of the deadly iteration with which she had doomed to behold the image of her crime reflected back upon her in a thousand ways, and converting the great calm face of nature in the whole and in its innumerable details into a manifold reminiscence of that one dead visage. No sooner had Miriam turned away from the bier and gone a few steps then she fancied the likeness altogether an illusion, which would vanish at a closer and colder view. She must look at it again, therefore, and at once, or else the grave would close over the face, and leave the awful fantasy that had connected itself therewith fixed ineffaceably in her brain. "'Wait for me one moment,' she said to her companions. "'Only a moment.' So she went back and gazed once more at the corpse. Yes, these were the features that Miriam had known so well. This was the visage that she remembered from a far longer date than the most intimate of her friends suspected. This form of clay had held the evil spirit which blasted her sweet youth and compelled her, as it were, to stain her womanhood with crime. But whether it were the majesty of death, or something originally noble and lofty in the character of the dead, which the soul had stamped upon the features as it left them, so it was that Miriam now quailed and shook, not for the vulgar horror of the spectacle, but for the severe reproachful glance that seemed to come from between those half-closed lids. True, there had been nothing in his lifetime viler than this man. She knew it. There was no other fact within her consciousness that she felt to be so certain. And yet, because her persecutor found himself safe and irrefutable in death, he frowned upon his victim and threw back the blame on her. Is it thou indeed? she murmured under her breath. Then thou hast no right to scowl upon me so. But art thou real or a vision? She bent down over the dead monk till one of her rich curls brushed against his forehead. She touched one of his folded hands with her finger. It is he, said Miriam. There is the scar that I know so well on his brow. And it is no vision. He is palpable to my touch. I will question the fact no longer, but deal with it as I best can. It was wonderful to see how the crisis developed in Miriam its own proper strength, and the faculty of sustaining the demands which it made upon her fortitude. 
she ceased to tremble the beautiful woman gazed sternly at her dead enemy endeavouring to meet and quell the look of accusation that he threw from between his half-closed eyelids no thou shalt not scowl me down said she neither now nor when we stand together at the judgment seat i fear not to meet thee there farewell till that next encounter haughtily waving her hand miriam rejoined her friends who were awaiting her at the door of the church as they went out the sacristan stopped them and proposed to show the cemetery of the convent where the deceased members of the fraternity are laid to rest in sacred earth brought long ago from jerusalem and will yonder monk be buried there she asked brother antonio exclaimed the sacristan surely our good brother will be put to bed there his grave is already dug and the last occupant has made room for him will you look at it signorina i will said miriam then excuse me observed kenyon for i shall leave you one dead monk has more than sufficed me and i am not bold enough to face the whole mortality of the convent it was easy to see by donatello's looks that he as well as the sculptor would gladly have escaped a visit to the famous cemetery of the cappuccini but miriam's nerves were strained to such a pitch that she anticipated a certain solace and absolute relief in passing from one ghastly spectacle to another of long accumulated ugliness and there was besides a singular sense of duty which impelled her to look at the final resting-place of the being whose fate had been so disastrously involved with her own she therefore followed the sacristan's guidance and drew her companion along with her whispering encouragement as they went the cemetery is beneath the church but entirely above ground and lighted by a row of iron grated windows without glass a corridor runs along beside these windows and gives access to three or four vaulted recesses or chapels of considerable breadth and height the floor of which consists of the consecrated earth of jerusalem it is smoothed decorously over the deceased brethren of the convent and is kept quite free from grass or weeds such as would grow even in these gloomy recesses if pains were not bestowed to root them up but as the cemetery is small and it is a precious privilege to sleep in holy ground the brotherhood are immemorially accustomed when one of their numbers dies to take the longest buried skeleton out of the oldest grave and lay the new slumberer there instead thus each of the good friars in his turn enjoys the luxury of a consecrated bed attended with a slight drawback of being forced to get up long before daybreak as it were and make room for another lodger the arrangement of the unearthed skeletons is what makes the special interest of the cemetery the arched and vaulted walls of the burial recesses are supported by massive pillars and pilasters made of thigh bones and skulls the whole material of the structure appears to be of a similar kind and the knobs and embossed ornaments of this strange architecture are represented by the joints of the spine and the more delicate tracery by the smaller bones of the human frame the summits of the arches are adorned with entire skeletons looking as if they were wrought most skilfully in bas-relief there is no possibility of describing how ugly and grotesque is the effect combined with a certain artistic merit nor how much perverted ingenuity has been shown in this queer way nor what a multitude of dead monks through how many hundred years must have contributed their bony framework to build up these great arches of mortality 
On some of the skulls there are inscriptions purporting that such a monk, who formerly made use of that particular headpiece, died on such a day and year, but vastly the greater number are piled up indistinguishably into the architectural design, like the many deaths that make up the one glory of a victory. In the side walls of the vaults are niches where skeleton monks sit or stand, clad in the brown habits that they wore in life, and labelled with their names and the dates of their disease. Their skulls, some quite bare, and others still covered with yellow skin and hair that has known the earth damps, look out from beneath their hoods, grinning hideously repulsive. One reverend father has his mouth wide open, as if he had died in the midst of a howl of terror and remorse, which perhaps is even now screeching through eternity. As a general thing, however, these frocked and hooded skeletons seem to take a more cheerful view of their position, and try with ghastly smiles to turn it into a jest. But the cemetery of the Capuchins is no place to nourish celestial hopes. The soul sinks forlorn and wretched under all this burden of dusty death. The holy earth from Jerusalem, so imbued is it with mortality, has grown as barren of the flowers of paradise as it is of earthly weeds and grass. Thank heaven for its blue sky! It needs a long upward gaze to give us back our faith. Not here can we feel ourselves immortal, where the very altars in these chapels of horrible consecration are heaps of human bones. Yet let us give the cemetery the praise that it deserves. There is no disagreeable scent, such as might have been expected from the decay of so many holy persons, in whatever odour of sanctity they may have taken their departure. The same number of living monks would not smell half so unexceptionably. Miriam went gloomily along the corridor from one vaulted Golgotha to another, until in the farthest recess she beheld an open grave. "'Is that for him who lies yonder in the nave?' she asked. Yes, signorina, this is to be the resting place of Brother Antonio, who came to his death last night, answered the sacristan. And in yonder niche, you see, sits a brother who was buried thirty years ago, and has risen to give him place. It is not a satisfactory idea, observed Miriam, that you poor friars cannot call even your graves permanently your own. You must lie down in them, methinks, with a nervous anticipation of being disturbed, like weary men who know that they shall be summoned out of bed at midnight. Is it not possible, if money were to be paid for the privilege, to leave Brother Antonio, if that be his name, in the occupancy of that narrow grave till the last trumpet sounds? By no means, signorina, neither is it needful or desirable answered the sacristan a quarter of a century sleep in the sweet earth of jerusalem is better than a thousand years in any other soil our brethren find good rest there no ghost was ever known to steal out of this blessed cemetery that is well responded miriam may he whom you now lay to sleep prove no exception to the rule. As they left the cemetery, she put money into the sacristan's hand, to an amount that made his eyes open wide and glisten, and requested that it might be expended in masses for the repose of Father Ant Volume One, Chapter Twenty Two of the Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Morant. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 1, Chapter 22. The Medici Gardens. Donatello, said Miriam anxiously, as they came through the Piazza Barberini. What can I do for you, my beloved friend? You are shaking as with the cold fit of the Roman fever. Yes, said Donatello. My heart shivers. As soon as she could collect her thoughts, Miriam led the young man to the gardens of the Villa Medici, hoping that the quiet shade and sunshine of that delightful retreat would a little revive his spirits. The grounds are there laid out in the old fashion of straight paths, with borders of box, which form hedges of great height and density, and are shorn and trimmed to the evenness of a wall of stone at the top and sides. There are green alleys, with long vistas overshadowed by ilex trees, and at each intersection of the paths the visitor finds seats of lichen-covered stone to repose upon, and marble statues that look forlornly at him, regretful of their lost noses. In the more open portions of the garden, before the sculptured front of the villa, you see fountains and flower-beds, and in their season a profusion of roses, from which the genial sun of Italy distills a fragrance, to be scattered abroad by the no less genial breeze. But Donatello drew no delight from these things. He walked onward in silent apathy, and looked at Miriam with strangely half-awakened and bewildered eyes, when she sought to bring his mind into sympathy with hers, and so relieve his heart of the burden that lay lumpishly upon it. She made him sit down on a stone bench, where two embowered alleys crossed each other, so that they could discern the approach of any casual intruder a long way down the path. "'My sweet friend,' she said, taking one of his passive hands in both of hers. What can I say to comfort you? Nothing, replied Donatello, with somber reserve. Nothing will ever comfort me. I accept my own misery, continued Miriam, my own guilt, if guilt it be, and whether guilt or misery, I shall know how to deal with it. But you, dearest friend, that were the rarest creature in all this world, and seemed a being to whom sorrow could not cling, you, whom I half fancied to belong to a race that had vanished forever, you only surviving to show mankind how genial and how joyous life used to be, in some long-ago age, what had you to do with grief or crime? They came to me as to other men, said Donatello, broodingly. Doubtless I was born to them. No, no, they came with me, replied Miriam. Mine is the responsibility. Alas, wherefore was I born? Why did we ever meet? Why did I not drive you from me, knowing for my heart foreboded it? that the cloud in which I walked would likewise envelop you. Donatello stirred uneasily, with the irritable impatience that is often combined with a mood of leaded despondency. A brown lizard with two tails, a monster often engendered by the Roman sunshine, ran across his foot and made him start. Then he sat silent a while, and so did Miriam, trying to dissolve her whole heart into sympathy and lavish it all upon him 
were it only for a moment's cordial. The young man lifted his hand to his breast, and unintentionally, as Miriam's hand was within his, he lifted that along with it. I have a great weight here, said he. The fancy struck Miriam, but she drove it resolutely down. The Donatello almost imperceptibly shuddered, while, in pressing his own hand against his heart, he pressed hers there, too. Rest your heart on me, dearest one, she resumed. Let me bear all its weight. I am well able to bear it, for I am a woman, and I love you. I love you, Donatello. Is there no comfort for you in this avowal? Look at me. Heretofore you have found me pleasant to your sight. Gaze into my eyes. Gaze into my soul. Search as deeply as you may. You can never see half the tenderness and devotion that I henceforth cherish for you. All that I ask is your acceptance of the utter self-sacrifice. But it shall be no sacrifice to my great love, with which I seek to remedy the evil you have incurred for my sake. All this fervor on Miriam's part, on Donatello's a heavy silence. Oh, speak to me, she exclaimed. Only promise me to be, by and by, a little happy. Happy, murmured Donatello. Ah, never again. Never again. Never. Ah, that is a terrible word to say to me, answered Miriam. A terrible word to let fall upon a woman's heart when she loves you and is conscious of having caused your misery. If you love me, Donatello, speak it not again. And surely you did love me. I did, replied Donatello, gloomily and absently. Miriam released the young man's hand, but suffered one of her own to be close to his, and waited a moment to see whether he would make any effort to retain it. There was much depending upon that simple experiment. With a deep sigh, as when sometimes a slumberer turns over in a troubled dream, Donatello changed his position, and clasped both his hands over his forehead, the genial warmth of a Roman April kindling into May was in the atmosphere around them. But when Miriam saw that involuntary movement and heard that sigh of relief, for so she interpreted it, a shiver ran through her frame, as if the iciest wind of the Apennines were blowing over her. He has done himself a greater wrong than I dreamed of, thought she, with unutterable compassion. Alas, it was a sad mistake. He might have had a kind of bliss in the consequences of this deed, had he been impelled to it by a love vital enough to survive the frenzy of that terrible moment, mighty enough to make its own law and justify itself against the natural remorse. But to have perpetrated a dreadful murder, and such was his crime, and less love, annihilating moral distinctions made it otherwise, on no better warrant than a boy's idle fantasy. I pity him from the very depths of my soul. As for myself, I am past my own or other's pity. She arose from the young man's side and stood before him with a sad, commiserating aspect it was the look of a ruined soul, bewailing in him a grief less than what her profounder sympathies imposed upon herself. Donatello, we must part, she said, with melancholy firmness. Yes, leave me. 
Go back to your old tower, which overlooks the green valley you have told me of among the Apennines. Then all that is past will be recognized as but an ugly dream. For in dreams the conscience sleeps, and we often stain ourselves with guilt of which we should be incapable in our waking moments. The deed you seemed to do last night was no more than such a dream. There was as little substance in what you fancied yourself doing. Go, and forget it all. Ah, that terrible face, said Donatello, pressing his hands over his eyes. Do you call that unreal? Yes, for you beheld it with dreaming eyes, replied Miriam. It was unreal, and that you may feel it so, it is requisite that you see this face of mine no more. Once you may have thought it beautiful. Now it has lost its charm. Yet it would still retain a miserable potency to bring back the past illusion. And in its train, the remorse and anguish that would darken all your life. Leave me, therefore, and forget me. "'Forget you, Miriam,' said Donatello, roused somewhat from his apathy of despair. "'If I could remember you, and behold you, apart from that frightful visage which stares at me over your shoulder, that were a consolation, at least, if not a joy. "'But since that visage haunts you along with mine,' rejoined Miriam, glancing behind her, we needs must part. Farewell, then. But if ever, in distress, peril, shame, poverty, or whatever anguish is most poignant, whatever burden heaviest, you should require a life to be given wholly, only to make your own a little easier, then summon me. As the case now stands between us, you have bought me dear and find me of little worth. Fling me away, therefore. May you never need me more. But if otherwise, a wish, almost an unuttered wish, will bring me to you. She stood a moment, expecting a reply. But Donatello's eyes had again fallen on the ground, and he had not in his bewildered mind and overburdened heart, a word to respond. That hour I speak of may never come, said Miriam. So farewell. Farewell forever. Farewell, said Donatello. His voice hardly made its way through the environment of unaccustomed thoughts and emotions which had settled over him like a dense and dark cloud. Not improbably, he beheld Miriam through so dim a medium that she looked visionary, heard her speak only in a faint, thin echo. She turned from the young man, and, much as her heart yearned towards him, she would not profane that heavy parting by an embrace, or even a pressure of the hand. So soon after the semblance of such mighty love, and after it had been the impulse to so terrible a deed, they parted, in all outward show, as coldly as people part, whose whole mutual intercourse has been encircled within a single hour. And Donatello, when Miriam had departed, stretched himself at full length on the stone bench and drew his hat over his eyes, as the idle and light-hearted youths of dreamy Italy are accustomed to do when they lie down in the first convenient shade and snatch a noonday slumber. A stupor was upon him, which he mistook for such drowsiness as he had known in his innocent past life. But, by and by, he raised himself slowly and left the garden. Sometimes poor Donatello started as if he heard a shriek. Sometimes he shrank back as if a face, fearful to behold, were thrust close to his own. 
in this dismal mood, bewildered with the novelty of sin and grief, he had little left of that singular resemblance, on account of which, and for their sport, his three friends had fantastically recognized him as the veritable fawn. Volume 1, Chapter 23 of The Marble Fawn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Elizabeth Morant The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 1 Chapter 23 Miriam and Hilda On leaving the Medici Gardens, Miriam felt herself astray in the world, and having no special reason to seek one place more than another, she suffered chance to direct her steps as it would. Thus it happened that, involving herself in the crookedness of Rome, she saw Hilda's tower rising before her, and was put in mind to climb to the young girl's eyrie and ask why she had broken her engagement at the Church of the Capuchins. People often do the idlest acts of their lifetime in their heaviest and most anxious moments, so that it would have been no wonder had Miriam been impelled only by so slight a motive of curiosity as we have indicated. But she remembered, too, and with a quaking heart, what the sculptor had mentioned of Hilda's retracing her steps towards the courtyard of the Palazzo Caffarelli, in quest of Miriam herself. Had she been compelled to choose between infamy in the eyes of the whole world and in Hilda's eyes alone, she would unhesitatingly have accepted the former, on condition of remaining spotless in the estimation of her white-souled friend. This possibility, therefore, that Hilda had witnessed the scene of the past night was unquestionably the cause that drew Miriam to the tower and made her linger and falter as she approached it. As she drew near, there were tokens to which her disturbed mind gave a sinister interpretation. Some of her friend's airy family, the doves, with their heads embedded disconsolately in their bosoms, were huddled in a corner of the piazza. Others had alighted on the heads, wings, shoulders, and trumpets of the marble angels which adorned the façade of the neighboring church. Two or three had betaken themselves to the Virgin's shrine, and as many as could find room were sitting on Hilda's window sill but all of them, so Miriam fancied, had a look of weary expectation and disappointment. No flights, no flutterings, no cooing murmur, something that ought to have made their day glad and bright was evidently left out of this day's history. And furthermore, Hilda's white window curtain was closely drawn, with only that one little aperture at the side, which Miriam remembered noticing the night before. Be quiet, said Miriam to her own heart, pressing her hand upon it. Why shouldst thou throb now? Hast thou not endured more terrible things than this? Whatever were her apprehensions, she would not turn back. 
It might be, and the solace would be worth a world, that Hilda, knowing nothing of the past night's calamity, would greet her friend with a sunny smile, and so restore a portion of the vital warmth for lack of which her soul was frozen. But could Miriam, guilty as she was, permit Hilda to kiss her cheek, to clasp her hand, and thus be no longer so unspotted from the world as heretofore? I will never permit her sweet touch again, said Miriam toiling up the staircase, if I can find strength of heart to forbid it. But, oh, it would be so soothing in this wintry fever fit of my heart. There can be no harm to my white Hilda in one parting kiss. That shall be all. But, on reaching the upper landing place, Miriam paused and stirred not again till she brought herself to an immobile resolve. My lips, my hand, shall never meet Hilda's more, said she. Meanwhile, Hilda sat listlessly in her painting room. Had you looked into the little adjoining chamber, you might have seen the slight imprint of her figure on the bed but would also have detected at once that the white counterpane had not been turned down. The pillow was more disturbed. She had turned her face upon it, the poor child, and bedewed it with some of those tears, among the most chill and forlorn that gush from human sorrow, which the innocent heart pours forth at its first actual discovery that sin is in the world. The young and pure are not apt to find out that miserable truth until it is brought home to them by the guiltiness of some trusted friend. They may have heard much of the evil of the world and seem to know it, but only as an impalpable theory. In due time, some mortal, whom they reverence too highly, is commissioned by Providence to teach them this direful lesson. He perpetrates a sin, and Adam falls anew, and Paradise, heretofore in unfaded bloom, is lost again, and dosed forever with the fiery swords gleaming at its gates. The chair in which Hilda sat was near the portrait of Beatrice Cenci, which had not yet been taken from the easel. It is a peculiarity of this picture that its profoundest expression eludes a straightforward glance and can only be caught by side glimpses or when the eye falls casually upon it, even as if the painted face had a life and consciousness of its own, and, resolving not to betray its secret of grief or guilt, permitted the true tokens to come forth only when it imagined itself unseen. No other such magical effect has ever been wrought by pencil. Now, opposite the easel hung a looking-glass, in which Beatrice's face and Hilda's were both reflected. In one of her weary, nerveless changes of position, Hilda happened to throw her eyes on the glass, and took in both these images at once unpremeditated glance. She fancied, nor was it without horror, that Beatrice's expression, seen aside and vanishing in a moment, had been depicted in her own face likewise, and flitted from it as timorously. Am I, too, stained with guilt? thought the poor girl, 
hiding her face in her hands. Not so, thank heaven. But as regards Beatrice's picture, the incident suggests a theory which may account for its unutterable grief and mysterious shadow of guilt, without detracting from the purity which we love to attribute to that ill-fated girl. Who, indeed, can look at that mouth with its lips half apart, as innocent as a babe's that has been crying, and not pronounce Beatrice sinless? It was the intimate consciousness of her father's sin that threw its shadow over her and frightened her into a remote and inaccessible region where no sympathy could come. It was the knowledge of Miriam's guilt that lent the same expression to Hilda's face. But Hilda nervously moved her chair so that the images in the glass should no longer be visible. She now watched a speck of sunshine that came through a shuttered window and crept from object to object, indicating each with the touch of its bright finger and then letting them all vanish successively. In like manner, her mind, so like sunlight in its natural cheerfulness, went from thought to thought, but found nothing that it could dwell upon for comfort. Never before had this young, energetic, active spirit known what it is to be despondent. It was the unreality of the world that made her so. Her dearest friend, whose heart seemed the most solid and richest of Hilda's possessions, had no existence for her any more. And in that dreary void, out of which Miriam had disappeared, the substance, the truth, the integrity of life, the motives of effort, the joy of success, had departed along with her. It was long past noon when a step came up the staircase. It had passed beyond the limits where there was communication with the lower regions of the palace and was mounting the successive flights which led only to Hilda's precincts. Faint as the tread was, she heard and recognized it. It startled her into sudden life. Her first impulse was to spring to the door of the studio and fasten it with lock and bolt. But a second thought made her feel that this would be an unworthy cowardice on her own part, and also that Miriam, only yesterday her closest friend, had a right to be told, face to face, that thenceforth they must be forever strangers. She heard Miriam pause outside of the door. We have already seen what was the latter's resolve with respect to any kiss or pressure of the hand between Hilda and herself. We know not what became of the resolution. As Miriam was of a highly impulsive character, it may have vanished at the first sight of Hilda. But, at all events, she appeared to have dressed herself up in a garb of sunshine and was disclosed, as the door swung open, in all the glow of her remarkable beauty. The truth was her heart leaped conclusively towards the only refuge that it had, or hoped. She forgot, just one instant, all cause for holding herself aloof. Ordinarily there was a certain reserve in Miriam's demonstrations of affection, in consonance with the delicacy of her friend. Today she opened her arms to take Hilda in. "'Dearest, darling Hilda!' she exclaimed. "'It gives me new life to see you!' Hilda was standing in the middle of the room. When her friend made a step or two from the door, she put forth her hands with an involuntary repellent gesture. 
so expressive that Miriam at once felt a great chasm opening itself between them two. They might gaze at one another from the opposite side, but without the possibility of ever meeting more, or at least, since the chasm could never be bridged over, they must tread the whole round of eternity to meet on the other side. There was even a terror in the thought of their meeting again. It was as if Hilda or Miriam were dead and could no longer hold intercourse without violating a spiritual law. Yet in the wantonness of her despair, Miriam made one more step towards the friend whom she had lost. "'Do not come nearer, Miriam,' said Hilda. Her look and tone were those of sorrowful entreaty and yet they expressed a kind of confidence, as if the girl were conscious of a safeguard that could not be violated. "'What has happened between us, Hilda?' asked Miriam. "'Are we not friends?' "'No, no,' said Hilda, shuddering. "'At least we have been friends,' continued Miriam. "'I loved you dearly. I love you still.' You are to me as a younger sister, yes, dearer than sisters of the same blood. For you and I were so lonely, Hilda, that the whole world pressed us together by its solitude and strangeness. Then will you not touch my hand? Am I not the same as yesterday? Alas, no, Miriam, said Hilda. Yes, the same, the same for you, Hilda, rejoined her lost friend. For you to touch my hand, you would find it as warm to your grasp as ever. If you were sick or suffering, I would watch night and day for you. It is in such simple offices that true affection shows itself, and so I speak of them. Yet now, Hilda, your very look seems to put me beyond the limits of human kind. It is not I, Miriam, said Hilda, not I that have done this. You and you only, Hilda, replied Miriam, stirred up to make her own cause good by the repellent force which her friend opposed to her. I am a woman, as I was yesterday, endowed with the same truth of nature, the same warmth of heart, the same genuine and earnest love which you have always known in me. In any regard that concerns yourself, I am not changed. And believe me, Hilda, when a human being has chosen a friend out of all the world, it is only some faithlessness between themselves, rendering true intercourse impossible that can justify either friend in severing the bond. Have I deceived you? Then cast me off. Have I wronged you personally? Then forgive me if you can. But have I sinned against God and man and deeply sinned? Then be more my friend than ever, for I need you more. Do not bewilder me thus, Miriam exclaimed Hilda, who had not forborne to express, by look and gesture, the anguish which this interview inflicted on her. If I were one of God's angels, with a nature incapable of sin, and garments that never could be spotted, I would keep ever at your side, and try to lead you upward. But I am a poor, lonely girl." whom God has set here in an evil world, and given her only a white robe, and bid her wear it back to him as white as when she put it on. Your powerful magnetism would be too much for me. The pure white atmosphere in which I try to discern what things are good and true would be discolored, and therefore, Miriam, before it is too late, I mean to put faith in this awful heartquake which warns me henceforth to avoid you. 
"'Ah, this is hard! "'Ah, this is terrible!' murmured Miriam, "'dropping her forehead in her hands. "'In a moment or two she looked up again, "'as pale as death, "'but with a composed countenance. "'I always said, Hilda, that you were merciless, "'for I had a perception of it, "'even while you loved me best.' You have no sin, nor any conception of what it is, and therefore you are so terribly severe. As an angel, you are not amiss, but as a human creature, and a woman among earthly men and women, you need a sin to soften you. God forgive me, said Hilda if I have said a needlessly cruel word. Let it pass, answered Miriam, I, whose heart it has smitten upon, forgive you, and tell me, before we part forever, what have you seen or known of me since last we met? A terrible thing, Miriam, said Hilda growing paler than before. Do you see it written in my face, or painted in my eyes? inquired Miriam, her trouble seeking relief in a half-frenzied raillery. I would fain know how it is that providence, or freight, brings eyewitnesses to watch us when we fancy ourselves acting in the remotest privacy. Did all Rome see it, then, or at least our merry company of artists? Or is it some blood stain on me, or death scent in my garments? They say that monstrous deformities sprout out of fiends, who once were lovely angels. Did you perceive such in me already? Tell me, by our past friendship, Hilda, all you know. Thus adjured and frightened, by the wild emotion which Miriam could not suppress, Hilda strove to tell what she had witnessed. After the rest of the party had passed on, I went back to speak to you, she said, for there seemed to be a trouble on your mind, and I wished to share it with you, if you could permit me. The door of the little courtyard was partly shut, but I pushed it open and saw you within and Donatello and a third person whom I had before noticed in the shadow of a niche. He approached you, Miriam. You knelt to him. I saw Donatello spring upon him. I would have shrieked, but my throat was dry. I would have rushed forward, but my limbs seemed rooted to the earth. It was like a flash of lightning. A look passed from your eyes to Donatello's. A look. Yes, Hilda, yes, exclaimed Miriam with intense eagerness. Do not pause now. That look, it revealed all your heart, Miriam, continued Hilda covering her eyes as if to shut out the recollection, a look of hatred, triumph, vengeance, and, as it were, joy at some unhoped-for relief. Ah! Donatello was right then, murmured Miriam, who shook throughout all her frame. My eyes bade him do it. Go on, Hilda. It all passed so quickly, all like a glare of lightning, said Hilda, and yet it seemed to me that Donatello had paused while one might draw a breath, and that look, ah, Miriam, spare me, need I tell more? No more. There needs no more, Hilda, replied Miriam, bowing her head, as if listening to a sentence of condemnation from a supreme tribunal. It is enough, you have satisfied my mind on a point where it was greatly disturbed. Henceforward I shall be quiet. Thank you, Hilda. 
She was on the point of departing, but turned back again from the threshold. This is a terrible secret to be kept in a young girl's bosom, she observed. What will you do with it, my poor child? Heaven help and guide me, answered Hilda, bursting into tears, for the burden of it crushes me to the earth. It seems a crime to know of such a thing, and to keep it to myself. It knocks within my heart continually, threatening, imploring, insisting to be let out. Oh, my mother, my mother, were she yet living, I would travel over land and sea to tell her this dark secret, as I told all the little troubles of my infancy. But I am alone, alone. Miriam, you were my dearest, only friend. Advise me what to do. This was a singular appeal, no doubt, from the stainless maiden to the guilty woman, whom she had just banished from her heart forever. But it bore striking testimony to the impression which Miriam's natural uprightness and impulsive generosity had made on the friend who knew her best, and it deeply comforted the poor criminal by proving to her that the bond between Hilda and herself was vital yet. As far as she was able, Miriam at once responded to the girl's cry for help. If I deemed it good for your peace of mind, she said, to bear testimony against me for this deed in the face of all the world. No consideration of myself should weigh with me an instant. But I believe that you would find no relief in such a course. What men call justice lies chiefly in outward formalities and has never the close application and fitness that would be satisfactory to a soul like yours. I cannot be fairly tried and judged before an earthly tribunal. And of this, Hilda, you would perhaps become fatally conscious when it was too late. Roman justice, above all things, is a byword. What have you to do with it? Leave all such thoughts aside. Yet, Hilda, I would not have you keep my secret imprisoned in your heart if it tries to leap out and stings you like a wild venomous thing when you thrust it back again. Have you no other friend now that you have been forced to give me up? No other, answered Hilda sadly. Yes, Kenyon rejoined Miriam. He cannot be my friend, said Hilda, because, because I have fancied that he sought to be something more. Fear nothing, replied Miriam, shaking her head with a strange smile. This story will frighten his newborn love out of its little life, if that be what you wish. Tell him the secret, then and take his wise and honorable counsel as to what should next be done. I know not what else to say. I never dreamed, said Hilda. How could you think it of betraying you to justice? But I see how it is, Miriam. I must keep your secret and die of it unless God sends me some relief by methods which are now beyond my power to imagine. It is very dreadful. Ah, now I understand how the sins of generations past have created an atmosphere of sin for those that follow, while there is a single guilty person in the universe. Each innocent one must feel his innocence tortured by that guilt. Your deed, Miriam, has darkened the whole sky. Poor Hilda turned from her unhappy friend. 
and, sinking on her knees in a corner of the chamber, could not be prevailed upon to utter another word, and Miriam, with a long regard from the threshold, bade farewell to this dove's nest, this one little nook of pure thoughts and innocent enthusiasms, and to which she had brought such trouble. Every crime destroys more Edens than our own. Volume 2, Chapter 24 of The Marble Fawn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are available in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Elizabeth Morant The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 2, Chapter 24 The Tower Among the Apennines It was in June that the sculptor Kenyon arrived on horseback at the gate of an ancient country house, which, from some of its features, might almost be called a castle, situated in a part of Tuscany somewhat remote from the ordinary track of tourists. Thither we must now accompany him, and endeavor to make our story flow onward, like a streamlet, past a gray tower that rises on the hillside, overlooking a spacious valley, which is set in the grand framework of the Apennines. The sculptor had left Rome with the retreating tide of foreign residents, for as summer approaches, the Niobe of nations is made to bewail anew, and doubtless with sincerity, the loss of that large part of her population which she derives from other lands, and on whom depends much of whatever remnant of prosperity she still enjoys. Rome, at this season, is pervaded and overhung with atmospheric terrors, and insulated within a charmed and deadly circle. The crowd of wandering tourists betake themselves to Switzerland, to the Rhine, or from this central home of the world to their native homes in England or America, which they are apt thenceforward to look upon as provincial, after once having yielded to the spell of the eternal city. The artist, who contemplates an indefinite succession of winters in this home of art, though his first thought was merely to improve himself by a brief visit, goes forth in the summertime to sketch scenery and costume among the Tuscan hills, and pour, if he can, the purple air of Italy over his canvas. He studies the old schools of art in the mountain towns where they were born, and where they are still to be seen in the faded frescoes of Giotto and Simabu, on the walls of many a church, or in the dark chapels, in which the sacristan draws aside the veil from a treasured picture of Perugino. Thence the happy painter goes to walk the long, bright galleries of Florence, or to steal glowing colors from the miraculous works which he finds in a score of Venetian palaces. Such summers as these, spent amid whatever is exquisite in art, or wild and picturesque in nature, may not inadequately repay him for the chill neglect and disappointment through which he has probably languished in his Roman winter. This sunny, shadowy, breezy, wandering life, in which he seeks for beauty as his treasure, and gathers for his winter's honey what is but a passing fragrance to all other men, is worth living for, come afterwards what may. 
even if he die unrecognized. The artist has had his share of enjoyment and success. Kenyon had seen, at a distance of many miles, the old villa or castle towards which his journey lay, looking from its height over a broad expanse of valley. As he drew nearer, however, it had been hidden among the inequalities of the hillside until the winding road brought him almost to the iron gateway. The sculptor found this substantial barrier fastened with lock and bolt. There was no bell, nor other instrument of sound, and, after summoning the invisible garrison with his voice, instead of a trumpet, he had leisure to take a glance at the exterior of the fortress. About thirty yards within the gateway rose a square tower, lofty enough to be a very prominent object in the landscape, and more than sufficiently massive in proportion to its height. Its antiquity was evidently such that, in a climate of more abundant moisture, the ivy would have mantled it from head to foot in a garment that might, by this time, have been centuries old, though ever new. In the dry Italian air, however, nature had only so far adopted this old pile of stonework as to cover almost every hand's breadth of it with close-clinging lichens and yellow moss and the immemorial growth of these kindly productions rendered the general hue of the tower soft and venerable, and took away the aspect of nakedness which would have made its age drearier than now. Up and down the height of the tower were scattered three or four windows, the lower ones grated with iron bars, the upper ones vacant both of window frames and glass. Besides these larger openings, there were several loopholes and little square apertures which might be supposed to light the staircase that doubtless climbed the interior toward the battlemented and machicolated summit. With this last-mentioned warlike garniture upon its stern old head and brow, the tower seemed evidently a stronghold of times long past. Many a crossbowman had shot his shafts from those windows and loopholes, and from the vantage height of those gray battlements. Many a flight of arrows, too, had hit all around about the embrasure above, or the apertures below, where the helmet of a defender had momentarily glimmered. On festal nights, moreover, a hundred lamps had often gleamed afar over the valley, suspended from the iron hooks that were ranged for the purpose beneath the battlements and every window. Connected with the tower, and extending behind it, there seemed to be a very spacious residence, chiefly of more modern date. It perhaps owed much of its fresher appearance, however, to a coat of stucco and yellow wash, which is a sort of renovation very much in vogue with the Italians. Kenyon noticed over a doorway, in the portion of the edifice immediately adjacent to the tower, a cross which, with a bell suspended above the roof, indicated that this was a consecrated precinct, and the chapel of the mansion. Meanwhile, the hot sun so incommoded the unsheltered traveller that he shouted forth another impatient summons. Happening, at the same moment, to look upward, he saw a figure leaning from an embrasure of the battlements and gazing down at him. "'Ho, Signore Count!' cried the sculptor, waving his straw hat, for he recognized the face after a moment's doubt. This is a warm reception, truly. Pray bid your porter let me in before the sun shrivels me quite into a cinder. I will come myself, responded Donatello, flinging down his voice out of the clouds, as it were. 
Old Tommaso and old Stella are both asleep, no doubt, and the rest of the people are in the vineyard. But I have expected you, and you are welcome. The young count, as perhaps we had better designate him in his ancestral tower, vanished from the battlements, and Kenyon saw his figure appear successively at each of the windows as he descended. On every rear appearance, he turned his face towards the sculptor and gave a nod and smile, for a kindly impulse prompted him thus to assure his visitor of a welcome after keeping him so long at an inhospitable threshold. Kenyon, however, naturally and professionally expert at reading the expression of the human countenance, had a vague sense that this was not the young friend whom he had known so familiarly in Rome, not the sylvan and untutored youth whom Miriam, Hilda, and himself had liked, laughed at, and sported with, not the Donatello, whose identity they had so playfully mixed up with that of the fawn of Praxiteles. Finally, when his host had emerged from a side portal of the mansion and approached the gateway, the traveller still felt that there was something lost or something gained, he hardly knew which, that set the Donatello of today irreconcilably at odds with him of yesterday. His very gait showed it, in a certain gravity, a weight and measure of step, that had nothing in common with the irregular buoyancy which used to distinguish him. His face was paler and thinner, and the lips less full and less apart. "'I have looked for you a long while,' said Donatello, and, though his voice sounded differently, and cut out its words more sharply than had been its wont, still, there was a smile shining on his face that, for the moment, quite brought back the fawn. I shall be more cheerful, perhaps, now that you have come. It is very solitary here. I have come slowly along, often lingering, often turning aside, replied Kenyon, for I found a great deal to interest me in the medieval sculptures hidden away in the church, churches hereabouts. An artist, whether painter or sculptor, may be pardoned for loitering through such a region. But what a fine old tower! Its tall front is like a page of black letter, taken from the history of the Italian republics. I know little or nothing of its history, said the Count, glancing upward at the battlements, where he had just been standing. But I thank my forefathers for building it so high. I like the windy summit better than the world below, and spend much of my time there nowadays. It is a pity you are not a stargazer, observed Kenyon, also looking up. It is higher than Galileo's tower, which I saw a week or two ago, outside of the walls of Florence. A stargazer? I am one replied Donatello. I sleep in the tower, and often watch very late on the battlements. There is a dismal old staircase to climb, however, before reaching the top, and a succession of dismal chambers, from story to story. Some of them were prison chambers in times past, as old Tommaso will tell you. The repugnance intimated in his tone at the idea of this gloomy staircase and these ghostly, dimly lighted rooms reminded Kenyon of the original Donatello, much more than his present custom of midnight vigils on the battlements. "'I shall be glad to share your watch,' said the guest, "'especially by moonlight. The prospect of this broad valley must be very fine.' But I was not aware, my friend, that these were your country habits. I have fancied you in a sort of Arcadian life, 
tasting rich figs, and squeezing the juice out of the sunniest grapes, and sleeping soundly all night, after a day of simple pleasures. I may have known such a life when I was younger, answered the Count gravely. I am not a boy now. Time flies over us, but leaves its shadow behind. The sculptor could not but smile at the triteness of the remark, which, nevertheless, had a kind of originality as coming from Donatello. He had thought it out from his own experience, and perhaps considered himself as communicating a new truth to mankind. They were now advancing up the courtyard, and the long extent of the villa, with its iron-barred lower windows and balconied upper ones, became visible, stretching back towards a grove of trees. At some period of your family history, observed Kenyon, the Counts of Monte Beni must have led a patriarchal life in this vast house. A great grandsire and all his descendants might find ample verge here, and with space, too, for each separate brood of little ones to play within its own precincts. Is your present household a large one? Only myself, answered Donatello, and Tommaso, who has been butler since my grandfather's time, and old Stella, who goes sweeping and dusting about the chambers, and Girolamo, the cook, who has but an idle life of it, he shall send you up a chicken forthwith. But first of all, I must summon one of the contadini from the farmhouse yonder to take your horse to the stable. Accordingly, the young count shouted again, and with such effect that, after several repetitions of the outcry, an old gray woman protruded her head and a broom handle from a chamber window. The venerable butler emerged from a recess in the side of the house, where was a well, or reservoir, in which he had been cleansing a small wine cask, and a sunburnt contadino in his shirt sleeves showed himself on the outskirts of the vineyard, with some kind of a farming tool in his hand. Donatello found employment for all these retainers in providing accommodation for his guest and steed, and then ushered the sculptor into the vestibule of the house. It was a square and lofty entrance room which, by the solidity of its construction, might have been an Etruscan tomb, being paved and walled with heavy blocks of stone, and vaulted almost as massively overhead. On two sides there were doors, opening into long suites of anterooms and saloons. On the third side, a stone staircase of spacious breadth, ascending by dignified degrees and with wide resting places to another floor of similar extent. Through one of the doors, which was ajar, Canyon beheld an almost interminable vista of apartments, opening one beyond the other, and reminding him of the hundred rooms in Bluebeard's castle, or the countless halls in some palace of the Arabian Nights. It must have been a numerous family, indeed, that could ever have sufficed to people with human life so large an abode as this, and in part social warmth to such a wide world within doors. The sculptor confessed to himself that Donatello could allege reason enough for growing melancholy, having only his own personality to vivify it all. How a woman's face would brighten it up, he ejaculated, not intending to be overheard. But, Glancing at Donatello, he saw a stern and sorrowful look in his eyes, which altered his youthful face as if it had seen thirty years of trouble, and, at the same moment, 
old Stella showed herself through one of the doorways, as the only representative of her sex at Monte Beni. End of Chapter 24 of Volume 2 Recording by Elizabeth Morant, Port Ritchie Volume 2, Chapter 25 The Marble Fawn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Elizabeth Morant the Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne Volume 2 Chapter 25 Sunshine Come, said the Count. I see you already find the old place dismal. So do I, indeed. And yet it was a cheerful place in my boyhood. But, you see in my father's days, and the same was true of all my endless line of grandfathers, as I have heard. There used to be uncles, aunts, and all manner of kindred, dwelling together as one family. They were a merry and kindly race of people, for the most part, and kept one another's hearts warm. Two hearts might be enough for warmth, observed the sculptor, even in so large a house as this. One solitary heart, it is true, may be apt to shiver a little. But I trust, my friend, that the genial blood of your race still flows in many veins besides your own. I am the last, said Donatello gloomily. They have all vanished from me since my childhood. Old Tommaso will tell you that the air of Monte Beni is not so favorable to length of days as it used to be. But that is not the secret of the quick extinction of my kindred. Then you are aware of a more satisfactory reason, suggested Kenyon. I thought of one the other night while I was gazing at the stars, answered Donatello. But pardon me, I do not mean to tell it. Uh, one cause, however, of the longer and healthier life of my forefathers was that they had many pleasant customs and means of making themselves glad, and their guests and friends along with them. Nowadays we have but one. And what is that? asked the sculptor. You shall see, said his host. By this time he had ushered the sculptor into one of the numberless saloons and, calling for refreshment, old Stella placed a cold fowl upon the table, and quickly followed it with a savory omelette, which Girolamo had lost no time in preparing. She also brought some cherries, plums, and apricots, and a plate full of particularly delicate figs of last year's growth. The butler, showing his white head at the door, his master beckoned to him. Tommaso, bring some sunshine, said he. The readiest method of obeying this order, one might suppose, would have been to fling wide the green window blinds, 
and let the glow of the summer noon into the carefully shaded room. But at Monte Benni, with provident caution against the wintry days, when there is little sunshine, and the rainy ones, when there is none, it was the hereditary custom to keep their sunshine stored away in the cellar. Old Tommaso quickly produced some of it in a small, straw-covered flask, out of which he extracted the cork and inserted a little cotton wool to absorb the olive oil that kept the precious liquid from the air. This is a wine, observed the Count, the secret of making which has been kept in our family for centuries upon centuries. Nor would it avail any man to steal the secret, unless he could also steal the vineyard, in which alone the Monte Benni grape can be produced. There is little else left me, save that patch of vines. Taste some of their juice, and tell me whether it is worthy to be called sunshine, for that is its name. A glorious name, too, cried the sculptor. Taste it, said Donatello, filling his friend's glass, and pouring likewise a little into his own. But first smell its fragrance, for the wine is very lavish of it, and will scatter it all abroad. "'Ah, how exquisite!' said Kenyon. "'No other wine has a bouquet like this. "'The flavor must be rare, indeed, "'if it fulfill the promise of this fragrance, "'which is like the airy sweetness of youthful hopes "'that no realities will ever satisfy.' "'This invaluable liqueur was of a pale golden hue, like other of the rarest Italian wines, and, if carelessly and irreligiously quaffed, might have been mistaken for a very fine sort of champagne. It was not, however, an effervescing wine, although its delicate piquancy produced a somewhat similar effect upon the palate. Sipping the guest longed to sip again. But the wine demanded so deliberate a pause in order to detect the hidden peculiarities and subtle exquisiteness of its flavor that to drink it was really more a moral than a physical enjoyment. There was a deliciousness in it that eluded analysis, and, like whatever else is superlatively good, was perhaps better appreciated in the memory than by present consciousness. One of its most ethereal charms lay in the transitory life of the wine's richest qualities, for while it required a certain leisure and delay, Yet, if you lingered too long upon the draft, it became disenchanted, both of its fragrance and its flavor. The luster should not be forgotten among the other admirable endowments of the Monte Benni wine, for as it stood in Kenyon's glass, a little circle of light glowed on the table round about it, as if it were really so much golden sunshine. I feel myself a better man for that ethereal potation, observed the sculptor. The finest Orvieto, or that famous wine, the Est 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 of Monte Fiascone, is vulgar in comparison. This is surely the wine of the golden age, such as Bacchus himself first taught mankind to press from the choicest of his grapes. My dear Count, why is it not illustrious? The 
pale liquid gold and every such flask as that might be solidified into golden scudi and would quickly make you a millionaire <laughs> tommaso the old butler who was standing by the table and enjoying the praises of the wine quite as much as if bestowed upon himself made answer we have a tradition signore said he that this rare wine of our vineyard would lose all its wonderful qualities if any of it were sent to market the counts of montebeni have never parted with a single flask of it for gold at their banquets in the olden time they have entertained princes cardinals and once an emperor and once a pope with this delicious wine and always even to this day it has been their custom to let it flow freely when those whom they love and honor sit at the board but the grand duke himself could not drink that wine except it were under this very roof what do you tell me my good friend replied kenyon makes me venerate the sunshine of monte beni even more abundantly than before as i understand you it is a sort of consecrated juice and symbolizes the holy virtues of hospitality and social kindness why partly so signore said the old butler with a shrewd twinkle in his eye but to speak out all the truth there is another excellent reason why neither a cask nor a flask of our precious vintage should ever be sent to market the wine signore is so fond of its native home that a transportation of even a few miles turns it quite sour and yet it is a wine that keeps well in the cellar underneath this floor and gathers fragrance flavor and brightness in its dark dungeon that very flask of sunshine now has kept itself for you sir guest as a maid reserves her sweetness till her lover comes for it ever since a merry vintage time when the signore count here was a boy you must not wait for tommaso to end his discourse about the wine before drinking off your glass observed donatello when once the flask is uncorked its finest qualities lose little time in making their escape i doubt whether your last sip will be quite so delicious as you found the first and in truth the sculptor fancied that the sunshine became almost imperceptibly clouded as he approached the bottom of the flask the effect of the wine however was a gentle exhilaration which did not so speedily pass away being thus refreshed kenyon looked around him at the antique saloon in which they sat it was constructed in a most ponderous style with a stone floor on which heavy pilasters were planted against the wall supporting arches that crossed one another in the vaulted ceiling the upright walls as well as the compartments of the roof were completely covered with frescoes which doubtless had been brilliant when first executed and perhaps for generations afterwards the designs were of a festive and joyous character representing arcadian scenes where nymphs fauns and satyrs disported themselves among 
mortal youths and maidens and pan and the god of wine and he of sunshine and music disdained not to brighten some sylvan merrymaking with the scarcely veiled glory of their presence a wreath of dancing figures in admirable variety of shape and motion was festooned quite round the cornice of the room in its first splendor the saloon must have presented an aspect both gorgeous and enlivening for it invested some of the cheerfulest ideas and emotions of which the human mind is susceptible with the external reality of beautiful form and rich harmonious glow and variety of color but the frescoes were now very ancient they had been rubbed and scrubbed by old stein and many a predecessor and had been defaced in one spot and retouched in another and had peeled from the wall in patches and had hidden some of their brightest portions under dreary dust till the joyousness had quite vanished out of them all it was often difficult to puzzle out the design and even where it was more readily intelligible the figures showed like the ghosts of dead and buried joys the closer their resemblance to the happy past the gloomier now for it is thus that with only an inconsiderable change the gladdest objects and existences become the saddest hope fading into disappointment joy darkening into grief and festal splendor into funereal duskiness and all evolving as their moral a grim identity between gay things and sorrowful ones only give them a little time and they turn out to be just alike there has been much festivity in the saloon if i may judge by the character of its frescoes remarked kenyon whose spirits were still upheld by the mild potency of the monte benny wine your forefathers my dear count must have been joyous fellows keeping up the vintage merriment throughout the year it does me good to think of them gladdening the hearts of men and women with their wine of sunshine even in the iron age as pan and bacchus whom we see yonder did in the golden one yes there have been merry times in the banquet hall of monte benny even within my own remembrance replied donatello looking gravely at the painted walls it was meant for mirth as you see and when i brought my own cheerfulness into the saloon these frescoes looked cheerful too but methinks they have all faded since i saw them last it would be a good idea said the sculptor falling into his companion's vein and helping him out with an illustration which donatello himself could not have put into shape to convert this saloon into a chapel and when the priest tells his hearers of the instability of earthly joys and would show how drearily they vanish he may point to these pictures that were so joyous and are so dismal he could not illustrate his theme so aptly in any other way true indeed answered the count his former simplicity strangely mixing itself up with an experience that had changed him and yonder where the minstrels used to stand the altar shall be placed a sinful man 
might do all the more effective penance in this old banquet hall. But I should regret to have suggested so ungenial a transformation in your hospitable saloon, continued Kenyon, duly noting the change in Donatello's characteristics. You startle me, my friend, by so ascetic a design. It would hardly have entered your head when we first met. Pray, do not, if I may take the freedom of a somewhat elder man to advise you, added he, smiling. Pray, do not, under a notion of improvement, take upon yourself to be somber, thoughtful, and penitential, like all the rest of us. Donatello made no answer, but sat a while, appearing to follow with his eyes one of the figures, which was repeated many times over in the groups upon the walls and ceiling. It formed the principal link of an allegory, by which, as is often the case in such pictorial designs, the whole series of frescoes were bound together, but which it would be impossible, or at least very wearisome, to unravel. The sculptor's eyes took a similar direction, and soon began to trace through the vicissitudes, once gay, now somber in which the old artist had involved it, the same individual figure. He fancied a resemblance in it to Donatello himself, and it put him in mind of one of the purposes with which he had come to Monte Beni. My dear Count, said he, I have a proposal to make. You must let me employ a little of my leisure in modeling your bust. You remember what a striking resemblance we all of us, Hilda, Miriam, and I, found between your features and those of the fawn of Praxiteles. Then it seemed an identity. But now that I know your face better, the likeness is far less apparent. Your head in marble would be a treasure to me. Shall I have it? I have a weakness which I fear I cannot overcome, replied the Count, turning away his face. It troubles me to be looked at steadfastly. I have observed it since we have been sitting here, though never before, rejoined the sculptor. It is a kind of nervousness, I apprehend, which you caught in the Roman air, and which grows upon you in your solitary life. It need be no hindrance to my taking your bust, for I will catch the likeness and expression by side glimpses, which, if portrait painters and bust makers did but know it, always bring home richer results than a broad stare. You may take me if you have the power, said Donatello. But even as he spoke, he turned away his face. And if you can see what makes me shrink from you, you are welcome to put it in the bust. It is not my will, but my necessity to avoid men's eyes. Only, he added, with a smile which made Kenyon doubt whether he might not as well copy the fawn as model a new bust. Only, you know, you must not insist on my uncovering these ears of mine. Nay, I never should dream of such a thing, answered the sculptor, laughing, as the young count shook his clustering curls. I could not hope to persuade you, remembering how Miriam once failed. Nothing is more unaccountable 
than the spell that often lurks in a spoken word. A thought may be present to the mind so distinctly that no utterance could make it more so. And two minds may be conscious of the same thought, in which one or both take the profoundest interest. But as long as it remains unspoken, the familiar talk flows quietly over the hidden idea, as a rivulet may sparkle and dimple over something sunken in its bed. But speak the word, and it is like bringing up a drowned body out of the deepest pool of the rivulet, which has been aware of the horrible secret all along, in spite of its smiling surface. And even so, when Kenyon chanced to make a distinct reference to Donatello's relations with Miriam, though the subject was already in both their minds, a ghastly emotion rose up out of the depths of the young Count's heart. He trembled either with anger or terror, and glared at the sculptor with wild eyes, like a wolf that meets you in the forest, and hesitates whether to flee or turn to bay. But, as Kenyon still looked calmly at him, his aspect gradually became less disturbed, though far from resuming its former quietude. "'You have spoken her name,' said he, at last, in an altered and tremulous tone. "'Tell me, now, all that you know of her. "'I scarcely think that I have any later intelligence than yourself,' answered Kenyon. "'Miriam left Rome at about the time of your own departure, "'within a day or two after our last meeting at the Church of the Capuchins. "'I called at her studio and found it vacant. "'Whither she has gone, I cannot tell.' Donatello asked no further questions. They rose from table and strolled together about the premises, whiling away the afternoon with brief intervals of unsatisfactory conversation and many shadowy silences. The sculptor had a perception of change in his companion possibly of growth and development, but certainly of change, which saddened him, because it took away much of the simple grace that was the best of Donatello's peculiarities. Kenyon betook himself to repose that night in a grim, old, vaulted apartment which, in the lapse of five or six centuries, had probably been the birth, bridal, and death chamber of a great many generations of the Monte Benni family. He was aroused soon after daylight by the clamor of a tribe of beggars who had taken their stand in a little rustic lane that crept beside that portion of the villa and were addressing their petitions to the open windows. By and by they appeared to have received alms and took their departure. Some charitable Christian has sent these vagabonds away, thought the sculptor, as he resumed his interrupted nap. Who could it be? Donatello has his own rooms in the tower. Stella, Tommaso, and the cook are a world's width off and I fancied myself the only inhabitant in this part of the house. In the breadth and space which so delightfully characterize an Italian villa, a dozen guests might have had each his suite of apartments without infringing upon one another's ample precincts. But, so far as Kenyon knew, he was the only visitor beneath Donatello's widely 
extended roof. Chapter 25 Volume 2, Chapter 26 of The Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore in Aroostook County, Maine. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 2, Chapter 26 The Pedigree of Montebeni. From the old butler whom he found to be a very gracious and affable personage, Kenyon soon learned many curious particulars about the family history and hereditary peculiarities of the Counts of Montebeni. There was a pedigree, the later portion of which, that is to say, for a little more than a thousand years, a genealogist would have found delight in tracing out link by link and authenticating by records and documentary evidences. It would have been as difficult, however, to follow up the stream of Donatello's ancestry to its dim source as travellers have found it to reach the mysterious fountains of the Nile, and far beyond the region of definite and demonstrable fact, a romancer might have strayed into a region of old poetry, where the rich soil, so long uncultivated and untrodden, had lapsed into nearly its primeval state of wilderness. Among those antique paths, now overgrown with tangled and riotous vegetation, the wanderer must needs follow his own guidance, and arrive no whither at last. The race of Montebeni, beyond a doubt, was one of the oldest in Italy, where families appear to survive at least, if not to flourish, on their half-decayed roots, oftener than in England or France. It came down in a broad track from the Middle Ages, but at epochs anterior to those, it was distinctly visible, in the gloom of the period, before chivalry put forth its flower, and further still, we are almost afraid to say, it was seen, though with a fainter and wavering course, in the early morn of Christendom, when the Roman Empire had hardly begun to show symptoms of decline. At that venerable distance, the heralds gave up the lineage in despair. But where written record left the genealogy of Mount Beni, Tradition took it up, and carried it, without dread or shame, beyond the imperial ages, into the times of the Roman Republic, beyond those again, into the epoch of kingly rule. Nor even so remotely among the mossy centuries did it pause, but strayed onward into that grey antiquity of which there is no token left, save its cavernous tombs and a few bronzes, and some quaintly wrought ornaments of gold, and gems with mystic figures and inscriptions. There or thereabouts, the line was supposed to have had its origin in the sylvan life of Etruria, where Italy was yet guiltless of Rome. Of course, as we regret to say, the earlier and very much the larger portion of this respectable descent, and the same is true of many briefer pedigrees, must be looked upon as altogether mythical. Still, it threw a romantic interest around the unquestionable antiquity of the Montebeni family and over that tract of their own vines and fig-trees, beneath the shade of which they had unquestionably dwelt for immemorial ages. And there they had laid the foundations of their tower, so long ago that one half of its height was said to be sunken under the surface, and to hide subterranean chambers, which once were cheerful with the olden sunshine. One story, or myth, that had mixed itself up with their mouldy genealogy, interested the sculptor by its wild, and perhaps grotesque, yet not unfascinating, peculiarity. He caught at it the more eagerly, as it afforded a shadowy and whimsical semblance of explanation for the likeness which he, with Miriam and Hilda, had seen or fancied, between Donatello and the fawn of Praxiteles. The Montebeni family, as this legend averred, drew their origin from the Pelasgic race, who peopled Italy in times that may be called prehistoric. It was the same noble breed of men, of Asiatic birth, that settled in Greece, 
the same happy and poetic kindred who dwelt in Arcadia, and whether they ever lived such life or not, enrich the world with dreams, at least, and fables, lovely, if unsubstantial, of a golden age. In those delicious times, when deities and demigods appeared familiarly on earth, mingling with its inhabitants as friend with friend, when nymphs, satyrs, and the whole train of classic faith or fable hardly took pains to hide themselves in the primeval woods, at that auspicious period the lineage of Montebene had its rise. Its progenitor was a being not altogether human, yet partaking so largely of the gentlest human qualities as to be neither awful nor shocking to the imagination. A sylvan creature, native among the woods, had loved a mortal maiden, and, perhaps by kindness and the subtle courtesies which love might teach to his simplicity, or possibly by a ruder wooing, had won her to his haunts. In due time he gained her womanly affection, and making their bridal bower, for aught we know, in the hollow of a great tree, the pair spent a happy wedded life in that ancient neighborhood where now stood Donatello's tower. From this union sprang a vigorous progeny that took its place unquestioned among human families. In that age, however, and long afterwards, it showed the ineffaceable lineaments of its wild paternity. It was a pleasant and kindly race of men, but capable of savage fierceness and never quite restrainable within the trammels of social law. They were strong, active, genial, cheerful as the sunshine, passionate as the tornado. Their lives were rendered blissful by an unsought harmony with nature. But as centuries passed away, the fawn's wild blood had necessarily been attempered with constant intermixtures from the more ordinary streams of human life. It lost many of its original qualities, and served, for the most part, only to bestow an unconquerable vigor which kept the family from extinction and enabled them to make their own part good throughout the perils and rude emergencies of their interminable descent. In the constant wars with which Italy was plagued by the dissensions of her petty states and republics, there was a demand for native hardihood. The successive members of the Montebene family showed valor and policy enough, at all events, to keep their hereditary possessions out of the clutch of grasping neighbors, and probably differed very little from the other feudal barons with whom they fought and feasted. Such a degree of conformity with the manners of the generations through which it survived must have been essential to the prolonged continuance of the race. It is well known, however, that any hereditary peculiarity as a supernumerary finger or an anomalous shape of feature like the Austrian lip is wont to show itself in a family after a very wayward fashion. It skips at its own pleasure along the line, and latent for half a century or so, crops out again in a great-grandson. And thus it was said, from a period beyond memory or record, there had ever and anon been a descendant of the Montebenis bearing nearly all the characteristics that were attributed to the original founder of the race. Some traditions even went so far as to enumerate the ears, covered with a delicate fur, and shaped like a pointed leaf among the proofs of authentic descent which were seen in these favored individuals. We appreciate the beauty of such tokens of a nearer kindred to the great family of nature than other mortals bear. But it would be idle to ask credit for a statement which might be deemed to partake so largely of the grotesque. But it was indisputable that, once in a century or oftener, a son of Mount Abeni, gathered into himself the scattered qualities of his race, and reproduced the character that had been assigned to it from immemorial times. Beautiful, strong, brave, kindly, sincere of honest impulses, and endowed with simple tastes and the love of homely pleasures, he was believed to possess gifts by which he could associate himself with the wild things of the forests, and with the fowls of the air, and could feel a sympathy even with the trees, among which it was his joy to dwell. On the other hand, there were deficiencies both of intellect and heart, and especially, as it seemed, 
in the development of the higher portion of man's nature. These defects were less perceptible in early youth, but showed themselves more strongly with advancing age, when, as the animal spirits settled down upon a lower level, the representative of the Montebenis was apt to become sensual, addicted to gross pleasures, heavy, unsympathizing, and insulated with the narrow limits of a surly selfishness. A similar change, indeed, is no more than what we constantly observe to take place in persons who are not careful to substitute other graces for those which they inevitably lose along with the quick sensibility and joyous vivacity of youth. At worst, the reigning Count of Montebeni, as his hair grew white, was still a jolly old fellow over his flask of wine, the wine that Bacchus himself was fabled to have taught his sylvan ancestor how to express and from what choicest grapes, which would ripen only in a certain divinely favoured portion of the Montebeni vineyard. The family, be it observed, were both proud and ashamed of these legends. But whatever part of them they might consent to incorporate into their ancestral history, they steadily repudiated all that referred to their one distinctive feature, the pointed and furry ears. In a great many years past, no sober credence had been yielded to the mythical portion of the pedigree. It might, however, be considered as typifying some such assemblage of qualities, in this case chiefly remarkable for their simplicity and naturalness, as when they reappear in successive generations, constitute what we call family character. The sculptor found, moreover, on the evidence of some old portraits, that the physical features of the race had long been similar to what he now saw them in Donatello. With accumulating years, it is true, the Montebeni face had a tendency to look grim and savage, and in two or three instances the family pictures glared at the spectator in the eyes like some surly animal that had lost its good humor when it outlived its playfulness. The young Count accorded his guest full liberty to investigate the personal annals of these pictured worthies, as well as all the rest of his progenitors, and ample materials were at hand in many chests of worm-eaten papers and yellow parchments, that had been gathering into larger and dustier piles ever since the Dark Ages. But to confess the truth, the information afforded by these musty documents was so much more prosaic than what Kenyon acquired from Tommaso's legends, that even the superior authenticity of the former could not reconcile him to its dullness. What especially delighted the sculptor was the analogy between Donatello's character, as he himself knew it, and those peculiar traits which the old butler's narrative assumed to have been long hereditary in the race. He was amused at finding, too, that not only Tommaso, but the peasantry of the estate and neighboring village recognized his friend as a genuine Montebeni of the original type. They seemed to cherish a great affection for the young Count, and were full of stories about his sportive childhood, how he had played among the little rustics, and been at once the wildest and the sweetest of them all, and how in his very infancy he had plunged into the deep pools of the streamlets and never been drowned and had clambered to the topmost branches of tall trees without ever breaking his neck. No such mischance could happen to the sylvan child, because handling all the elements of nature so fearlessly and freely, nothing had either the power or the will to do him harm. He grew up, said these humble friends, the playmate not only of all mortal kind, but of creatures of the woods. Although when Kenyon pressed them for some particulars, of this latter mode of companionship, they could remember little more than a few anecdotes of a pet fox which used to growl and snap at everybody save Donatello himself. But they enlarged, and never were weary of the theme upon the blithesome effects of Donatello's presence in his rosy childhood and budding youth. Their hovels had always glowed like sunshine when he entered them, so that, as the peasants expressed it, their young master had never darkened a doorway in his life. He was the soul of vintage festivals. While he was a mere infant, scarcely able to run alone, it had been the custom to make him tread the wine-press with his tender little feet, if it were only to crush one cluster of the grapes. 
and the grape-juice that gushed beneath his childish tread, be it ever so small in quantity, suffice to impart a pleasant flavor to a whole cask of wine. The race of Montebeni, so these rustic chroniclers assured the sculptor, had possessed the gift from the oldest of old times of expressing good wine from ordinary grapes, and a ravishing liquor from the choice growth of their vineyard. In a word, as he listened to such tales as these, Kenyon could have imagined that the valleys and hillsides about him were a veritable Arcadia, and that Donatello was not merely a sylvan fawn, but the genial wine-god in his very person, making many allowances for the poetic fancies of Italian peasants, he set it down for fact, that his friend, in a simple way, and among rustic folks, had been an exceedingly delightful fellow in his younger days. But the contadini sometimes added, shaking their heads and sighing, that the young count was sadly changed since he went to Rome. The village girls now missed the merry smile with which he used to greet them. The sculptor inquired of his good friend Tommaso, whether he too had noticed the shadow which was said to have recently fallen over Donatello's life. "'Ah, yes, signore,' answered the old butler. "'It is even so, since he came back from that wicked and miserable city. The world has grown either too evil or else too wise and sad, for such men as the old counts of Montebene used to be. His very first taste of it, as you see, has changed and spoilt my poor young lord.' There had not been a single count in the family these hundred years or more who was so true a Montebeni of the antique stamp as this poor signorino. And now it brings the tears into my eyes to hear him sighing over a cup of sunshine. Ah, it is a sad world now. Then you think there was a merrier world once? asked Kenyon. Surely, signore, said Tommaso. A merrier world? and merrier counts of Montebene to live in it. Such tales of them as I have heard, when I was a child on my grandfather's knee. The good old man remembered a lord of Montebene. At least he had heard of such a one. Though I will not make oath upon the holy crucifix that my grandsire lived in his time, who used to go into the woods and call pretty damsels out of the fountains and out of the trunks of the old trees. That merry lord was known to dance with them a whole long summer afternoon. When shall we see such frolics in our days? Not soon, I am afraid, acquiesced the sculptor. You are right, excellent Tommaso. The world is sadder now. And in truth, while our friend smiled at these wild fables, he sighed in the same breath. To think how the once genial earth produces in every successive generation fewer flowers than used to gladden the preceding ones. Not that the modes and seeming possibilities of human enjoyment are rarer in our refined and softened era. On the contrary, they never before were nearly so abundant. But that mankind are getting so far beyond the childhood of their race that they scorn to be happy any longer. A simple and joyous character can find no place for itself among the sage and sombre figures that would put his unsophisticated cheerfulness to shame. The entire system of man's affairs, as at present established, is built up purposely to exclude the careless and happy soul. The very children would upbraid the wretched individual who should endeavor to take life and the world as what we might naturally suppose them meant for, a place and opportunity for enjoyment. It is the iron rule in our day to require an object and a purpose in life. It makes us all parts of a complicated scheme of progress, which can only result in our arrival at a colder and drearier region than we were born in. It insists upon everybody's adding somewhat, a mite perhaps, but earned by incessant effort, to an accumulated pile of usefulness, of which the only use will be to burden our posterity with even heavier thoughts and more inordinate labor than our own. No life now wanders like an unfettered stream. There is a mill-wheel for the tiniest rivulet to turn. We go all wrong by too strenuous a resolution to go all right. Therefore it was. So at least the sculptor thought, although partly suspicious of Donatello's darker misfortune, that the young Count found it impossible nowadays 
to be what his forefathers had been. He could not live their healthy life of animal spirits, in their sympathy with nature, and brotherhood with all that breathed around them. Nature in beast, fowl, and tree, and earth, flood, and sky, is what it was of old, but sin, care, and self-consciousness have set the human portion of the world askew, and thus the simplest character is ever the soonest to go astray. At any rate, Tommaso, said Kenyon, doing his best to comfort the old man, let us hope that your young lord will still enjoy himself at vintage time. By the aspect of the vineyard, I judge that this will be a famous year for the golden wine of Montebene. As long as your grapes produce that admirable liquor, sad as you think the world, neither the Count nor his guests will quite forget to smile. Ah, signore, rejoined the butler with a sigh, but he scarcely wets his lips with the sunny juice. There is yet another hope, observed Kenyon. The young Count may fall in love and bring home a fair and laughing wife to chase the gloom out of yonder old frescoed saloon. Do you think he could do a better thing, my good Tommaso? Maybe not, signore, said the sage butler, looking earnestly at him. And maybe not a worse. The sculptor fancied that the good old man had it partly in his mind to make some remark or communicate some fact, which on second thoughts he resolved to keep concealed in his own breast. He now took his departure cellarward, shaking his white head and muttering to himself, and did not reappear till dinner-time, when he favoured Kenyon, whom he had taken far into his good graces, with a choicer flask of sunshine than had yet blessed his palate. To say the truth, this golden wine was no unnecessary ingredient towards making the life of Montebene palatable. It seemed a pity that Donatello did not drink a little more of it, and go jollily to bed at least, even if he should awake, with an accession of darker melancholy the next morning. Nevertheless, there was no lack of outward means for leading an agreeable life in the old villa. Wandering musicians haunted the precincts of Montebeni, where they seemed to claim a prescriptive right. They made the lawn and shrubbery tuneful with the sound of fiddle, harp, and flute, and now and then with the tangled squeaking of a bagpipe. Improvisatory, likewise came and told tales of recited verses to the contadini, among whom Kenyon was often an auditor, after their day's work in the vineyard. Jugglers, too, obtained permission to do feats of magic in the hall, where they set even the sage Tommaso and Stella, Girolamo and the peasant girls from the farmhouse, all of a broad grin, between merriment and wonder. These good people got food and lodging for their pleasant pains, and some of the small wine of Tuscany, and a reasonable handful of the Grand Duke's copper coin, to keep up the hospitable renown of Montebeni. But very seldom had they the young Count as a listener or a spectator. There were sometimes dances by moonlight on the lawn, but never since he came from Rome did Donatello's presence deepen the blushes of the pretty contadinas, or his footstep weary out the most agile partner or competitor, as once it was sure to do. Paupers, for this kind of vermin, infested the house of Montebeni, worse than any other spot in beggar-haunted Italy, stood beneath all the windows, making loud supplication or even establishing themselves on the marble steps of the grand entrance. They ate and drank and filled their bags and pocketed the little money that was given them, and went forth on their devious ways, showering blessings, innumerable on the mansion and its lord, and on the souls of his deceased forefathers, who had always been just such simpletons as to be compassionate to beggary. But in spite of their favorable prayers— by which Italian philanthropists set great store, a cloud seemed to hang over these once Arcadian precincts, and to be dark. Chapter 27, Volume 2 of The Marble Fawn This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne 
Volume Two, Chapter Twenty Seven Myths. After the sculptor's arrival, however, the young count sometimes came down from his forlorn elevation and rambled with him among the neighboring woods and hills. He led his friend to many enchanting nooks with which he himself had been familiar in his childhood. But of late, as he remarked to Kenyon, a sort of strangeness had overgrown them, like clusters of dark shrubbery, so that he hardly recognized the places which he had known and loved so well. To the sculptor's eye, nevertheless, they were still rich with beauty. They were picturesque in that sweetly impressive way where wildness, in a long lapse of years, has crept over scenes that have been once adorned with the careful art and toil of man. And when man could do no more for them, time and nature came, and wrought hand in hand, to bring them to a soft and venerable perfection. There grew the fig tree, that had run wild and taken to wife the vine, which likewise had gone rampant out of all human control, so that the two wild things had tangled and knotted themselves into a wild marriage bond, and hung their various progeny, the luscious figs, the grapes, oozy with the southern juice, and both endowed with a wild flavor that added the final charm, on the same bough together. In Kenyon's opinion, never was any other nook so lovely as a certain little dell which he and Donatello visited. It was hollowed in among the hills, and opened to a glimpse of the broad, fertile valley. A fountain had its birth here, and fell into a marble basin, which was all covered with moss and shaggy with water-weeds. Over the gush of the small stream, with an urn in her arms, stood a marble nymph, whose nakedness the moss had kindly clothed as with a garment, and the long trails and tresses of the maidenhair had done what they could in the poor thing's behalf by hanging themselves about her waist. In former days, it might be a remote antiquity, this lady of the fountain had first received the infant tied into her urn and poured it thence into the marble basin. But now the sculptured urn had a great crack from top to bottom, and the discontented nymph was compelled to see the basin fill itself through a channel which she could not control, although with water long ago consecrated to her. For this reason or some other, she looked terribly forlorn, and you might have fancied that the whole fountain was but the overflow of her lonely tears. This was a place that I used greatly to delight in, remarked Donatello, sighing. As a child and as a boy, I have been very happy here. And as a man, I should ask no fitter place to be happy in, answered Kenyon. But you, my friend, are of such a social nature, that I should hardly have thought these lonely haunts would take your fancy. It is a place for a poet to dream in and people it with the beings of his imagination. I am no poet that I know of, said Donatello, but yet, as I tell you, I have been very happy here, in the company of this fountain and this nymph. It is said that a fawn, my oldest forefather, brought home hither to this very spot a human maiden, whom he loved and wedded. This spring of delicious water was their household well. It is a most enchanting fable, exclaimed Kenyon, that is, if it be not a fact. And why not a fact? said the simple Donatello. There is likewise another sweet old story connected with this spot. But now that I remember it, it seems to me more sad than sweet, though formerly the sorrow in which it closes did not so much impress me. If I had the gift of tale-telling, this one would be sure to interest you mightily. Pray tell it, said Kenyon. No matter whether well or ill, these legends have often the most powerful charm when least artfully told. So the young Count narrated a myth of one of his progenitors. He might have lived a century ago, or a thousand years, or before the Christian epoch, for anything that Donatello knew to the contrary, who had made acquaintance with a fair creature belonging to this fountain. Whether woman or sprite was a mystery, as was all else about her, except that her life and soul were somehow interfused throughout the gushing water. She was a fresh, cool, dewy thing, sunny and shadowy, full of pleasant little mischiefs, fitful and changeable with the whim of the moment, but yet as constant as her native stream, which kept the same gush and flow forever, while marble crumbled over and around it. The fountain woman loved the youth, a knight, as Donatello called him, 
for according to the legend his race was akin to hers. At least, whether kin or no, there had been friendship and sympathy of old betwixt an ancestor of his, with furry ears, and the long-lived lady of the fountain. And after all those ages, she was still as young as a May morning, and as frolicsome as a bird upon a tree, or a breeze that makes merry with the leaves. She taught him how to call her from her pebbly source, and they spent many a happy hour together, more especially in the fervor of the summer days. For often, as he sat waiting for her, by the margin of the spring, she would suddenly fall down around him in a shower of sunny raindrops, with a rainbow glancing through them, and forthwith gather herself up into the likeness of a beautiful girl, laughing, or was it the warble of the rill over the pebbles, to see the youth's amazement. Thus, kind maiden that she was, the hot atmosphere became deliciously cool and fragrant for this favored night, and furthermore, when he knelt down to drink out of the spring, nothing was more common than for a pair of rosy lips to come up out of its little depths and touch his mouth with the thrill of a sweet, cool, dewy kiss. "'It is a delightful story for the hot noon of our Tuscan summer,' observed the sculptor at this point. "'But the deportment of the watery lady must have had a most chilling influence in midwinter. Her lover—' would find it, very literally, a cold reception. "'I suppose,' said Donatello, rather sulkily, "'you are making fun of the story. But I see nothing laughable in the thing itself, nor in what you say about it.' He went on to relate that for a long while the knight found infinite pleasure and comfort in the friendship of the fountain nymph. In his merriest hours she gladdened him with her sport of humour. If ever he was annoyed with earthly trouble— she laid her moist hand upon his brow, and charmed the fret and fever quite away. But one day, one fatal noontide, the young knight came rushing with hasty and irregular steps to the accustomed fountain. He called the nymph, but, no doubt because there was something unusual and frightful in his tone, she did not appear nor answer him. He flung himself down and washed his hands and bathed his feverish brow in the cool, pure water. And then there was a sound of woe. It might have been a woman's voice. It might have been only the sighing of the brook over the pebbles. The water shrank away from the youth's hands, and left his brow as dry and feverish as before. Donatello here came to a dead pause. "'Why did the water shrink from this unhappy night?' inquired the sculptor. "'Because he had tried to wash off a blood-stain,' said the young Count in a horror-stricken whisper. The guilty man had polluted the pure water. The nymph might have comforted him in sorrow, but could not cleanse his conscience of a crime. "'And did he never behold her more?' asked Kenyon. "'Never but once,' replied his friend. "'He never beheld her blessed face but once again. And then there was a bloodstain on the poor nymph's brow. It was the stain his guilt had left in the fountain where he tried to wash it off. He mourned for her his whole life long, and employed the best sculptor of the time to carve the statue of the nymph from his description of her aspect. But though my ancestor would fain have had the image wear her happiest look, the artist, unlike yourself, was so impressed with the mournfulness of the story, that in spite of his best efforts he made her forlorn and forever weeping, as you see. Kenyon found a certain charm in this simple legend. Whether so intended or not, he understood it as an apologue, typifying the soothing and genial effects of an habitual intercourse with nature, in all ordinary cares and griefs, while, on the other hand, her mild influences fall short in their effect upon the ruder passions, and are altogether powerless in the dread, fever-fit, or deadly chill of guilt. "'Do you say,' he asked, "'that the nymph's face has never since been shown to any mortal? "'Methinks you, by your native qualities, are as well entitled to her favor as ever your progenitor could have been. Why have you not summoned her? I called her often when I was a silly child, answered Donatello, and he added in an inward voice, Thank heaven she did not come. Then you never saw her, said the sculptor. Never in my life, rejoined the Count. No, my dear friend, I have not seen the nymph, although here by her fountain I used to make many strange acquaintances. For from my earliest childhood 
and I was familiar with whatever creatures haunt the woods. You would have laughed to see the friends I had among them. Yes, among the wild, nimble things, that reckoned man their deadliest enemy. How it was first taught me, I cannot tell. But there was a charm, a voice, a murmur, a kind of chant, by which I called the woodland inhabitants, the furry people, and the feathered people, in a language that they seemed to understand. I have heard of such a gift, responded the sculptor gravely, but never before met with a person endowed with it. Pray try the charm, and lest I should frighten your friends away, I will withdraw into this thicket and merely peep at them. I doubt, said Donatello, whether they will remember my voice now. It changes, you know, as the boy grows toward manhood. Nevertheless, as the young Count's good nature and easy persuadability were among his best characteristics, he set about complying with Kenyon's request. The latter, in his concealment among the shrubberies, heard him send forth a sort of modulated breath, wild, rude, yet harmonious. It struck the auditor as at once the strangest and the most natural utterance that had ever reached his ears. Any idle boy, it should seem, singing to himself and setting his wordless song to no other or more definite tune than the play of his own pulses, might produce a sound almost identical with this. And yet it was as individual as a murmur of the breeze. Donatello tried it over and over again, with many breaks at first, and pauses of uncertainty, then with more confidence and a fuller swell, like a wayfarer, groping out of obscurity into the light and moving with freer footsteps as it brightens around him. Anon his voice appeared to fill the air, yet not with an obtrusive clangor. The sound was of a murmurous character, soft, attractive, persuasive, friendly. The sculptor fancied that such might have been the original voice and utterance of the natural man, before the sophistication of the human intellect formed what we now call language. In this broad dialect, broad as the sympathies of nature, the human brother might have spoken to his inarticulate brotherhood that prowl the woods or soar upon the wing, and have been intelligible to such extent as to win their confidence. The sound had its pathos, too. At some of its simple cadences, the tears came quietly into Kenyon's eyes. They welled up slowly from his heart, which was thrilling with an emotion more delightful than he had often felt before, but which he forbore to analyze, lest, if he seized it, it should at once perish in his grasp. Donatello paused two or three times, and seemed to listen. Then recommencing, he poured his spirit and life more earnestly into the strain. And finally, or else the sculptor's hope and imagination deceived him, soft treads were audible among the fallen leaves. There was a rustling among the shrubbery, a whir of wings, moreover, that hovered in the air. It may have been all an illusion, but Kenyon fancied that he could distinguish the stealthy, cat-like movement of some small forest citizen and that he could even see its doubtful shadow, if not really its substance. But all at once, whatever might be the reason, there ensued a hurried rush and scamper of little feet, and then the sculptor heard a wild, sorrowful cry, and through the crevices of the thicket beheld Donatello fling himself on the ground. Emerging from his hiding-place, he saw no living thing, save a brown lizard. It was of the tarantula species, rustling away through the sunshine. To all present appearance, this venomous reptile was the only creature that had responded to the young Count's efforts to renew his intercourse with the lower orders of nature. "'What has happened to you?' exclaimed Kenyon, stooping down over his friend and wondering at the anguish which he betrayed. "'Death! Death!' sobbed Donatello. "'They know it!' He growled beside the fountain, in a fit of such passionate sobbing and weeping, that it seemed as if his heart had broken and spilt its wild sorrows upon the ground. His unrestrained grief and childish tears made Kenyon sensible in how small a degree the customs and restraints of society had really acted upon this young man, in spite of the quietude of his ordinary deportment. In response to his friend's efforts to console him, he murmured words hardly more articulate than the strange chant which he had so recently been breathing into the air. They know it! was all that Kenyon could yet distinguish. They know it! Who know it? 
asked the sculptor, and what is it they know? They know it, replied Donatello, trembling. They shun me. All nature shrinks from me and shudders at me. I live in the midst of a curse that hems me round with a circle of fire. No innocent thing can come near me. Be comforted, my dear friend, said Kenyon, kneeling beside him. You labor under some illusion, but no curse. As for this strange natural spell, which you have been exercising, and of which I have heard before, though I never believed in, nor expected to witness it, I am satisfied that you still possess it. It was my own half-concealed presence, no doubt, and some involuntary little movement of mine that scared away your forest friends. They are friends of mine no longer, answered Donatello. We all of us, as we grow older, rejoined Kenyon, lose somewhat of our proximity to nature. It is the price we pay for experience. A heavy price, then, said Donatello, rising from the ground. But we will speak no more of it. Forget this scene, my dear friend. In your eyes it must look very absurd. It is a grief, I presume, to all men, to find the pleasant privileges and properties of early life departing from them. That grief has now befallen me. Well, I shall waste no more tears for such a cause. Nothing else made Kenyon so sensible of a change in Donatello as his newly acquired power of dealing with his own emotions. And after a struggle, more or less fierce, thrusting them down into the prison cells, where he usually kept them confined. The restraint which he now put upon himself, and the mask of dull composure which he succeeded in clasping over his still beautiful and once fawn-like face, affected the sensitive sculptor more sadly than even the unrestrained passion of the preceding scene. It is a very miserable epoch, when the evil necessities of life in our torturous world first get the better of us so far as to compel us to attempt throwing a cloud over our transparency. Simplicity increases in value the longer we can keep it, and the further we carry it onward into life. The loss of a child's simplicity, in the inevitable lapse of years, causes but a natural sigh or two, because even his mother feared that he could not keep it always. But after a young man has brought it through his childhood, and has still worn it in his bosom, not as an early dewdrop, but as a diamond of pure white luster. It is a pity to lose it, then. And thus when Kenyon saw how much his friend had now to hide, and how well he hid it, he would have wept, although his tears would have been even idler than those which Donatello had just shed. They parted on the lawn before the house, the Count to climb his tower, and the sculptor to read an antique edition of Dante, which he had found among some old volumes of Catholic devotion, in a seldom-visited room. Tommaso met him in the entrance hall, and showed a desire to speak. "'Our poor signorino looks very sad to-day,' he said. "'Even so, good Tommaso,' replied the sculptor. "'Would that we could raise his spirits a little.' "'There might be means, signore,' answered the old butler, "'if one might but be sure that they were the right ones. "'We men are but rough nurses for a sick body or a sick spirit.' "'Women, you would say, my good friend, are better,' said the sculptor, struck by an intelligence in the butler's face. "'That is possible, but it depends.' Volume 2, Chapter 28 of The Marble Fawn this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume 2, Chapter 28, The Owl Tower. "'Will you not show me your tower?' said the sculptor one day to his friend. "'It is plainly enough to be seen, methinks,' answered the Count, with a kind of sulkiness that often appeared in him as one of the little symptoms of inward trouble." "'Yes, its exterior is visible far and wide,' said Kenyon. "'But such a grey, moss-grown tower as this, however valuable as an object of scenery, will certainly be quite as interesting inside as out. It cannot be less than six hundred years old. The foundations and lower story are much older than that, I should judge, and traditions probably cling to the walls within quite as plentifully as the grey and yellow lichens cluster on its face without.' "'No doubt.' 
replied Donatello, but I know little of such things, and never could comprehend the interest which some of you forestieri take in them. A year or two ago, an English signore with a venerable white beard, they say he was a magician too, came hither from as far off as Florence just to see my tower. Ah, I have seen him at Florence, observed Canyon. He is a necromancer, as you say, and dwells in an old mansion of the Knights Templars, close by the Ponte Vecchio, with a great many ghostly books, pictures, and antiquities to make the house gloomy, and one bright-eyed little girl to keep it cheerful. I know him only by his white beard, said Donatello, but he could have told you a great deal about the tower, and the sieges which it has stood, and the prisoners who have been confined in it, and he gathered up all the traditions of the Montebene family, and among the rest the sad one which I told you at the fountain the other day. He had known mighty poets, he said, in his earlier life, and the most illustrious of them would have rejoiced to preserve such a legend in a mortal rhyme, especially if he could have had some of our wine of sunshine to help out his inspiration. Any man might be a poet, as well as Byron, with such wine and such a theme— rejoined the sculptor. But shall we climb your tower? The thunderstorm gathering yonder among the hills will be a spectacle worth witnessing. Come, then, said the Count, adding with a sigh, it has a weary staircase in dismal chambers, and it is very lonesome at the summit. Like a man's life when he has climbed to eminence, remarked the sculptor, or let us rather say, with its difficult steps and the dark prison cells you speak of, your tower resembles the spiritual experience of many a sinful soul, which, nevertheless, may struggle upward into the pure air and light of heaven at last. Donatello sighed again, and led the way up into the tower. Mounting the broad staircase that ascended from the entrance hall, they traversed the great wilderness of a house, through some obscure passages, and came to a low ancient doorway. It admitted them to a narrow turret stair, which zigzagged upward, lighted in its progress by loopholes in iron-barred windows. Reaching the top of the first flight, the Count threw open a door of worm-eaten oak, and disclosed a chamber that occupied the whole area of the tower. It was most pitiably forlorn of aspect, with a brick-paved floor, bare holes through the massive walls, grated with iron, instead of windows, and for furniture an old stool, which increased the dreariness of the place tenfold, by suggesting an idea of its having once been tenanted. "'This was a prisoner's cell in the old days,' said Donatello. "'The white-bearded necromancer, of whom I told you, found out that a certain famous monk was confined here about five hundred years ago. He was a very holy man, and was afterwards burned at the stake in the Grand Ducal Square at Firenze.' There have always been stories, Tommaso says, of a hooded monk creeping up and down these stairs, or standing in the doorway of this chamber. It must needs be the ghost of the ancient prisoner. Do you believe in ghosts? I can hardly tell, replied Kenyon. On the whole, I think not. Neither do I, responded the Count. For if spirits ever come back, I should surely have met one within these two months past. Ghosts never rise. So much I know, and am glad to know it. Following the narrow staircase still higher, they came to another room of similar size, and equally forlorn, but inhabited by two personages of a race, which from time immemorial have held proprietorship and occupancy in ruined towers. These were a pair of owls, who, being doubtless acquainted with Donatello, showed little sign of alarm at the entrance of visitors. They gave a dismal croak or two, and hopped aside into the darkest corner, since it was not yet their hour to flap duskily abroad. "'They do not desert me, like my other feathered acquaintances,' observed the young Count, with a sad smile, alluding to the scene which Kenyon had witnessed at the fountainside. "'When I was a wild, playful boy, the owls did not love me half so well.' He made no further pause here, but led his friend up another flight of steps, while at every stage the windows and narrow loopholes afforded Kenyon more extensive eye-shots over hill and valley, and allowed him to taste the cool purity of mid-atmosphere. 
At length they reached the topmost chamber, directly beneath the roof of the tower. "'This is my own abode,' said Donatello, "'my own owl's nest.' In fact, the room was fitted up as a bedchamber, though in a style of the utmost simplicity. It likewise served as an oratory, there being a crucifix in one corner, and a multitude of holy emblems, such as Catholics judge it necessary to help their devotion withal. Several ugly little prints, representing the sufferings of the Saviour, and the martyrdoms of saints, hung on the wall, and behind the crucifix there was a good copy of Titian's Magdalene of the Pity Palace, clad only in the flow of her golden ringlets. She had a confident look, but it was Titian's fault, not the penitent woman's, as if expecting to win heaven by the free display of her earthly charms. Inside of a glass case appeared an image of the sacred Bambino in the guise of a little waxen boy, very prettily made up, reclining among flowers like a cupid, and holding up a heart that resembled a bit of red sealing wax. A small vase of precious marble was full of holy water. Beneath the crucifix, on a table, lay a human skull, which looked as if it might have been dug up out of some old grave. But examining it more closely, Kenyon saw that it was carved in gray alabaster, most skillfully done to the death, with accurate imitation of the teeth, the sutures, the empty eye-caverns, and the fragile little bones of the nose. This hideous emblem rested on a cushion of white marble, so nicely wrought that you seemed to see the impression of the heavy skull in a silken and downy substance. Donatello dipped his fingers into the holy water vase, and crossed himself. After doing so, he trembled. "'I have no right to make the sacred symbol on a sinful breast,' he said." "'On what mortal breast can it be made, then?' asked the sculptor. "'Is there one that hides no sin?' "'But these blessed emblems make you smile, I fear,' resumed the Count, looking askance at his friend. "'You heretics, I know, attempt to pray without even a crucifix to kneel at. "'I, at least, whom you call a heretic, reverence that holy symbol,' answered Kenyon. "'What I am most inclined to murmur at is this death's head.' I could laugh, moreover, in its ugly face. It is absurdly monstrous, my dear friend, thus to fling the dead weight of our mortality upon our immortal hopes. While we live on earth, tis true we must needs carry our skeletons about with us. But for heaven's sake, do not let us burden our spirits with them, in our feeble efforts to soar upward. Believe me, it will change the whole aspect of death if you can once disconnect it in your idea with that corruption from which it disengages our higher part. "'I do not well understand you,' said Donatello. And he took up the alabaster skull, shuddering and evidently feeling a kind of penance to touch it. "'I only know that this skull has been in my family for centuries. Old Tommaso has a story that it was copied by a famous sculptor from the skull of that same unhappy knight who loved the fountain lady and lost her by a bloodstain.' He lived and died with a deep sense of sin upon him, and on his deathbed he ordained that this token of him should go down to his posterity. And my forefathers, being a cheerful race of men in their natural disposition, found it needful to have the skull often before their eyes, because they dearly loved life and its enjoyments, and hated the very thought of death. I am afraid, said Kenyon, they liked it none the better, for seeing its face under this abominable mask. Without further discussion, the Count led the way up one more flight of stairs, at the end of which they emerged upon the summit of the tower. The sculptor felt as if his being were suddenly magnified a hundredfold. So wide was the Umbrian valley, that suddenly opened before him, set in its grand framework of nearer and more distant hills. It seemed as if all Italy lay under his eyes in that one picture, for there was the broad, sunny smile of God, which we fancy to be spread over that favoured land more abundantly than on other regions, and beneath it glowed a most rich and varied fertility. The trim vineyards were there, and the fig trees, and the mulberries, and the smoky-hued tracks of the olive orchards. There too were fields of every kind of grain, among which waved the Indian corn, putting Kenyon in mind of the fondly remembered acres of his father's homestead. White villas, grey convents, church spires, villages, towns, each with its battlemented walls and towered gateway, were scattered upon this spacious map, 
A river gleamed across it, and lakes opened their blue eyes in its face, reflecting heaven, lest mortals should forget that better land when they beheld the earth so beautiful. What made the valley look still wider was the two or three varieties of weather that were visible on its surface, all at the same instant of time. Here lay the quiet sunshine, there fell the great black patches of ominous shadow from the clouds, and behind them, like a giant of league-long strides, came hurrying the thunderstorm which had already swept midway across the plain. In the rear of the approaching tempest brightened forth again the sunny splendor, which its progress had darkened with so terrible a frown. All round this majestic landscape, the bald-peaked or forest-crowned mountains descended boldly upon the plain. On many of their spurs in midway declivities, and even on their summits, stood cities, some of them famous of old, for these had been the seats and nurseries of early art, where the flower of beauty sprang out of a rocky soil, and in a high, keen atmosphere, when the richest and most sheltered gardens failed to nourish it. "'Thank God for letting me again behold this scene,' said the sculptor, a devout man in his way, reverently taking off his hat. "'I have viewed it from many points, and never without as full a sensation of gratitude as my heart seems capable of feeling.' how it strengthens the poor human spirit in its reliance on his providence, to ascend but this little way above the common level, and so attain a somewhat wider glimpse of his dealings with mankind. He doeth all things right. His will be done. You discern something that is hidden from me, observed Donatello, gloomily, yet striving with unwanted grasp, to catch the analogies which so cheered his friend. I see sunshine in one spot, and cloud in another, and no reason for it in either case. The sun on you, the cloud on me. What comfort can I draw from this? Nay, I cannot preach, said Kenyon, with a page of heaven and a page of earth spread wide open before us. Only begin to read it, and you will find it interpreting itself without the aid of words. It is a great mistake to try to put our best thoughts into human language. When we ascend into the higher regions of emotion and spiritual enjoyment, they are only expressible by such grand hieroglyphics as these around us. They stood a while contemplating the scene, but as inevitably happens after a spiritual flight, it was not long before the sculptor felt his wings flagging in the rarity of the upper atmosphere. He was glad to let himself quietly downward, out of the mid-sky, as it were, and alight on the solid platform of the battlemented tower. He looked about him, and beheld growing out of the stone pavement which formed the roof, a little shrub with green and glossy leaves. It was the only green thing there, and heaven knows how its seeds had ever been planted at that airy height, or how it had found nourishment for its small life in the chinks of the stones. For it had no earth, and nothing more like soil than the crumbling mortar, which had been crammed into the crevices in a long past age. Yet the plant seemed fond of its native site, and Donatello said it had always grown there, from his earliest remembrance, and never he believed any smaller or any larger than they saw it now. "'I wonder if the shrub teaches you any good lesson,' said he, observing the interest with which Kenyon examined it. "'If the wide valley has a great meaning, the plant ought to have at least a little one, and it has been growing on our tower long enough to have learned how to speak it.' "'Oh, certainly,' answered the sculptor. The shrub has its moral, or it would have perished long ago, and no doubt it is for your use and edification, since you have had it before your eyes all your lifetime, and now are moved to ask what may be its lesson. It teaches me nothing, said the simple Donatello, stooping over the plant, and perplexing himself with a minute scrutiny. Volume Two, Chapter Twenty Nine of the Marble Faun. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Faun by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume Two, Chapter Twenty Nine. 
on the battlements. The sculptor now looked through art embrasure and threw down a bit of lime, watching its fall till it struck upon a stone bench at the rocky foundation of the tower and flew into many fragments. "'Pray pardon me for helping time to crumble away your ancestral walls,' said he. "'But I am one of those persons who have a natural tendency to climb heights, and to stand on the verge of them measuring the depth below. If I were to do just as I like at this moment, I should fling myself down after that bit of lime. It is a very singular temptation, and all but irresistible.' Partly, I believe, because it might be so easily done, and partly because such momentous consequences would ensue without my being compelled to wait a moment for them. Have you never felt this strange impulse of an evil spirit at your back, showing you towards a precipice? Ah, no! cried Donatello, shrinking from the battlemented wall with a face of horror. I cling to life in a way which you cannot conceive. It has been so rich, so warm, so sunny, and beyond its verge nothing but the chilly dark. And then a fall from a precipice is such an awful death. Nay, if it be a great height, said Kenyon, a man would leave his life in the air, and never feel the hard shock at the bottom. "'That is not the way with this kind of death,' exclaimed Donatello in a low, horror-stricken voice, which grew higher and more full of emotion as he proceeded. "'Imagine a fellow-creature, breathing now and looking you in the face, and now tumbling down, 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 with a long shriek wavering after him all the way. He does not leave his life in the air, no,' but it keeps in him till he thumps against the stones a horrible long while. Then he lies there frightfully quiet, a dead heap of bruised flesh and broken bones. A quiver runs through the crushed mass, and no more movement after that. No, not if you would give your soul to make him stir a finger. Ah, terrible! Yes, yes! I would fain fling myself down for the very dread of it, that I might endure it once for all, and dream of it no more. How forcibly, how frightfully you conceive this, said the sculptor, aghast at the passionate horror which was betrayed in the Count's words, and still more in his wild gestures and ghastly look. Nay, if the height of your tower affects your imagination thus— you do wrong to trust yourself here in solitude, and in the night-time and at all unguarded hours. You are not safe in your chamber. It is but a step or two, and what if a vivid dream should lead you up hither at midnight and act itself out as a reality? Donatello had hidden his face in his hands and was leaning against the parapet. No fear of that, said he. Whatever the dream may be, I am too genuine a coward to act out my own death in it. The paroxysm passed away, and the two friends continued their desultory talk, very much as if no such interruption had occurred. Nevertheless it affected the sculptor with infinite pity to see this young man, who had been born to gladness as an assured heritage, now involved in a misty bewilderment of grievous thoughts, amid which he seemed to go staggering blindfold. Kenyon, not without an unshaped suspicion of the definite fact, knew that his condition must have resulted from the weight and gloom of life, now first through the agency of a secret trouble, making themselves felt on a character that had heretofore breathed only an atmosphere of joy. The effect of this hard lesson upon Donatello's intellect and disposition was very striking. It was perceptible that he had already had glimpses of strange and subtle matters in those dark caverns into which all men must descend, 
if they would know anything beneath the surface and elusive pleasures of existence. And when they emerge, though dazzled and blinded by the first glare of daylight, they take truer and sadder views of life for ever afterwards. From some mysterious source, as the sculptor felt assured, a soul had been inspired into the young Count's simplicity since their intercourse in Rome. He now showed a far deeper sense, and an intelligence that began to deal with high subjects, though in a feeble and childish way. He evinced, too, a more definite and nobler individuality, but developed out of grief and pain, and fearfully conscious of the pangs that had given it birth. Every human life, if it descends to truth or delves down to reality, must undergo a similar change. But sometimes, perhaps, the instruction comes without the sorrow, and oftener the sorrow teaches no lesson that abides with us. In Donatello's case, it was pitiful and almost ludicrous to observe the confused struggle that he made how completely he was taken by surprise, how ill-prepared he stood on this old battlefield of the world, to fight with such an inevitable foe as mortal calamity, and sin for its stronger ally. And yet, thought Kenyon, the poor fellow bears himself like a hero too. If he would only tell me his trouble, or give me an opening to speak frankly about it, I might help him but he finds it too horrible to be uttered, and fancies himself the only mortal that ever felt the anguish of remorse. Yes, he believes that nobody ever endured his agony before, so that, sharp enough in itself, it has all the additional zest of a torture just invented to plague him individually. The sculptor endeavoured to dismiss the painful subject from his mind, and leaning against the battlements, he turned his face southward and westward, and gazed across the breadth of the valley. His thoughts flew far beyond even those wide boundaries, taking an airline from Donatello's tower to another turret that ascended into the sky of the summer afternoon, invisibly to him, above the roofs of distant Rome then rose tumultuously into his consciousness that strong love for hilda which it was his habit to confine in one of the heart's inner chambers because he had found no encouragement to bring it forward but now he felt a strange pull at his heart-strings it could not have been more perceptible if all the way between these battlements and hilda's dovecot had stretched an exquisitely sensitive cord, which at the hither end was knotted with his aforesaid heart-strings, and at the remoter one was grasped by a gentle hand. His breath grew tremulous. He put his hand to his breast. So distinctly did he seem to feel that cord drawn once, and again, and again, as if, though still it was bashfully intimated, there were an importunate demand for his presence. Oh, for the white wings of Hilda's doves, that he might have flown thither and alighted at the Virgin's shrine! But lovers, and Kenya knew it well, projected so lifelike a copy of their mistresses out of their own imaginations, that it can pull at the heart-strings almost as perceptibly as the genuine original. No airy intimations are to be trusted, no evidences of responsive affection less positive than whispered and broken words, or tender pressures of the hand, allowed and half-returned, or glances that distill many passionate avowals into one gleam of richly coloured light. Even those should be weighed rigorously, at the instant, for, in another instant, the imagination seizes on them as its property, and stamps them with its own arbitrary value. But Hilda's maidenly reserve had given her lover no such tokens, 
to be interpreted either by his hopes or fears. "'Yonder over mountain and valley lies Rome,' said the sculptor. "'Shall you return thither in the autumn?' "'Never. I hate Rome,' answered Donatello, "'and have good cause.' and yet it was a pleasant winter that we spent there observed kenyon and with pleasant friends about us you would meet them again there all of them all asked donatello all to the best of my belief said the sculptor but you need not go to rome to seek them if there were one of those friends whose lifetime was twisted with your own I am enough of a fatalist to feel assured that you will meet that one again, wonder whither you may. Neither can we escape the companions whom Providence assigns for us, by climbing an old tower like this. Yet the stairs are steep and dark, rejoined the Count. None but yourself would seek me here, or find me if they sought. As Donatello did not take advantage of this opening which his friend had kindly afforded him to pour out his hidden troubles, the latter again threw aside the subject, and returned to the enjoyment of the scene before him. The thunderstorm which he had beheld striding across the valley had passed to the left of Montebene, and was continuing its march towards the hills that formed the boundary on the eastward. Above the whole valley, indeed, the sky was heavy with tumbling vapours, interspersed with which were tracts of blue, vividly brightened by the sun. But in the east, where the tempest was yet trailing its ragged skirts, lay a dusky region of cloud and sullen mist, in which some of the hills appeared of a dark purple hue. Others became so indistinct that the spectator could not tell rocky height from impalpable cloud far into this misty cloud region however within the domain of chaos as it were hilltops were seen brightening in the sunshine they looked like fragments of the world broken adrift and based on nothingness or like portions of a sphere destined to exist but not yet finally compacted the sculptor habitually drawing many of the images and illustrations of his thoughts from the plastic art fancied that the scene represented the process of the creator when he held the new imperfect earth in his hand and modelled it what a magic is in mist and vapour among the mountains he exclaimed with their help one single scene becomes a thousand the cloud scenery gives such variety to a hilly landscape that it would be worth while to journalize its aspect from hour to hour a cloud however as i have myself experienced is apt to grow solid and as heavy as a stone the instant that you take in hand to describe it but in my own heart i have found great use in clouds such silvery ones as those to the northward for example have often suggested sculpturesque groups figures and attitudes they are especially rich in attitudes of living repose which a sculptor only hits upon by the rarest good fortune when i go back to my dear native land the clouds along the horizon will be my only gallery of art i can see cloud shapes too said donatello yonder is one that shifts strangely it has been like people whom i knew and now if i watch it a little longer it will take the figure of a monk reclining with his cowl about his head and drawn partly over his face and well did i not tell you so i think remarked kenyon we can hardly be gazing at the same cloud what i behold is a reclining figure to be sure but feminine and with a despondent air wonderfully well expressed in the wavering outline from head to foot it moves my very heart by something indefinable that it suggests i see the figure and almost the face said the count adding in a lower voice it is miriam's no not miriam's answered the sculptor 
while the two gazers thus found their own reminiscences and presentiments floating among the clouds the day drew to its close and now showed them the fair spectacle of an italian sunset the sky was soft and bright but not so gorgeous as kenyon had seen it a thousand times in america for there the western sky is wont to be set aflame with breadths and depths of color with which poets seek in vain to dye their verses and which painters never dare to copy as beheld from the tower of monte beni the scene was tenderly magnificent with mild gradations of hue and a lavish outpouring of gold but rather such gold as we see on the leaf of a bright flower than the burnished glow of metal from the mine or if metallic it looked airy and unsubstantial like the glorified dreams of an alchemist and speedily more speedily than in our own clime came the twilight and brightening through its great transparency the stars a swarm of minute insects that had been hovering all day round the battlements were now swept away by the freshness of a rising breeze the two owls in the chamber beneath donatello's uttered their soft melancholy cry which with national avoidance of harsh sounds italian owls substitute for the hoot of their kindred in other countries and flew darkling forth among the shrubbery a convent bell rang out near at hand and was not only echoed among the hills but answered by another bell and still another which doubtless had farther and farther responses at various distances along the valley for like the english drum beat around the globe there is a chain of convent bells from end to end and crosswise and in all possible directions over priest-ridden italy come said the sculptor the evening air grows cool it is time to descend time for you my friend replied the count and he hesitated a little before adding i must keep a vigil here for some hours longer it is my frequent custom to keep vigils and sometimes the thought occurs to me whether it were not better to keep them in yonder convent the bell of which just now seemed to summon me should i do wisely do you think to exchange this old tower for a cell what turn monk exclaimed his friend a horrible idea true said donatello sighing therefore if at all i purpose doing it then think of it no more for heaven's sake cried the sculptor there are a thousand better and more poignant methods of being miserable than that if to be miserable is what you wish nay i question whether a monk keeps himself up to the intellectual and spiritual height which misery implies a monk i judge from their sensual physiognomies which meet me at every turn is inevitably a beast their souls if they have any to begin with perish out of them before their sluggish swinish existence is half done better a million times to stand star-gazing on these airy battlements than to smother your new germ of a higher life in a monkish cell you make me tremble said donatello by your bold aspersion of men who have devoted themselves to god's service they serve neither god nor man and themselves least of all though their motives be utterly selfish replied kenyon avoid the convent my dear friend as you would shun the death of the soul but for my own part if i had an insupportable burden if for any case i were bent upon sacrificing every earthly hope as a peace offering towards heaven i would make the wide world my cell and good deeds to mankind my prayer many penitent men have done this and found peace in it ah but you are a heretic said the count yet his face brightened beneath the stars and looking at it through the twilight 
the sculptor's remembrance went back to that scene in the capitol where both in features and expression donatello had seemed identical with the form and still there was a resemblance for now when first the idea was suggested of living for the welfare of his fellow-creatures the original beauty which sorrow had partly effaced came back elevated and spiritualized in the black depths the fawn had found a soul and was struggling with it towards the light of heaven the illumination it is true soon faded out of donatello's face the idea of lifelong and unselfish effort was too high to be received by him with more than a momentary comprehension an italian indeed seldom dreams of being philanthropic except in bestowing alms among the paupers who appeal to his beneficence at every step nor does it occur to him that there are fitter modes of propitiating heaven than by penances pilgrimages and offerings at shrines perhaps too their system has its share of moral advantages they at all events cannot well pride themselves as our own more energetic benevolence is apt to do upon sharing in the counsels of providence and kindly helping out its otherwise impracticable designs and now the broad valley twinkled with lights that glimmered through its duskiness like the fireflies in the garden of a florentine palace a gleam of lightning from the rear of the tempest showed the circumference of hills and the great space between as the last cannon flash of a retreating army reddens across the field where it has fought the sculptor was on the point of descending the turret stair when somewhere in the darkness that lay beneath them a woman's voice was heard singing a low sad strain hark said he laying his hand on donatello's arm and donatello had said hark at the same instant the song if you song it could be called that had only a wild rhythm and flowed forth in the fitful measure of a wind harp did not clothe itself in the sharp brilliancy of the italian tongue the words so far as they could be distinguished were german and therefore unintelligible to the count and hardly less so to the sculptor being softened and molten as it were into the melancholy richness of the voice that sang them it was as the murmur of a soul bewildered amid the sinful gloom of earth and retaining only enough memory of a better state to make sad music of the wail which would else have been a despairing shriek never was there profounder pathos than breathed through that mysterious voice it brought the tears into the sculptor's eyes with remembrances and forebodings of whatever sorrow he had felt or apprehended. It made Donatello sob, as chiming in with the anguish that he found unutterable, and giving it the expression which he vaguely sought. But when the emotion was at its profoundest depth, the voice rose out of it, yet so gradually that a gloom seemed to pervade it, far upward from the abyss, and not entirely to fall away as it ascended into a higher and purer region at last the auditors would have fancied that the melody with its rich sweetness all there and much of its sorrow gone was floating around the very summit of the tower donatello said the sculptor when there was silence again had that voice no message for your ear i dare not receive it said donatello the anguish of which it spoke abides with me the hope dies away with the breath that brought it hither it is not good for me to hear that voice the sculptor sighed and left the poor penitent keeping his vigil on the
Volume Two, Chapter Thirty of the Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Lars Rolander. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne, Volume Two, Chapter Thirty. Donatello's Bust. Kenyon, it will be remembered, had asked Donatello's permission to model his bust. The work had now made considerable progress, and necessarily kept the sculptor's thoughts broading much and often upon his host's personal characteristics. These it was his difficult office to bring out from their depths, and interpret them to all men, showing them what they could not discern for themselves yet must be compelled to recognize at a glance on the surface of a block of marble. He had never undertaken a portrait bust which gave him so much trouble as Donatello's. Not that there was any special difficulty in hitting the likeness, though even in this respect the grace and harmony of the features seemed inconsistent with the prominent expression of individuality but he was chiefly perplexed how to make this genial and kind type of countenance the index of the mind within. His acuteness and his sympathies, indeed, were both somewhat at fault in their efforts to enlighten him as to the moral phase through which the Count was now passing. If at one sitting he caught a glimpse of what appeared to be a genuine and permanent trait, it would probably be less perceptible on a second occasion, and perhaps have vanished entirely at a third. So evanescent a show of character threw the sculptor into despair. Not marble or clay, but cloud and vapor was the material in which it ought to be represented. Even the ponderous depression which constantly weighed upon Donatello's heart could not compel him into the kind of repose which the plastic art requires. Hopeless of a good result, Kenyon gave up all preconceptions about the character of his subject, and let his hands work uncontrolled with the clay, somewhat as a spiritual medium, while holding a pen, yields it to an unseen guidance other than that of her own will. Now and then he fancied that this plan was destined to be the successful one. A skill and insight beyond his consciousness seemed occasionally to take up the task. The mystery, the miracle of imbuing an inanimate substance with thought, feeling, and all the intangible attributes of the soul, appeared on the verge of being wrought. And now, as he flattered himself, the true image of his friend was about to emerge from the facile material, bringing with it more of Donatello's character than the keenest observer could detect at any one moment in the face of the original vain expectation. Some touch whereby the artist thought to improve or hasten the result interfered with the design of his unseen spiritual assistant and spoilt the whole. There was still the moist brown clay, indeed, and the features of Donatello, but without any semblance of intelligent and sympathetic life. "'The difficulty will drive me mad, I verily believe,' cried the sculptor nervously. "'Look at the wretched piece of work yourself, my dear friend.' and tell me whether you recognize any manner of likeness to your inner man. None, replied Donatello, speaking the simple truth. It is like looking a stranger in the face. This frankly unfavorable testimony, so wrought with the sensitive artist, that he fell into a passion with a stubborn image, and cared not what might happen to it thenceforward wielding that wonderful power which sculptors possess over moist clay however refractory it may show itself in certain respects he compressed elongated widened and otherwise altered the features of the bust in mere recklessness 
and at every change inquired of the Count whether the expression became anywise more satisfactory. Stop! cried Donatello at last, catching the sculptor's hand. Let it remain so. By some accidental handling of the clay, entirely independent of his own will, Kenyon had given the countenance a distorted and violent look, combining animal fierceness with intelligent hatred. Had Hilda or had Miriam seen the bust, with the expression which it had now assumed, they might have recognized Donatello's face as they beheld it at that terrible moment when he held his victim over the edge of the precipice. "'What have I done?' said the sculptor, shocked at his own casual production. "'It were a sin to let the clay which bears your features harden into a look like that. Cain never wore an uglier one.' "'For that very reason let it remain,' answered the Count, who had grown pale as ashes at the aspect of his crime thus strangely presented to him in another of the many guises under which guilt stares the criminal in the face do not alter it chisel it rather in eternal marble i will set it up in my oratory and keep it continually before my eyes sadder and more horrible is a face like this alive with my own crime than the dead skull which my forefathers handed down to me but without in the least heeding Donatello's remonstrances, the sculptor again applied his artful fingers to the clay, and compelled the bust to dismiss the expression that had so startled them both. "'Believe me,' said he, turning his eyes upon his friend, full of grave and tender sympathy, "'you know not what is requisite for your spiritual growth.' seeking as you do to keep your soul perpetually in the unwholesome region of remorse it was needful for you to pass through that dark valley but it is infinitely dangerous to linger there too long there is poison in the atmosphere when we sit down and broad in it instead of girding up our loins to press onward not despondency not slothful anguish is what you now require, but effort. Has there been an unalterable evil in your young life? Then crowd it out with good, or it will lie corrupting there for ever, and cause your capacity for better things to partake in noisome corruption. You stir up many thoughts, said Donatello, pressing his hand upon his brow, but the multitude and the whirl of them make me dizzy. They now left the sculptor's temporary studio, without observing that his last accidental touches, with which he hurriedly effaced the look of deadly rage, had given the bust a higher and sweeter expression than it had hitherto worn. It is to be regretted that Kenyon had not seen it, for only an artist, perhaps, can conceive the irksomeness, the irritation of brain, the depression of spirits, that resulted from his failure to satisfy himself, after so much toil and thought as he had bestowed on Donatello's bust. In case of success, indeed, all this thoughtful toil would have been reckoned not only as well bestowed, but as among the happiest hours of his life, whereas deeming himself to have failed, it was just so much of life that had better never have been lived for thus does the good or ill result of his labor throw back sunshine or gloom upon the artist's mind. The sculptor, therefore, would have done well to glance again at his work, for here were still the features of the antique form, but now illuminated with a higher meaning, such as the old marble never bore. Donatello having quitted him, Kenyon spent the rest of the day strolling about the pleasant precincts of Montebene, where the summer was now so far advanced that it began, indeed, to partake of the ripe wealth of autumn. Apricots had long been abundant, and had passed away, and plums and cherries along with them. But now, 
came great juicy pears, melting and delicious, and peaches of goodly size and tempting aspect, though cold and watery to the palate, compared with the sculptor's rich reminiscences of that fruit in America. The purple figs had already enjoyed their day, and the white ones were luscious now. The contadini, who by this time knew Kenyon well, found many clusters of ripe grapes for him, in every little globe of which was included a fragrant draught of the sunny Montebene wine. Unexpectedly, in a nook close by the farmhouse, he happened upon a spot where the vintage had actually commenced. A great heap of early ripened grapes had been gathered and thrown into a mighty tub. In the middle of it stood a lusty and jolly contadino, nor stood merely, but stamped with all his might and danced amain, while the red juice bathed his feet and threw its foam midway up his brown and shaggy legs. Here, then, was the very process that showed so picturesquely in scripture and in poetry of treading out the wine-press and dyeing the feet and garments with a crimson effusion as with the blood of a battlefield. The memory of the process does not make the Tuscan wine taste more deliciously. The contadini hospitably offered Kenyon a sample of the new liquor that had already stood fermenting for a day or two. He had tried a similar draught, however, in a year past, and was little inclined to make proof of it again, for he knew that it would be a sour and bitter juice, a wine of woe and tribulation, and that the more a man drinks of such liquor, the sorrier he is likely to be. The scene reminded the sculptor of our New England vintages, where the big piles of golden and rosy apples lie under the orchard trees, in the mild autumn sunshine and the creaking cider-mill set in motion by a circumgeratory horse is all agush with the luscious use to speak frankly the cider-making is the more picturesque sight of the two and the new sweet cider an infinitely better drink than the ordinary unripe tuscan wine such as it is however the latter fills thousands upon thousands of small flat barrels and still growing thinner and sharper, loses the little life it had as wine, and becomes apotheosized as a more praiseworthy vinegar. Yet all these vineyard scenes, and the processes connected with the culture of the grape, had a flavor of poetry about them. The toil that produces those kindly gifts of nature, which are not the substance of life, but its luxury, is unlike other toil. We are inclined to fancy that it does not bend the sturdy frame and stiffen the overwrought muscles, like the labor that is devoted in sad, hard earnest to raise grain for sour bread. Certainly the sunburnt young men and dark-cheeked laughing girls, who weeded the rich acres of Montebene, might well enough have passed for inhabitants of an unsophisticated Arcadia. Later in the season, when the true vintage time should come, and the wine of sunshine gush into the vats, it was hardly too wild a dream that Bacchus himself might revisit the haunts which he loved of old. But, alas, where now would he find the fawn with whom we see him consorting in so many an antique group? Donatello's remorseful anguish saddened this primitive and delightful life. Kenyon had a pain of his own, moreover, although not all a pain, in the never-quite, never-satisfied yearning of his heart towards Hilda. He was authorized to use little freedom towards that shy maiden, even in his visions, so that he almost reproached himself when sometimes his imagination pictured in detail the sweet years that they might spend together in a retreat like this. It had just that rarest quality of remoteness from the actual and ordinary world a remoteness through which all delights might visit them freely, 
sifted from all troubles, which lovers so reasonably insist upon in their ideal arrangements for a happy union. It is possible, indeed, that even Donatello's grief and Kenyon's pale, sunless affection lent a charm to Montebene, which it would not have retained amid a more abundant joyousness. The sculptor strayed amid its vineyards and orchards, its dells and tangled shrubberies, with somewhat the sensations of an adventurer who should find his way to the site of ancient Eden, and behold its loveliness through the transparency of that gloom which has been brooding over those haunts of innocence ever since the fall. Adam saw it in a brighter sunshine, but never knew the shade of pensive beauty which Eden won from his expulsion. It was in the decline of the afternoon that Kenyon returned from his long, musing ramble. Old Tommaso, between whom and himself for some time past there had been a mysterious understanding, met him in the entrance hall, and drew him a little aside. "'The signorina would speak with you,' he whispered. "'In the chapel?' asked the sculptor. "'No, in the saloon beyond it.' answered the butler. The entrance you once saw the signorina appear through, it is near the altar, hidden behind the tapestry. Kenyon lost no time in obeying the sign. Volume two, chapter thirty one of the Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume two, chapter thirty one The Marble Saloon. In an old Tuscan villa, a chapel ordinarily makes one among the numerous apartments. Though it often happens that the door is permanently closed, the key lost, and the place left to itself, in dusty sanctity, like that chamber in man's heart where he hides his religious awe. This was very much the case with the chapel of Montebeni. One rainy day, however, in his wanderings through the great, intricate house, Kenyon had unexpectedly found his way into it, and been impressed by its solemn aspect. The arched windows, high upward in the wall, and darkened with dust and cobweb, threw down a dim light that showed the altar, with the picture of a martyrdom above, and some tall tapers ranged before it. They had apparently been lighted, and burned an hour or two, and been extinguished, perhaps, half a century before. The marble vase at the entrance held some hardened mud at the bottom, accruing from the dust that had settled in it during the gradual evaporation of the holy water. And a spider, being an insect that delights in pointing the moral of desolation and neglect, had taken pains to weave a prodigiously thick tissue across the circular brim. An old family banner, tattered by the moths, drooped from the vaulted roof. In niches there were some medieval busts of Donatello's forgotten ancestry, and among them, it might be, the forlorn visage of that hapless knight between whom and the fountain nymph had occurred such tender love passages. Throughout all the jovial prosperity of Montebeni, this one spot within the domestic walls had kept itself silent, stern, and sad. When the individual or the family retired from song and mirth, they here sought those realities which men do not invite their festive associates to share. And here, on the occasion above referred to, the sculptor had discovered, accidentally, so far as he was concerned, though with a purpose on her part, that there was a guest under Donatello's roof, whose presence the Count did not suspect. An interview had since taken place, and he was now summoned to another. He crossed the chapel, in compliance with Tommaso's instructions, and passing through the side entrance, found himself in a saloon of no great size, but more magnificent than he had supposed the villa to contain. As it was vacant, Kenyon had leisure to pace it once or twice, and examine it with a careless sort of scrutiny before any person appeared. This beautiful hall was floored with rich marbles, in artistically arranged figures and compartments, 
the walls likewise were almost entirely cased in marble of various kinds the prevalent variety being giallo antico intermixed with verde antique and other equally precious the splendor of the giallo antico however was what gave character to the saloon and the large and deep niches apparently intended for full-length statues along the walls were lined with the same costly material without visiting italy one can have no idea of the beauty and magnificence that are produced by these fittings up of polished marble without such experience indeed we do not even know what marble means in any sense save as the white limestone of which we carve our mantelpieces this rich hall of monte beni moreover was adorned and its upper end with two pillars that seemed to consist of oriental alabaster and wherever there was a space vacant of precious and variegated marble it was frescoed with ornaments in arabesque above there was a coved and vaulted ceiling glowing with pictured scenes which affected kenyon with a vague sense of splendor without his twisting his neck to gaze at them it is one of the special excellences of such a saloon of polished and richly colored marble that decay can never tarnish it until the house crumbles down upon it it shines indestructibly and with a little dusting looks just as brilliant in its three hundredth year as the day after the final slab of giallo antico was fitted into the wall to the sculptor at this first view of it it seemed a hall where the sun was magically imprisoned and must always shine he anticipated miriam's entrance arrayed in queenly robes and beaming with even more than the singular beauty that had heretofore distinguished her while this thought was passing through his mind the pillared door at the upper end of the saloon was partly opened and miriam appeared she was very pale and dressed in deep mourning as she advanced towards the sculptor the feebleness of her step was so apparent that he made haste to meet her apprehending that she might sink down on the marble floor without the instant support of his arm but with a gleam of her natural self-reliance she declined his aid and after touching her cold hand to his went and sat down on one of the cushioned divans that were ranged against the wall you are very ill miriam said kenyon much shocked at her appearance i had not thought of this no not so ill as i seem to you she answered adding despondently yet i am ill enough i believe to die unless some change speedily occurs what then is your disorder asked the sculptor and what the remedy the disorder repeated miriam there is none that i know of save too much life and strength without a purpose for one or the other it is my too redundant energy that is slowly or perhaps rapidly wearing me away because i can apply it to no use the object which I am bound to consider my only one on earth fails me utterly. The sacrifice which I yearn to make of myself, my hopes, my everything, is coldly put aside. Nothing is left for me but to brood, brood, brood all day, all night, in unprofitable longings and repinings. This is very sad, Miriam, said Kenyon. Ay, indeed I fancy so, she replied with a short, unnatural laugh. With all your activity of mind, resumed he, so fertile in plans as I have known you, can you imagine no method of bringing your resources into play? My mind is not active any longer, answered Miriam in a cold, indifferent tone. It deals with one thought and no more. One recollection paralyzes it. It is not remorse. Do not think it. I put myself out of the question, and feel neither regret nor penitence on my own behalf. But what benumbs me? what robs me of all power it is no secret for a woman to tell a man yet i care not though you know it is the certainty that i am and must ever be an object of horror in donatello's sight the sculptor a young man and cherishing a love which insulated him from the wild experiences which some men gather was startled to perceive how miriam's rich ill-regulated nature impelled her to fling herself conscience and all on one passion the object of which intellectually seemed far beneath her. "'Have you obtained the certainty of which you speak?' asked he after a pause. "'Oh, by a sure token,' said Miriam, a gesture merely, a shudder, a cold shiver, that ran through him one sunny morning when his hand happened to touch mine. But it was enough. "'I firmly believe, Miriam,' said the sculptor, "'that he loves you still.' She started, and a flush of color came tremulously over the paleness of her cheek. "'Yes,' 
repeated Kenyon, if my interest in Donatello, and in yourself, Miriam, endows me with any true insight, he not only loves you still, but with a force and depth proportioned to the stronger grasp of his faculties in their new development. Do not deceive me, said Miriam, growing pale again. Not for the world, replied Kenyon. Here is what I take to be the truth. There was an interval, no doubt, when the horror of some calamity, which I need not shape out in my conjectures, threw Donatello into a stupor of misery. Connected with the first shock, there was an intolerable pain and shuddering repugnance attaching themselves to all the circumstances and surroundings of the event that so terribly affected him. Was his dearest friend involved within the horror of that moment? He would shrink from her, as he shrank most of all from himself. But as his mind roused itself— as it rose to a higher life than he had hitherto experienced. Whatever had been true and permanent within him, revived by the self-same impulse, so has it been with his love. But surely, said Miriam, he knows that I am here. Why, then, except that I am odious to him, does he not bid me welcome? He is, I believe, aware of your presence here, answered the sculptor. Your song a night or two ago must have revealed it to him. And in truth, I had fancied that there was already a consciousness of it in his mind. But the more passionately he longs for your society, the more religiously he deems himself bound to avoid it. The idea of a lifelong penance has taken strong possession of Donatello. He gropes blindly about him for some method of sharp self-torture, and finds, of course, no other so efficacious as this. But he loves me, repeated Miriam in a low voice to herself. Yes, he loves me. It was strange to observe the womanly softness that came over her as she admitted that comfort into her bosom. The cold, unnatural indifference of her manner, a kind of frozen, passionateness, which had shocked and chilled the sculptor, disappeared. She blushed and turned away her eyes, knowing that there was more surprise and joy in their dewy glances than any man save one ought to detect there. "'In other respects,' she inquired at length, "'is he much changed?' "'A wonderful process is going forward in Donatello's mind,' answered the sculptor. "'The germs of faculties that have heretofore slept are fast springing into activity. "'The world of thought is disclosing itself to his inward sight. "'He startles me at times, with his perception of deep truths, "'and quite as often it must be owned he compels me to smile "'by the intermixture of his former simplicity with their new intelligence.' But he is bewildered with the revelations that each day brings. Out of his bitter agony, a soul and intellect, I could almost say, have been inspired into him. "'Ah, I could help him here,' cried Miriam, clasping her hands. "'And how sweet a toil to bend and adapt my whole nature to do him good! To instruct, to elevate, to enrich his mind with the wealth that would flow in upon me, had I such a motive for acquiring it. Who else can perform the task?' Who else has the tender sympathy which he requires? Who else, save only me, a woman, a sharer in the same dread secret, a partaker in one identical guilt, could meet him on such terms of intimate equality as the case demands? With this object before me, I might feel a right to live. Without it, it is a shame for me to have lived so long. I fully agree with you, said Kenyon, that your true place is by his side. "'Surely it is,' replied Miriam. "'If Donatello is entitled to aught on earth, "'it is to my complete self-sacrifice for his sake. "'It does not weaken his claim, methinks, "'that my only prospect of happiness, "'a fearful word, however, "'lies in the good that may accrue to him "'from our intercourse. "'But he rejects me. "'He will not listen to the whisper of his heart, "'telling him that she, most wretched, "'who beguiled him into evil, "'might guide him to a higher innocence,' than that from which he fell. How is this first great difficulty to be obviated? It lies at your own option, Miriam, to do away the obstacle at any moment, remarked the sculptor. It is but to ascend Donatello's tower, and you will meet him there under the eye of God. I dare not, answered Miriam. No, I dare not. Do you fear, asked the sculptor, the dread eyewitness whom I have named? No, for as far as I can see into that cloudy and inscrutable thing, my heart, it has none but pure motives, replied Miriam. But, my friend, you little know what a weak or what a strong creature a woman is. I fear not heaven in this case, at least, but shall I confess it? 
I am greatly in dread of Donatello. Once he shuddered at my touch. If he shudder once again or frown, I die. Kenyon could not but marvel at the subjection into which this proud and self-dependent woman had willfully flung herself, hanging her life upon the chance of an angry or favorable regard from a person who a little while before had seemed the plaything of a moment. But in Miriam's eyes Donatello was always thenceforth invested with the tragic dignity of their hour of crime, and furthermore the keen and deep insight with which her love endowed her enabled her to know him far better than he could be known by ordinary observation. Beyond all question, since she loved him so, there was a force in Donatello worthy of her respect and love. "'You see my weakness?' said Miriam, flinging out her hands, as a person does when a defect is acknowledged and beyond remedy. "'What I need now is an opportunity to show my strength.' "'It has occurred to me,' Kenyon remarked, "'that the time has come.' when it may be desirable to remove Donatello from the complete seclusion in which he buries himself. He has struggled long enough with one idea. He now needs a variety of thought, which cannot be otherwise so readily supplied to him as through the medium of a variety of scenes. His mind is awakened now. His heart, though full of pain, is no longer benumbed. They should have food and solace. If he linger here much longer, I fear that he may sink back into a lethargy. The extreme excitability which circumstances have imparted to his moral system has its dangers and its advantages, it being one of the dangers that an obdurate scar may supervene upon its very tenderness. Solitude has done what it could for him. Now for a while, let him be enticed into the outer world. "'What is your plan, then?' asked Miriam. "'Simply,' replied Kenyon, "'to persuade Donatello to be my companion in a ramble among these hills and valleys.' The little adventures and vicissitudes of travel will do him infinite good. After his recent profound experience, he will recreate the world by the new eyes with which he will regard it. He will escape, I hope, out of a morbid life and find his way into a healthy one. "'And what is to be my part in this process?' inquired Miriam, sadly and not without jealousy. "'You are taking him from me and putting yourself and all manner of living interests into the place which I ought to fill.' "'It would rejoice me, Miriam, to yield the entire responsibility of this office to yourself,' answered the sculptor. "'I do not pretend to be the guide and counsellor whom Donatello needs. "'For to mention no other obstacle, I am a man, and between man and man there is always an insuperable gulf. "'They can never quite grasp each other's hands, and therefore man never derives any intimate help, "'any heart sustenance, from his brother man, but from woman, his mother, his sister, or his wife.' Be Donatello's friend at need, therefore, and most gladly will I resign him. It is not kind to taunt me thus, said Miriam. I have told you that I cannot do what you suggest, because I dare not. Well, then, rejoined the sculptor, see if there is any possibility of adapting yourself to my scheme. The incidents of a journey often fling people together in the oddest and therefore the most natural way. Supposing you were to find yourself on the same route, a reunion with Donatello might ensue and Providence have a larger hand in it than either of us. It is not a hopeful plan, said Miriam, shaking her head after a moment's thought. Yet I will not reject it without a trial. Only in case it fail, here is a resolution to which I bind myself. Come what come may. You know the bronze statue of Pope Julius in the great square of Perugia? I remember standing in the shadow of that statue one sunny noontime, and being impressed by its paternal aspect and fancying that a blessing fell upon me from its outstretched hand. Ever since I have had a superstition. You will call it foolish, but sad and ill-fated persons always dream such things. That if I waited long enough in that same spot, some good event would come to pass. Well, my friend, precisely a fortnight after you begin your tour, unless we sooner meet, bring Donatello at noon to the base of the statue. You will find me there. Kenyon assented to the proposed arrangement, and after some conversation respecting his contemplated line of travel, prepared to take his leave. As he met Miriam's eyes in bidding farewell, he was surprised at the new, tender gladness that beamed out of them, and at the appearance of health and bloom which in this little while had overspread her face. "'May I tell you, Miriam,' said he, smiling, "'that you are still as beautiful as ever?' "'You have a right to notice it she replied, 
for if it be so, my faded bloom has been revived by the hopes you give me. Do you then think me beautiful? I rejoice most truly. Beauty, if I possess it, shall be one of the instruments by which I will try to educate and elevate him, to whose good I solely dedicate myself. The sculptor had nearly reached the door, when hearing her call him he turned back, and beheld Miriam still standing where he had left her, in the magnificent hall which seemed only a fit setting for her beauty. She beckoned him to return. "'You are a man of refined taste,' said she. "'More than that, a man of delicate sensibility. Now tell me frankly and on your honour. Have I not shocked you many times during this interview by my betrayal of woman's cause, my lack of feminine modesty, my reckless, passionate, most indecorous avowal, that I live only in the life of one who perhaps scorns and shudders at me? Thus adjured, however difficult the point to which she brought him, the sculptor was not a man to swerve aside from the simple truth. Miriam, replied he, you exaggerate the impression made upon my mind, but it has been painful and somewhat of the character which you suppose. I knew it, said Miriam mournfully, and with no resentment. What remains of my finer nature would have told me so, even if it had not been perceptible in all your manner. Well, my dear friend, when you go back to Rome, tell Hilda what her severity has done. She was all womanhood to me, and when she cast me off I had no longer any terms to keep with the reserves and decorums of my sex. Hilda has set me free. Pray tell her so from Miriam, and thank her. I shall tell Hilda nothing that will give her pain, answered Kenyon. But, Miriam, though I know not what passed between her and yourself, I feel, and let the noble frankness of your disposition forgive me if I say so, I feel that she was right. You have a thousand admirable qualities. Whatever mass of evil may have fallen into your life, pardon me, but your own words suggest it. You are still as capable as ever of many high and heroic virtues, but the white shining purity of Hilda's nature is a thing apart and she is bound by the undefiled material of which God moulded her, to keep that severity which I, as well as you, have recognized. "'Oh, you are right,' said Miriam. "'I never questioned it, though as I told you, when she cast me off, it severed some few remaining bonds between me and decorous womanhood. But were there anything to forgive, I do forgive her. May you win her virgin heart.' Chapter thirty two of Volume two of the Marble Fawn. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Amy Graymore in Rustic County, Maine. The Marble Fawn by Nathaniel Hawthorne. Volume two, Chapter thirty two. Scenes by the way. When it came to the point of quitting the reposeful life of Montebeni, the sculptor was not without regrets, and would willingly have dreamed a little longer of the sweet paradise on earth that Hilda's presence there might make. Nevertheless, amid all its repose, he had begun to be sensible of a restless melancholy, to which the cultivators of the ideal arts are more liable than sturdier men. On his own part, therefore, and leaving Donatello out of the case, he would have judged it well to go. He made parting visits to the legendary dell, and to other delightful spots with which he had grown familiar. He climbed the tower again, and saw a sunset and a moonrise over the great valley. He drank on the eve of his departure one flask and then another of the Montebeni sunshine, and stored up its flavor in his memory as the standard of what is exquisite in wine. These things accomplished, Kenyon was ready for the journey. Donatello had not very easily been stirred out of the peculiar sluggishness which enthralls and bewitches melancholy people. He had offered merely a passive resistance, however, not an active one, to his friend's schemes, and when the appointed hour came, he yielded to the impulse which Kenyon failed not to apply, and was started upon the journey before he had made up his mind to undertake it. They wandered forth at large, like two knights errant, among the valleys, and the mountains and the old mountain towns of that picturesque and lovely region. 
save to keep the appointment with Miriam a fortnight thereafter, in the great square of Perugia, there was nothing more definite in the sculptor's plan than that they should let themselves be blown hither and thither, like winged seeds that mount upon each wandering breeze. Yet there was an idea of fatality implied in the simile of the winged seeds, which did not altogether suit Kenyon's fancy. For if you look closely into the matter, it will be seen that whatever appears most vagrant and utterly purposeless turns out in the end to have been impelled the most surely on a preordained and unswerving track. Chance and change love to deal with men's settled plans, not with their idle vagaries. If we desire unexpected and unimaginable events, we should contrive an iron framework, such as we fancy may compel the future to take one inevitable shape. Then comes in the unexpected, and shatters our design in fragments. The travellers set forth on horseback, and purposed to perform much of their aimless journeyings under the moon, and in the cool of the morning or evening twilight. The midday sun, while summer had hardly begun to trail its departing skirts over Tuscany, being still too fervid to allow of noontide exposure. For a while they wandered in that same broad valley which Kenyon had viewed with such delight from the Monte Beni Tower. The sculptor soon began to enjoy the idle activity of their new life, which the lapse of a day or two sufficed to establish as a kind of system. It is so natural for mankind to be nomadic that a very little taste of that primitive mode of existence subverts the settled habits of many preceding years. Kenyon's cares, and whatever gloomy ideas before possessed him, seemed to be left at Montebeni, and were scarcely remembered by the time that its grey tower grew undistinguishable on the brown hillside. His perceptive faculties, which had found little exercise of late amid so thoughtful a way of life, became keen and kept his eyes busy with a hundred agreeable scenes. He delighted in the picturesque bits of rustic character and manners so little of which ever comes upon the surface of our life at home. There, for example, were the old women tending pigs or sheep by the wayside. As they followed the vagrant steps of their charge, these venerable ladies kept spinning yarn with that elsewhere forgotten contrivance, the distaff, and so wrinkled and stern-looking were they that you might have taken them for the parkai, spinning the threads of human destiny. In contrast with their great-grandmothers were the children, leading goats of shaggy beard, tied by the horns, and letting them browse on branch and shrub. It is the fashion of Italy to add the petty industry of age and childhood to the hum of human toil. To the eyes of an observer from the western world, it was a strange spectacle to see sturdy, sunburnt creatures in petticoats, but otherwise manlike, toiling side by side with male laborers, in the rudest work of the fields. These sturdy women, if as such we must recognize them, wore the high-crowned, broad-brimmed hat of Tuscan straw, the customary female head apparel. And as every breeze blew back its breath of brim, the sunshine constantly added depth to the brown glow of their cheeks. The elder sisterhood, however, set off their witch-like ugliness to the worst advantage with black felt hats bequeathed them, one would fancy, by their long-buried husbands. Another ordinary sight, as sylvan as the above, and more agreeable, was a girl bearing on her back a huge bundle of green twigs and shrubs, or grass, intermixed with scarlet poppies and blue flowers, the verdant burden being sometimes of such size as to hide the bearer's figure, and seem a self-moving mask of fragrant bloom and verdure. Oftener, however, the bundle reached only halfway down the back of the rustic nymph, leaving in sight her well-developed lower limbs and the crooked knife hanging behind her, with which she had been reaping this strange harvest sheath. A pre-Raphaelite artist, he, for instance, who painted so marvelously a windswept heap of autumnal leaves, might find an admirable subject in one of these Tuscan girls, stepping with a free erect and graceful carriage. The miscellaneous herbage, and tangled twigs and blossoms of her bundle, crowning her head, while her ruddy, comely face looks out between the hanging side festoons like a larger flower. 
would give the painter boundless scope for the minute delineation which he loves. Though mixed up with what was rude and earth-like, there was still a remote, dreamlike, Arcadian charm, which is scarcely to be found in the daily toil of other lands. Among the pleasant features of the wayside were always the vines, clambering on fig-trees or other sturdy trunks. They wreathed themselves in huge and rich festoons from one tree to another, suspending clusters of ripening grapes in the interval between. Under such careless mode of culture, the luxuriant vine is a lovelier spectacle than where it produces a more precious liquor, and is therefore more artificially restrained and trimmed. Nothing can be more picturesque than an old grapevine, with almost a trunk of its own, clinging fast around its supporting tree. Nor does the picture lack its moral. You might twist it to more than one grave purpose, as you saw how the knotted, serpentine growth imprisoned within its strong embrace the friend that had supported its tender infancy, and how, as seemingly flexible natures are prone to do, it converted the sturdier tree entirely to its own selfish ends, extending its innumerable arms on every bough, and permitting hardly a leaf to sprout except its own. It occurred to Kenyon that the enemies of the vine, in his native land, might here have seen an emblem of the remorseless gripe, which the habit of vinous enjoyment lays upon its victim, possessing him wholly, and letting him live no life but such as it bestows. The scene was not less characteristic, when their path led the two wanderers through some small ancient town. There, besides the peculiarities of present life, they saw tokens of the life that had long ago been lived and flung aside. The little town, such as we see in our mind's eye, would have its gate and its surrounding walls, so ancient and massive that ages had not sufficed to crumble them away, but in the lofty upper portion of the gateway, still standing over the empty arch, where there was no longer a gate to shut, there would be a dovecote, and peaceful doves for the only warders. Pumpkins lay ripening in the open chambers of the structure. Then, as for the town wall on the outside, an orchard extends peacefully along its base, full, not of apple trees, but of those old humorists, with gnarled trunks and twisted boughs, the olives. Houses have been built upon the ramparts, or burrowed out of their ponderous foundation. Even the grey martial towers, crowned with ruined turrets, have been converted into rustic habitations, from the windows of which hang ears of Indian corn. At a door, that has been broken through the massive stonework, where it was meant to be strongest, some contadini are winnowing grain. Small windows, too, are pierced through the whole line of ancient wall, so that it seems a row of dwellings, with one continuous front, built in a strange style of needless strength. But remnants of the old battlements and machicolations are interspersed with the homely chambers and earthen-tiled housetops, and all along its extent both grape-vines and running flower-shrubs, are encouraged to clamber in sport over the roughness of its decay. Finally the long grass, intermixed with weeds and wild-flowers, waves on the uppermost height of the shattered rampart. And it is exceedingly pleasant in the golden sunshine of the afternoon to behold the warlike precinct so friendly in its old days, and so overgrown with rural peace. In its guard-rooms, its prison chambers and scooped out of its ponderous breath, there are dwellings nowadays where happy human lives are spent. Human parents and broods of children nestle in them, even as the swallows nestle in the little crevices along the broken summit of the wall. Passing through the gateway of this same little town, challenged only by those watchful sentinels, the pigeons, we find ourselves in a long narrow street, paved from side to side with flagstones, in the old Roman fashion. Nothing can exceed the grim ugliness of the houses, most of which are three or four stories high, stone-built, grey, dilapidated, or half-covered with plaster and patches, and contiguous all along from end to end of the town. Nature, in the shape of tree, shrub, or grassy sidewalk, is as much shut out from the one street of the rustic village as from the heart of any swarming city. The dark and half-ruinous habitations, with their small windows, many of which are drearily closed with wooden shutters, are but magnified hovels, piled story upon story, 
and squalid with the grime that successive ages have left behind them. It would be a hideous scene to contemplate in a rainy day, or when no human life pervaded it. In the summer noon, however, it possesses vivacity enough to keep itself cheerful. For all the within doors of the village, then bubbles, over upon the flagstones, or looks out from the small windows, and from here and there a balcony. Some of the populace are at the butcher's shop, others are at the fountain, which gushes into a marble basin that resembles an antique sarcophagus. A tailor is sewing before his door, with a young priest seated socially beside him. A burly friar goes by with an empty wine-barrel on his head. Children are at play. Women, at their own doorsteps, mend clothes, embroider, weave hats of Tuscan straw, or twirl the distaff. Many idlers, meanwhile, strolling from one group to another, let the warm day slide by in the sweet, interminable task of doing nothing. From all these people there comes a babblement that seems quite disproportioned to the number of tongues that make it. So many words are not uttered in a New England village throughout the year, except it be at a political canvas or town meeting, as are spoken here with no especial purpose in a single day. Neither so many words, nor so much laughter. For people talk about nothing as if they were terribly in earnest, and make merry at nothing, as if it were the best of all possible jokes. In so long a time as they have existed, and within such narrow precincts, these little walled towns are brought into a closeness of society that makes them but a larger household. All the inhabitants are akin to each other, and each to all. They assemble in the street as their common saloon, and thus live and die in a familiarity of intercourse such as never can be known where a village is open at either end, and all round about and has ample room within itself. Stuck up beside the door of one house, in this village street, is a withered bough, and on a stone seat just under the shadow of the bough sits a party of jolly drinkers, making proof of the new wine, or quaffing the old, as their often tried and comfortable friend. Kenyon draws bridle here, for the bough or bush is a symbol of the wine-shop at this day in Italy, as it was three hundred years ago in England and calls for a goblet of the deep, mild, purple juice, well diluted with water from the fountain. The sunshine of Montebeni would be welcome now. Meanwhile Donatello has ridden onward, but alights where a shrine, with a burning lamp before it, is built into the wall of an inn-stable. He kneels and crosses himself, and mutters a brief prayer, without attracting notice from the passers-by, many of whom are parenthetically devout in a similar fashion. By this time the sculptor has drunk off his wine and water, and our two travellers resume their way, emerging from the opposite gate of the village. Before them again lies the broad valley, with a mist so thinly scattered over it, as to be perceptible only in the distance, and most so in the nooks of the hills. Now that we have called it mist, it seems a mistake not rather to have called it sunshine the glory of so much light being mingled with so little gloom in the airy material of that vapour. Be it mist or sunshine, it adds a touch of ideal beauty to the scene, almost persuading the spectator that this valley and those hills are visionary, because their visible atmosphere is so like the substance of a dream. Immediately about them, however, there were abundant tokens that the country was not really the paradise it looked to be at a casual glance. Neither the wretched cottages nor the dreary farmhouses seemed to partake of the prosperity with which so kindly a climate and so fertile a portion of Mother Earth's bosom should have filled them one and all. But possibly the peasant inhabitants do not exist in so grimy a poverty, and in homes so comfortless, as a stranger with his native ideas of those matters would be likely to imagine." the Italians appear to possess none of that emulative pride which we see in our New England villages, where every householder, according to his taste and means, endeavors to make his homestead an ornament to the grassy and elm-shattered wayside. In Italy there are no neat doorsteps and thresholds, no pleasant vine-sheltered porches, none of those grass plots or smoothly shorn lawns, which hospitably invite the imagination into the sweet domestic interiors of English life. Everything, however sunny and luxuriant, may be the scene around, 
is especially disheartening in the immediate neighborhood of an Italian home. An artist, it is true, might often thank his stars for those old houses, so picturesquely time-stained and with the plaster falling in blotches from the ancient brickwork. The prison-like iron-barred windows and the wide-arched dismal entrance admitting on one hand to the stable, on the other to the kitchen, might impress him as far better worth his pencil than the newly painted pine boxes, in which, if he be an American, his countrymen live and thrive. But there is reason to suspect that a people are waning to decay and ruin the moment that their life becomes fascinating, either in the poet's imagination or the painter's eye. As usual, on Italian waysides, the wanderers passed great black crosses, hung with all the instruments of the sacred agony and passion. There were the crown of thorns, the hammer and nails, the pinchers, the spear, the sponge, and perched over the hole, the cock that crowed to St. Peter's remorseful conscience. Thus, while the fertile scene showed the never-failing beneficence of the Creator towards man in his transitory state, these symbols reminded each wayfarer of the Saviour's infinitely greater love for him as an immortal spirit. Beholding these consecrated stations, the idea seemed to strike Donatello of converting the otherwise aimless journey into a penitential pilgrimage. At each of them he alighted to kneel and kiss the cross, and humbly press his forehead against its foot, and this so invariably that the sculptor soon learned to draw bridle of his own accord. It may be, too, heretic as he was, that Kenyon likewise put up a prayer rendered more fervent by the symbols before his eyes for the peace of his friend's conscience and the pardon of the sin that so oppressed him. Not only at the crosses did Donatello kneel, but at each of the many shrines, where the Blessed Virgin in fresco, faded with sunshine and half washed out with showers, looked benignly at her worshipper, or where she was represented in a wooden image or a base relief of plaster or marble, as accorded with the means of the devout person, who built or restored, from a medieval antiquity, these places of wayside worship. They were everywhere, under arched niches, or in little penthouses, with a brick-tiled roof, just large enough to shelter them, or perhaps in some bit of old Roman masonry, the founders of which had died before the advent, or in the wall of a country inn or farmhouse, or at the midway point of a bridge, or in the shallow cavity of a natural rock, or high upward in the deep cuts of the road. It appeared to the sculptor that Donatello prayed the more earnestly and the more hopefully at these shrines, because the mild face of the Madonna promised him to intercede as a tender mother betwixt the poor culprit and the awfulness of judgment. It was beautiful to observe, indeed, how tender was the soul of man and woman towards the Virgin Mother, in recognition of the tenderness which, as their faith taught them, she immortally cherishes towards all human souls. In the wirework screen, before each shrine, hung offerings of roses, or whatever flower was sweetest and most seasonable. Some already wilted and withered, some fresh with that very morning's dewdrops. Flowers there were, too, that being artificial, never bloomed on earth, nor would ever fade. The thought occurred to Kenyon that flower-pots with living plants might be set within the niches, or even that rose-trees and all kinds of flowering shrubs might be reared under the shrines, and taught to twine and wreathe themselves around, so that the virgin should dwell within a bower of verdure, bloom in fragrant freshness, symbolizing an homage perpetually new. There are many things in the religious customs of these people that seem good, many things at least that might be both good and beautiful, if the soul of goodness and the sense of beauty were as much alive in the Italians now as they must have been when those customs were first imagined and adopted. But instead of blossoms on the shrub, or freshly gathered with the dewdrops on their leaves, their worship nowadays is best symbolized by the artificial flower. The sculptor fancied, moreover, but perhaps it was his heresy that suggested the idea, that it would be of happy influence to place a comfortable and shady seat beneath every wayside shrine. Then the wary and sun-scorched traveller, while resting himself under her protecting shadow, 
might thank the virgin for her hospitality nor perchance were he to regale himself even in such a consecrated spot with the fragrance of a pipe would it rise to heaven more offensively than the smoke of priestly incense we do ourselves wrong and too meanly estimate the holiness above us when we deem that any act or enjoyment good in itself is not good to do religiously whatever may be the inequities of the papal system it was a wise and lovely sentiment that set up the frequent shrine and cross along the roadside no wayfarer bent on whatever worldly errand can fail to be reminded at every mile or two that this is not the business which most concerns him the pleasure-seeker is silently admonished to look heavenward for a joy infinitely greater than he now possesses the wretch in temptation beholds the cross and is warned that if he yield the saviour's agony for his sake will have been endured in vain the stubborn criminal whose heart has long been like a stone feels it throb anew with dread and hope and our poor donatello as he went kneeling from shrine to cross and from cross to shrine doubtless found an efficacy in these symbols that helped him towards a higher penitence whether the young count of montebeni noticed the fact or no there was more than one incident of their journey that led kenyon to believe that they were attended or closely followed or preceded near at hand by some one who took an interest in their motions as it were the step the sweeping garment the faintly heard breath of an invisible companion was beside them as they went on their way it was like a dream that had strayed out of their slumber and was haunting them in the daytime when its shadowy substance could have neither density nor outline in the too obtrusive light after sunset it grew a little more distinct on the left of that last shrine asked the sculptor as they rode under the moon did you observe the figure of a woman kneeling with her face hidden in her hands i never looked that way replied donatello i was saying my own prayer it was some penitent perchance 